Hello, how are you? How's every little thing? Hope you're doing well. Hope the music isn't too loud. How's every little thing? Unsure locus? Yes, you are the first. How's everything? I'm just working on an emote for a uh, friend. I've got two other emotes and I'm also working on my comic tonight. So I've got, I'm almost done with this page. So, I, I'm doing all right. I almost had to work a double until I put my foot down and said no. I told them no. I was very forceful and the person came in when I after I said no. So it must not have been that important. Whatever they were doing. And if you hear any background uh, noises, uh, I also have a few friends' streams up, so I, so you know. But I hope you're doing well. Do you do art, or is that comic free to read, or do I have to make a worthy uh, sacrifice? Uh, no, it's not out yet. It's only pay. I'm only up to page seven. And I want to get the first uh, three chapters out until somebody pays. Or I, it's either people are going to pay Patreon price or, or I'm thinking of doing webtoons, but I don't know. Don't know yet. Couldn't tell you. So I'm sure. How are you doing this evening? How's every little thing? Do you like art? I haven't seen you much in the, uh, I haven't seen you at all in the chat, so I assume that this is really the first night you really got to, uh, see me. Or are you just a regular old lurker? Ah, oh, damn. Oh, I can't do it. I've never been able to do volleyball, but I was, I used to do, uh, swimming. I used to do a lot of swimming in uh, marching band. So volleyball, what? Uh, I think there's positions in volleyball. I've only seen practices when I was in high school, and that was about it. That was years ago. And all the practices, I was like, there's, there's 20 girls over there. That's all I remember of practice, was there's 20 girls. I do art, but it's rare for me uh, to do it due to lack of confidence and visualization. Well, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. 
we here at my channel are very focused on making more artists. We love seeing new artists and we love seeing art artists grow. See, I don't know. If you want to if you want to want you can let me know about the positioning. But what kind of art would you like to do? Do you do uh, what kind of art do you do now? We're very much into making artists the best they can be, or writers, or anyone creative. We like everyone that, if, uh, if it's your dream or passion, what's stopping you? That's the biggest question. What's stopping you? Let's see if we can fix it. Let's see if we can make it better. Let's see if we can work on it and and find the best you that you can be. Let's see. Let's turn down three, let's turn down them, okay needs to have at least a little bit of yeah. if you would like to talk about like what you like drawing just know that I am I'm here for everybody I'm not I'm and I've got a wonderful community that's ready to and willing to help out okay is there any examples of what you want it to look like? Is there any examples of your OC? May I see? You can definitely put a link uh, up in the chat if you want. We're very much about helping artists of all skill levels. So what kind of pupils? Are we talking about dilated pupils? Are we talking about like, I've got a few examples of pupils. Like, this is what I do for pupils and stuff like that and eyes. Is that I put a light shade over it and then I put it uh, where the light source hits and that's about it. I don't do much after that, except if I'm doing a piece like this, like in color. Yes, there is. I could join your Discord and DM you some pics of mine. Okay. Hey, Heaven. This is one of my lovely friends over here. God. Hello, hello. She's a stupendous person. Uh, just let us know when you join the Discord so that I can let you in. he even doing how are you doing I'm doing good I am the discord all right I got you in you should be you should have you should be able to do what you need to I 
I'm good. Uh, just sleepy again. Oh, no. Yes, Heathen is a wonderful person that Light is also an artist, but she's also a mom. I like I like putting that just because I know <laughs> she is our resident mom. I don't want to say mommy because uh, it's weird. And even as my good friend, she's our resident mom. Cats! Please stick to mum. I hate the word mummy. That's fine. Hey everybody, what's up, Katie Cat? You? Hello. Hope you're doing well. Welcome in, Raiders. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for being beautiful. Thank you for being awesome. Thank you for being you. Ah, so cute. Oh my gosh. Cute OC. Adorable. Adorable. You should. Nice. Nice. I thought you were going to be playing a few hours of Elden Ring. I thought you were going to be playing a few hours. What happened? I was, yes, they are adorable. You should send them to the regular Discord. People would love to see them. Uh, you can put it in... If you're feeling cool, you can put it in... Uh, what would... What would she put her character, OC character in? I guess... I don't really have a space for it. Damn it. Uh... I guess it is a work in progress. Is it? Where would she put it? Where would she put her OC stuff? Because it's not art. But it is OC and it is very cute. Ah! Uh, okay, send it to... Kevin gifted a tier Send one sub to Unsure art. underscore Locust. You know what? They have you given what, 32 Unsure? gift subs in the channel. Unsure, send it to Art. Because I want Heaven also to look at it. She, she is, she's so cool. I'm glad you were able to stop by my stream. I realize it's 2 a.m. and I'm working in the a.m. Oh, no. But you have a very adorable thing. Thank you, thank you for being awesome, Katie Cat. I thought you were gonna be playing all night, but okay. It's a rest, Katie Cat. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being awesome. I know it's so easy for you. Cat. Also, let us know what you're up to today, uh, Heaven. We'd love to know. We're not stalking you. We're just it, very interested in a uh, person who just got affiliate. So I need to get this done for you. Just got affiliate. Guys, if you didn't know, she just got affiliate. Powerhouse over here. An amazing mom and affiliate. 
people are just going to be so jealous because she's incredible and amazing. Oh, also, uh, Heaven, the guy I was talking about, he fucking came into work. The guy I was talking about in general, he fucking came into work. I can't believe how fast it, I got it. I know. Yeah. Ah. Yes. Ah, you have such a cute OC. So you thinking about doing her eyes like that? Oh my goodness. Lovely. He's, you're joking. He's such an asshole. Yeah, his statement was, is that his kid's sick. That's what his excuse was. I understand that if your kid's sick, you should take care of your kid. Just saying. You should take care of your kid. That you left, though, I feel that your kid was fine, or you were threatened with a fire, uh, with a termination. That's what I'm thinking what happened. Also, Heaven, I've talked to you, uh, I've told you about this guy. He lies about everything. He intentionally doesn't do work. He'll backstab you. So I, I would want to trust him being like, oh, your kid's sick. Oh, and it's like, no, no, I don't trust you. Yeah. No, he's full of shit. He's... He always finds some reason why he can't work. Recently, it's been, oh, I have a slip disc. Okay, then... Then you need to move to another section. You need to have a doctor's note to move to a different section because you cannot work over here. Like, not, not a joke. You need to talk to HR and change immediately. Oh, you haven't? No, you've just been doing less work? Oh, cool. So what would you like to do with your OC? Don't listen to me complaining about a co-worker. It's my stream. I get to shit on him as much as I want. I know. But... But the company is too nice, it seems. I guess they don't want to give him unemployment. They just want him to fail on his own. That's my guess. But let's get back to your OC. Yeah, get a doctor's note and get moved, uh, move section coming from HR. I know that it's easy to do. Yeah. So. So, unsure, Locus, what do you want to do with your OC? Also, what do you want to, so you want to do your character in a more cartoony style?
to do that. You want to do that. Okay. All right. So what uh, what style are you thinking? Any um, any particulars? That's, that sounds very funny. Sounds very funny. Oh, you don't need to be up this early? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you are. Congratulations. Congratulations, Heaven. You're up this early. To be honest, I'm fairly still new at, in the art world. Hmm. Okay. So you're not sure. Means I can watch Goat and stay cozy in bed. Hmm. So like, what what kind of cartoony style are you feeling? There's lots of different cartoon styles. There's um ah. There's Steven Universe, Loud House, Gravity Falls. Like, that, that's the thing about the difference between anime and, uh, I mean, not really. Anime also has that, like, very distinct, like, each show you can look at. Modern anime, I feel, does not, but that's a personal opinion. But, like, a lot of anime also has that, uh, that look. So like each one person has their own distinct style. Like what what are you What's your the easiest way to do is what what's your favorite TV show? Like what's your favorite cartoon show? And then try to gain a style through that. Like uh one of my uh what really kicked me off into my style was Garfield, Sonic the Hedgehog, and uh, Banjo-Kazooie. Like, what really kicked me off into those styles, and then anime uh, gave me the anatomy. And then... think people will see that very well but I think that it is something between us between friends be right back need to reset phone understandable so like what's something of your favorite like series TV show like the best possible thing I can recommend right now if you're just getting into art is to what write a list down of your favorite of your top 10 favorite things right now in like cartoons tv shows video games and stuff like that and then see what may see why you like them write down why you like them and why you like their art style 
Hey, look at that. Already starting off. Okay. So, an easy thing to do is to is to look at that uh, that how they do that in the last Airbender. Like, let me see if I can find. Uh, Avatar, the last Airbender. Like, looking at the concept art, just go to Google and type in concept art, and you'll start seeing, like, a lot of, like, different things. And emulation is the best thing that you can do. is try to emulate the style and you're go and also when learning how to draw you should also learn the most important thing is you are going to fail you have to learn this very quickly you are going to fail and that's okay if you were perfect you would still be you would have drawn at a at a young age and kept with it and all that other jazz but you're here now and that's okay where we we've all been there i wasn't i didn't get to this point i didn't get to this point until years ago i have been drawing for years and stuff like that so you're going to have to realize, and this is just, this is just simple advice, you're going to fail, and that's okay. That failure is okay, and that if it's not good enough, don't beat yourself up over it. Find out what you didn't like about it, figure out what you want to do with it, and try to fix it for next time. Don't stick with an art the whole time another thing to do is that you should practice every day an hour a day can change a lot try to start practicing get some art books that you really like go to your uh, local hobby shop or help use some google images or like your favorite search engine images and start lear uh, learning from that and the best thing you can do is by coming on to here or uh or anybody else's channel that we have in the community and just start posting your art good bad doesn't matter hey zara you're amazing i am not Well, my community is amazing, and they have been nothing but sweet and stupendous, and I, I don't know how I got so lucky to have them. How did I get so lucky to have you guys is just maddening. I've been world ambling. Oh yeah, I saw. I saw. 
What you been ambling about? What you been making? Why did Harry put his name in the Goblet of Fire? I've been more so what you what you've been making also Zara's a artist as well I almost forgot to let you know unsure uh, locus Zara is also an artist and the best any advice to to new artists people that are just jumping into art my my best advice is it's okay to fail. It's okay that it doesn't look as good as you think it does. And it and if it's not as good as somebody else's art, that's okay. It doesn't have to. You will improve. If you keep with it, you will improve and you will get better. That's my best advice. If you keep at it, you can do it. If it's something you really want to do, you gotta keep at it. And don't let it intimidate you. It's just putting, it's just making the brain, tricking the brain into thinking there's things there. Because there's nothing here except pixels. Nothing but pixels, guys. It's nothing scary. It's not gonna hurt you. put those character bios on uh on discord i personally would love to see them but i'm also weird i'm also real into supporting my friends I'm a big weirdo that likes to support people. Demonic! Hey. Hey. Demonic! Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for coming in, Demonic. You're a stupendous person, and you know you are. Don't ever think otherwise. We don't like hearing that here. You're an awesome being. If you guys don't know, Demonic is all, uh, also a regular streamer that's been that was playing Elden Ring.
If you guys don't know, uh, Elden Ring just came out. I'm putting even to sleep with this music. Might have to change it up to Harry Potter. To find on homework, as it, but she broke off. The morning post was arriving. All right. As usual, the Daily Prophet was soaring towards her in the beak of a screech owl, which landed perilously close to the sugar bowl and held out a leg. Hermione pushed a nut into its leather pouch, took the newspaper, and scanned the front page critically as the owl took off. Anything interesting? Said Ron. Harry grinned, knowing Ron was keen to keep her off the subject of homework. No, she sighed, just some guff about the bass player and the weird sisters getting married. Hermione opened the paper and disappeared behind it. Harry devoted himself to another helping of eggs and bacon. Ron was staring up at high, high windows, looking slightly preoccupied. Wait a moment, said Hermione suddenly. Oh no, serious. What's happened, said Harry, snatching the paper so violently it ripped down the middle, with him and Hermione each holding one half. The Ministry of Magic has received a tip-off from a reliable source that Sirius Black, notorious mass murderer, blah, 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 is currently hiding in London. Hermione read from her half in an anguished whisper. Lucius Malfoy, I'll bet anything, said Harry in a low, furious voice. He did recognize Sirius on the platform. What, said Ron, looking alarmed. You didn't say. Shh, said the other two. Ministry warns wizarding community that Black is very dangerous, killed 13 people, broke out of Azkaban. The usual rubbish. Hermione concluded, laying down the half of the paper and looking fearfully at Ron, Harry and Ron. Well, he just won't be able to leave the house again, that's what oh, yeah. he whispered. Dumbledore did warn him not to. Harry looked down glumly at the bit of the profits he had torn off. Most of the page was de devoted to an advertisement for Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions, which was apparently having a sale. Hey, he said, flattening it down so Hermione and Ron could see it. Look at this. I've got all the robes I want, said Ron. No, said Harry, look, this little piece here. Ron and Hermione bent closer to read it. The item was barely an inch long and placed right at the bottom of the column. It was headlined, Trespass at Ministry. Sturgis Podmore, 38 of number two, Laburnum Gardens, Clapham, has appeared in front of the Wizinger Mott, charged with trespass and attempted robbery at the Ministry of Magic on the 31st of August. Podmore was arrested by Ministry of Magic, Watch Wizard and, uh, Watch Wizard and Eric Munt who found him attempting to force his way through a top security door at one o'clock in the morning. Podmore, who refused to speak in his own defence, was convicted on both charges and sentenced to six months in Azkaban. Sturgis Podmore, said Ron slowly. He's that bloke who looks like his head's been thatched, isn't he? He's one of the order. Ron, shh, said Hermione, casting a terrified look around them. Six months in Azkaban, whispered Harry, shocked, just for trying to get through a door. Don't be silly. It wasn't just for trying to get through a door. What on earth was he doing at the Ministry of Magic at one o'clock in the morning? Breathed Hermione. You reckon he was doing something for the order? Ron muttered. Wait a moment, said Harry slowly. Sturgis was supposed to come and see us off, remember? The other two looked at him. Yeah, he was supposed to be part of our guard going to King's Cross, remember? And Moody was all annoyed because he didn't turn up. So he couldn't have been on a job for them, could he? Well, maybe they didn't expect him to get caught, said Hermione. It could be a frame-up, Ron exclaimed excitedly. No, listen. He went on dropping his voice dramatically at the threatening look on Hermione's face. The Ministry suspects he's one of Dumbledore's lot, so, I don't know, they lured him to the Ministry, and he wasn't try trying to get through a door at all. Maybe they've just made something up to get him. There was a pause while Harry and Hermione considered this. Harry thought it seemed far-fetched. Hermione, on the other hand, looked rather impressed. You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that were true. She folded up her half of the newspaper thoughtfully as Harry laid down his knife and oh, he he seemed to come out of the reverie. Right, well, I think we should tackle that essay to Sprout on self-fertilizing stuff first. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to start see. the animator's conjurous spell before lunch. 
Let's Harry see. felt a small twinge oh. of guilt at the thought of the pile of homework awaiting him, him upstairs. But the sky was a clear, exhilarating blue. And he had not been on his fire bolt all week. I mean, we can do it tonight, said Ron, as he and Harry walked down the sloping lawn towards the Quidditch pitch, their broomsticks over their shoulders. Let's and see. With dire warnings that they would fail, all their owls still ringing in their ears. And we've got tomorrow. She gets too worked up about work. That's her trouble. There was a pause, and he added in a slightly more anxious tone, do you think she meant it when she said we weren't copying from her? Yeah, I do, said Harry. Still, this is important too. We've got to practice if we want to stay on the Quidditch team. Yeah, that's right, said Ron in a heartened tone. And we have got plenty of time to do it all. As they approached the Quidditch pitch... There we go. Over to his right, Just lighten the eyes. Forest, Just lighten the eyes. Darkly. Nothing flew out of them. She's the so good and fluffy. Owls fluttering around the owlery tower. He had well... to worry about. The flying you got yourself your first arm. emote. He pushed it out of his mind. They collected balls from the cupboard in the changing room and set to work. Ron guarding the three tall goalposts. Harry playing chaser and trying to get the top uh. past Ron. Harry thought Ron was pretty good. He blocked three quarters of the goals Harry attempted to put past him and played better the longer they practiced. After a couple of hours, they returned to the castle for lunch, during which Hermione made it quite clear she thought they were irresponsible, then turned to the Quidditch pitch for the real training session. All their teammates but Angelina were already in the changing room when they entered. All right, Ron, said George, winking at him. Yeah, said Ron, who had become quieter and quieter all the way down to the pitch. Ready to show us all up, Ickle Prefect, said Fred, emerging tousle haired from the neck of his I'm so excited. Slightly yes, ma'am. Shut up, said Ron, stony faced, pulling on his own team ropes for the first time. They fitted him well considering Where are you? Oliver Woods. God damn it. There you are. Shoulder. Okay, everyone, said Angelina, entering from the captain's office, already changed. Let's get to it. Alicia and Fred, if you can just bring out the ball crate for us. Oh, and there are a couple of people out there watching, but I want you to just ignore them, all right? Something in her would-be casual voice made Harry think he might know who the uninvited spectators were. And sure enough, when they left the changing room for the bright sunlight of the pitch, it was to a storm of catcalls and jeers from the Slytherin Quidditch team and assorted hangers-on who were grouped halfway up the empty stands and whose voices echoed loudly around the stadium. What's that? Weasley's riding, Malfoy called in a sneering drawl. Why would anyone put a flying charm on a mouldy old log like that? Crab, Goyle, right. and Pansy Parker there you go. forward and shrieked with laughter. Ron mounted his broom. There you go. The ground, and Harry followed him, <laughs> watching his ears turn <laughs> red <laughs> behind <laughs> him. <laughs> Ignore them, he said, accelerating to catch up with Ron. We'll see who's laughing after we play them. Exactly the attitude I want, Harry, said Angela. Hi there, welcome. Soaring around the bottle under her arm <laughs> and slowing to hover on the spot in front of her airborne team. Okay, everyone. Yes. We're going to start yes. with some passes. You're welcome. Hold team, please. Hey, Johnson, what's with the hairstyle anyway, shrieked Pansy Parkinson from below. Why would anyone want to look like they've got worms coming out of their head? Angelina swept her long braided hair out of her face and continued calmly. Spread out then, and let's see what we can do. Harry reversed away from the others to the far side of the pitch. Ron fell back towards the opposite goal. Angelina raised the quaffle with one hand and threw it hard to Fred, who passed to George, who passed to Harry, who passed to Ron, who dropped it. The Slytherins, led by Malfoy, roared and screamed with laughter. Ron, who had pelted towards the ground to catch the quaffle before it landed, pulled out of the dive untidily so that he slipped sideways on his broom and returned to playing height, blushing. Harry saw Fred and George exchange looks. But uncharacteristically, uh, uncharacteristically, neither of them said anything, for which he was grateful. Pass it on, Ron, said, called Angelina, as though nothing had happened. Ron threw the quaffle to Alicia, who passed back to Harry, who passed to George. Hey, Potter, how's your scar feeling? called Malfoy. Sure you don't need to lie down? It must be, what, a whole week since you were in the hospital wing? That's a record for you, isn't it? George passed to Angelina. She reversed past to Harry, who had not been expecting it, but caught it but caught it in the very tips of his fingers and passed it quickly to Ron, who lunged for it and missed by inches. Come on now, Ron, said Angelina crossly, as he dived for the ground again, chasing the quaffle. Pay attention! It would have been hard to say whether Ron's face or the quaffle was a deeper scarlet when he again returned to playing height. Malfoy and the rest of the Slytherin team were howling with laughter. On his third attempt, Ron caught the quaffle. Perhaps out of a relief, he passed it on so enthusiastically that it soared straight through Katie's outstretched hands and hit her hard in the face. Sorry, Ron groaned, zooming forwards to see whether he had done any damage. Get back in position, she's fine, barked Angelina. But as you're passing to a teammate, do not try to knock her off her broom, won't you? We've got bludgers for that. Katie's nose was bleeding. 
Down below, the Slytherins were stamping their feet and jeering. Fred and George converged on Katie. Here, take this, Fred told her, handing her something small and purple from out of his pocket. It'll clear up in no time. All right, called Angelina. Fred, George, go and get your bat and a bludger. Ron, get up to the goalpost. Harry, release the snitch when I say so. We're going to aim for Ron's goal, obviously. Harry zoomed off after the twins to fetch the snitch. Ron's making a right pig's ear of things, isn't he, muttered George, as the three of them landed at the crate containing the balls and opened it to extract one of the bludgers and the snitch. He's just nervous, said Harry. He was fine when I was practicing with him in the morning. Yeah, well, hope he hasn't peaked too soon, said Fred gloomily. They returned to the air. When Angelina blew her whistle, Harry released the snitch, and Fred and George let fly the bludger. From that moment on, Harry was barely aware of what the others were doing. It was his job to recapture the tiny fluttering golden ball that was worth 150 points for the Seekers team, and doing so required enormous speed and skill. He accelerated, rolling and swerving in and out of the chases, the warm autumn air, autumn air whipping his face, and the distant yells of the Slytherins, so much meaningless roaring in his ears. But too soon the whistles brought him to a halt again. Stop! 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 screamed Angelina. Ron, you're not covering your middle post! Harry looked around at Ron. He was hovering in front of the left-hand hoop, leaving the other two completely unprotected. Oh, sorry. You keep shifting around while you're watching the chasers, said Angelina. Either stay in centre position until you have to move to defend a hoop, or else circle the hoops, but don't drift vaguely off to one side. That's how you let in the last three goals. Sorry, Ron repeated, his red face shining like a beacon against the bright blue sky. And Katie, can't you do something about that nosebleed? It's just getting worse, said Katie thickly, attempting to stem the flow with her sleeve. Harry glanced around at Fred, who was looking anxious and checking his pockets. He saw Fred pull out something purple, examine it for a second, and then look around at Katie, evidently horror-struck. Well, let's try again, said Angelina. She was ignoring the Slytherins, who had now set up a chant of Gryffindora losers, Gryffindora losers. But there was a certain rigid rigidity about her seat on the broom, nevertheless. This time, they had been flying for barely three minutes when Angelina's whistle sounded. Harry, who had just sighted the snitch, circled the opposite goalpost, pulled up, feeling distinctly aggrieved. What now, he said impatiently to Alicia, who was nearest. Katie, she said shortly. Harry turned and saw Angelina, Fred and George, all flying as fast as they could towards Katie. Harry and Alicia sped towards her too. It was plain that Angelina had stopped training just in time. Katie was now chalk white and covered in blood. She needs the hospital wing, said Angelina. We'll take her, said Fred. She, uh, she might have swallowed uh, a blood blister pod by mistake. Well, there's no point continuing with no beaters and a chaser gone, said Angelina glumly, as Fred and George zoomed off towards the castle, supporting Katie between them. Come on, let's go and get changed. The Slytherins continued to chant as they trailed back into the changing rooms. How was practice? asked Hermione rather coolly half an hour later, as Harry and Ron climbed through the portrait hole into the Gryffindor common room. It was, uh, Harry began. Completely lousy, said Ron in a hollow voice, sinking into a chair beside Hermione. She looked up at Ron and her frostiness seemed to melt. Well, it was only your first one, she said consolingly. It's bound to take time to... Who said it was me who made it lousy, snapped Ron. No one, said Hermione, looking taken aback. I thought... You thought I was bound to be rubbish. No, of course I didn't. Look, you said it was lousy, so I just... I'm going to get started on some homework, said Ron angrily, and stomped off to the staircase to the boys' dormitories and vanished from sight. Hermione turned to Harry. Was he lousy? No, said Harry loyally. Hermione raised her eyebrows. Well, I suppose he could have played better, Harry muttered, but it was only the first training session, like you said. Neither Harry nor Ron seemed to make much headway with their homework that night. Harry knew Ron was too preoccupied with how badly he had performed at a Quidditch practice, and he himself was having difficulty in getting the Gryffindor our losers chant out of his head. They spent the whole of Sunday in the common room, buried in their books while the room around them filled up, and then emptied. It was another clear, fine day, and most of their fellow Gryffindors spent the day out in the grounds, enjoying what might well be some of the last sunshine that year. By the evening, Harry felt as though somebody had been beating his brain against the inside of his skull. You know, we probably should try and get more homework done during the week, Harry muttered to Ron, as they finally laid aside Professor McGonagall's long essay for the Animator's Conjurer Spell, and turned miserably to Professor Sinistra's equally long and difficult essay about Jupiter's many moons. Yeah, said Ron, rubbing slightly bloodshot eyes and throwing his fifth spoiled, his fifth spoiled bit of parchment into the fire beside them. Listen, we just asked Hermione if we could have a look at what she's done. Harry glanced over at her. She was sitting with Crookshanks on her lap, 
and chatting merrily to Ginny as a pair of knitting needles flashed in mid-air in front of her, now knitting a pair of shapeless elf socks. No, he said heavily, you know she won't let us. And so they worked on while yep. the sky outside you gotta learn. Steadily dark. You can't, Slowly, you can't rely on everybody. You gotta do it. A half past yourself. Eleven, wandered over to them, yawning. Oh, he's, he's playing really Hollow Knight. No, said Ron shortly. Jupiter's biggest moon is Ganymede, not Callisto, she said, pointing over Ron's shoulder at a line in his astronomy essay. And it's Eo that's got the volcanoes. Thanks, snarled Ron, scratching out the offending sentences. Sorry, I only... Yeah, well, you just come over here to criticise. Ron, haven't got time to listen to a sermon, all right, Hermione? I'm up to my neck in it here. No, look. Hermione was pointing to the nearest window. Harry and Ron both looked over. A handsome screech owl was standing on the windowsill, gazing into the room at Ron. Isn't that Hermes? said Hermione, standing amazed. Blimey, it is, said Ron quietly, throwing down his quill and getting to his feet. What's Percy writing to me for? He crossed to the window and opened it. Hermes flew inside, landing on Ron's essay, and held out a leg to which a letter was attached. Ron took the letter off it. Hello! And the once, leaving inky footprints across Ron's drawing of the moon Eo. Hello! That's definitely Percy's handwriting, said Ron, sinking back into his chair and staring at the words on the outside of the scroll. Ronald Weasley, Gryffindor House, Hogwarts. He looked up at the other two. What do you reckon? Open it, said Hermione eagerly, and Harry nodded. Ron unrolled the scroll and began to read. The further down the parchment his eyes travelled, the more pronounced became his scowl. When he'd finished reading, he looked disgusted. He thrust the letter at Harry and Hermione, who leaned towards each other to read it together. Dear Ron, I've only just heard from no less than a person than the Minister for Magic himself, who has it from your new teacher, Professor Umbridge, that you have become a Hogwarts prefect. I was most pleasantly surprised when I heard this news, and must firstly offer my congratulations. I must admit that I have always been afraid that you would take what we might call the Fred and George route, rather than following in my footsteps, so you can imagine why my feelings on hearing you have stopped flouting authority and have decided to shoulder some real responsibility. But I want to give you more than congratulations, Ron. I want to give you some advice, which is why I'm sending mm. this at night rather than by the usual morning post. Hopefully you will, be able, you, will be, you will be able to read this away from prying eyes and avoid awkward questions. From something the minister let slip when telling me you are now a prefect, I gather that you are still seeing a lot of Harry Potter. I must tell you, Ron, that nothing could put you in danger of losing your badge more than continued fraternization with that boy. Yes, I am sure you are surprised to hear this. No doubt you will say that Potter has always been Dumbledore's favourite. But I feel bound to tell you that Dumbledore may not be in charge at Hogwarts much longer, and the people who count have a very different and probably more accurate view of Potter's behaviour. I shall say no more here, but if you look at the Daily Prophet tomorrow, you will get a good, good idea of the way the wind is blowing, and see if you can spot yours truly. Seriously, Ron, you do not want to be tarred with the same brush as Potter. It could be very damaging to your future prospects, and I am talking here about life after school too. As you must be aware, given that our father escorted him to court, Potter had a disciplinary hearing this summer in front of the whole Wizengamot, and he did not come out of it looking too good. He got off on a mere technicality, if you ask me, and many of the people I've spoken to remain convinced of his guilt. It may be that you are afraid to sever ties with Potter. I know that he can be unbalanced, and for all I know, violent. But if you have any worries about this, or have spotted anything else in Potter's behaviour that is troubling you, I urge you to speak to Dolores Umbridge, a truly delightful woman who I know will be only too happy to advise you. This leads me to my other bit of advice. I found him. He's in the game. Dumbledore patches is a boss. May soon be over. Fuck Dolores Patches. Did not be to him, but to the school and the ministry. Fuck Patches. To hear that so far, Professor Umbridge is encountering very little cooperation from staff as she strives to make those necessary changes within Hogwarts that the ministry so ardently desires. Although she should find this easier from next week. Again, see the Daily Prophet tomorrow. I shall say only this. A student who shows himself willing to help Professor Umbridge now may be very well placed for head boyship in a couple of years. I am sorry that I was unable to see more of you over the summer. It pains me to criticise our parents, but I'm afraid I can no longer live under their roof while they remain mixed up with the dangerous crowd around Dumbledore. If you are writing to Mother at any point, you might tell her that a certain Sturgis Podmore, who is a great friend of Dumbledore's, has recently been sent to Azkaban. A trespass at the Ministry. Perhaps that will open their eyes to the kind of petty criminals with whom they are currently rubbing shoulders. I count myself very lucky to have escaped the stigma of association with such people. The minister really could not be more gracious to me. 
And I do hope, Ron, that you will not allow family ties to blind you to the misguided nature of our parents. Fuck patches. I sincerely hope that in time they will realize how mistaken they were. And I shall, of course, be ready to accept the full apology when that day comes. Please think over what I have said most carefully, particularly the bit about Harry Potter. And congratulations again on becoming prefect. Your brother, Percy. Harry looked up at Ron. Well, he said, trying to sound as though he found the whole thing a joke. If you want to, uh, what is it? He checked Percy's letter. Oh, yeah, sever ties with me. I swear I won't get violent. Give it back, said Ron, holding out his hand. He is, Ron said jerkily, tearing, per tearing Percy's letter in half. The world, he tore it into quarters. Fergus, he tore it into eight. Git, he threw the piece Damn. into the fire. Come on, Damn. I'm gonna get this finished. He's a Some git. Before dawn, he said briskly to Harry. Oh. Professor Sinistra's essay. Back wow. Hermione was looking at Ron. Calling your brother a git. I mean, he is, Let's but. Here, she said abruptly. What, said Ron? Give them to me. I'll look through them and correct them, she said. Are you serious? Ah, oh, Hermione, you're a lifesaver, said Ron. What can I... What you can say is, we promise we'll never leave our homework this late again, she said, holding out both hands for their essays. But she looked slightly amused all the same. Thanks a million, Hermione, said Harry weakly, passing over his essay and sinking back into his armchair, rubbing his eyes. It was now past midnight and the common room was deserted, but for the three of them and Crookshank. The only sound was that of Hermione's quill scratching out sentences. All right, there I have halfway made, made a list of games, TV shows, movies, and books I like, and shall do the anime listings tomorrow. Uh, as it is twelve thirty-eight five a.m. Yeah, that's fine. No, I'm saying that it's a good way to figure out what you want to do. Setting up goals is. This is a strive for the future, and setting up goals can set you up for a brighter tomorrow. So get some good rest. Enjoy yourself. If you need, and if you need to stay in the stream, to if you want to stay in the stream, that's fine. If you need to go, that's totally fine. We're all we're all about you getting rest. But this is a good chance of figuring out what you want to do with your life. Setting up goals of like what you want to do with your art, and you can, uh, and what you want to do further, uh, further in your career. So keep us posted, check back later, and make sure. And we'll be, I'll be back on, uh, at around 12 a.m. this time. So just keep an eye out to him for months. But there was something about seeing it in writing writing down like that in Percy's writing, about knowing that Percy was advising Ron to stop him and even tell tales about him to Umbridge that made his situation real to him, as nothing else had. He had known Percy for four years, had stayed in his house during the summer holidays, shared a tent with him during the Quidditch World Cup, had even been awarded full marks by him in the second task of the Triwizard Tournament last year. Yet now, Percy fought him unbalanced and possibly violent. And with a surge of sympathy for his godfather, Harry fought Sirius, who was probably the only person he knew who could really understand how he felt at the moment, because Sirius was in the same situation. Nearly everyone in the wizarding world thought Sirius a dangerous murderer and a great Voldemort supporter, and he had had to live with that knowledge for 14 years. Harry blinked. He had just seen something in the fire that could not have been there. It had flashed into sight and vanished immediately. No, it could not have been. He'd imagined it because he'd been thinking about Sirius. Okay, write that down, Hermione said to Ron, pushing his essay in a sheet cover, covered in her own writing back to Ron. Then add this conclusion I've written for you. Hermione, you are honestly the most wonderful person I've ever met, said Ron weakly. And if I'm ever rude to you again, I'll know you're back to normal, said Hermione. Harry, yours is okay, except for this bit at the end. I think you must have misheard, Professor Sinistra. Europa's covered in ice, not mice, Harry. Harry had slid off his chair Thank you. His knees. Yeah. I'll make sure to do so. Good night. It didn't let me uh, kill him. What the fuck? Patches is a mortal. I've just seen Sirius's head in the fire, said Harry. He spoke quite calmly. After all, he had seen Sirius's head in this very fire the previous year and talked to it. Nevertheless, he could not be sure if he had really seen it this time. It had vanished so quickly. Sirius's head, Hermione repeated. You mean like when he wanted to talk to you during the Triwizard Tournament. But he wouldn't do that now. It would be too serious. 
He gasped, gazing at the fire. Ron dropped his quill. There in the middle of the dancing flames sat Sirius's head, long dark hair falling around his grinning face. I was starting to think. You'd go to bed before everyone else and disappeared, he said. I've been checking every hour. You've been popping into the fire every hour, Harry said, half laughing. Just for a few seconds to check if the coast was clear. What have you been seeing, said Hermione anxiously. Well, I think a girl, first year by the look of her, might have got a glimpse of me earlier. But don't worry, Sirius said hastily, as Hermione clapped a hand to her mouth. I was gone the moment she looked back at me, and I'll bet she just thought I was an oddly shaped log or something. But Sirius, this is taking an awful risk, Hermione began. You sound like Molly, said Sirius. This was the only way I could come up with of answering Harry's letter without resorting to a code, and codes are breakable. At the mention of Harry's letter, Hermione and Ron both turned to stare at him. You didn't say you'd written to Sirius, said Hermione accusingly. I, uh, I forgot, said Harry, which was perfectly true. His meeting with Cho in the Owlery had driven everything before it out of his mind. Don't look at me like that, Hermione. There was no way anyone would have got a secret information out of it. Was there, Sirius? No, it was very good, said Sirius, smiling. Anyway, we'd better get, get be quick, just in case we're disturbed. Your scarf. What about, Ron began, but Hermione interrupted him. We'll tell you afterwards. Go on, Sirius. Well, I know it can't be fun when it hurts, but we don't think it's anything to really worry about. It kept aching all last year, didn't it? Yeah, and Dumbledore said it happened whenever Voldemort was feeling a powerful emotion, said Harry, ignoring, as usual, Ron and Hermione's winces. So maybe he was just, I don't know, really angry or something, the night I had that detention. Well, now he's back, to, back. it's bound to hurt more often, said Sirius. So you don't think it had anything to do with Umbridge touching me when I was in detention with her, Harry asked. I doubt it, said Sirius. I know her by reputation, I'm sure she's no Death Eater. She's foul enough to be one, said Harry darkly, and Ron Hannah and Hermione nodded vigorously in agreement. Yes, but the world isn't split into good people and Death Eaters. And Sirius, said Sirius with a wry smile, I know she's a nasty piece of work, though. She should, <laughs> you should hear Remus talk about her. Does Lupin know her? asked Harry quickly, remembering Umbridge's comments about dangerous half-breeds during her first lesson. No, said Sirius, but he, she drafted a bit of anti-werewolf legislation two years ago that makes it almost impossible for him to get a job. Harry remembered how much shabbier Lupin looked these days, and his dislike of Umbridge deepened even further. What's she got against werewolves? said Hermione angrily. Scared of them, I expect, said Sirius, smiling at her indignation. Apparently she loathes part humans. She campaigned to have mere people, mer people, rounded up and tagged last year. Two, imagine wasting your time and energy persecuting mer people when there are little toe rags like Poocher on the loose. Ron laughed, but Hermione looked upset. Sirius, she said reproachfully, honestly, if you made a bit of an effort with Preacher, I'm sure he'd respond. After all, you are the only member of his family he's got left. And Professor Dumbledore said. So, what are Umbridge's lessons like, Sirius interrupted. Is she training you all to kill half-breeds? No, said Harry, ignoring Hermione's affronted look at being cut off in her defensive creature. She's not letting us use magic at all. All we do is read the stupid textbook, said Ron. Ah, well, that figures, said Sirius. Our information from inside the Ministry is that Fudge doesn't want you trained in combat. Trained in combat, repeated Harry incredulously. What does he think we're doing here, forming some sort of wizard army? That's exactly what he thinks you're doing, said Sirius. Or rather, that's exactly what he's afraid Dumbledore's doing, forming his own private army, with which he will be able to take on the Ministry of Magic. There was a pause at this. Then Ron said, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard, including all the stuff that Luna Lovegood comes out with. So... We're being prevented from learning defense against the dark arts because Fudge is scared we'll use spells against the Ministry, said Hermione, looking furious. Yup, said Sirius. Fudge thinks Dumbledore will stop at nothing to seize power. He's getting more paranoid about Dumbledore by the day. It's a matter of time before he has Dumbledore arrested on some trumped-up charge. This reminded Harry of Percy's letter. Do you know if there's going to be anything about Dumbledore in the Daily Prophet tomorrow? Ron's brother Percy reckons there will be. I don't know, said Sirius. I haven't seen anything from the Order all weekend. They're all busy. Just been creature and me here. There was a definite note of bitterness in Sirius's voice. So you haven't had any news about Hagrid either? Ah, said Sirius. Well, he was supposed to be back by now. No one's sure what's happened to him. Then, seeing their stricken faces, he added quickly. But Dumbledore's not worried. So don't you three get yourselves in a state. I'm sure Hagrid's fine. But if he was supposed to be back by now, said Hermione, in a small, anxious voice, Madame Maxime was with him. We've been in touch with her, and she says they got separated on the journey home. But there's nothing to suggest he's hurt or... Well, nothing to suggest he's not perfectly okay. Unconvinced, Harry, Ron, and Hermione exchanged worried looks. Listen, don't go asking too many questions about Hagrid, said Sirius hastily. 
I'll just, it'll just draw even more attention to the fact that he's not back, and I know Dumbledore doesn't want that. Hagrid's tough, he'll be okay. And when they did not appear cheered by this, Sirius added, when's your next Hogsmeade weekend anyway? I was thinking we got away with a dog disguise at the station, didn't we? I thought I could... No, said Harry and Hermione together very loudly. Sirius, didn't you see the Deadly Prophet, said Hermione anxiously. Oh, that, said Sirius, grinning. They're always guessing where I am. They haven't really got a clue. Yeah, but we think this time they have, said Harry. Something Malfoy said on the train made us think he knew it was you. And his father was on that platform, Sirius. You know, Lucius Malfoy. So don't come up here, whatever you do. If Malfoy recognises you again... All right, all right, I've got the point, said Sirius. He looked most displeased. Just an idea, thought you might like to get together. I would. I just don't want you chucked back in Azkaban, said Harry. There was a pause in which Sirius looked out of the fire at Harry, a crease between his sunken eyes. You're less like your father than I thought, he said finally, a definite coolness in his voice. The risk would have been what it made it fun for James. Look, well, I'd better get going. I can hear Creature coming down the stairs, said Sirius, but Harry was sure he was lying. I'll write to, you, write to tell you a time I can make it back to the fire, then, shall I? If you can stand to risk it. It was a tiny pot, and the place where Sirius's head had been was flickering flame once more. Did you know that almonds have seven essential vitamins and nutrients? California Almonds, your friend in wellness. Chapter 15, The Hogwarts High Inquisitor they expected to have to comb Hermione's daily profit carefully next morning to find the article Percy had mentioned in his letter. However, the departing delivery owl had barely cleared the top of the milk jug when Hermione let out a huge gasp and had flattened the newspaper to reveal a large photograph of Dolores Umbridge smiling widely and blinking slowly at them from beneath the headline, Ministry Seeks Educational Reform. Dolores Umbridge appointed first ever High Inquisitor. Umbridge? High Inquisitor, said Harry darkly his half-eaten piece of toast slipping from his fingers. What does that mean? Hermione read aloud. In a surprise move last night, the Ministry of Magic passed new legislation, giving itself an unprecedented level of control at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The Minister has been growing uneasy about goings-on at Hogwarts for some time, said Junior Assistant uh, to the Minister, Percy Weasley. He is now responding to concerns voiced by anxious parents who feel the school may be moving in a direction they do not approve of. This is not the first time in recent weeks that the minister, Cornelius Fudge, has used new laws of effect to effect improvements at the Wizarding School. As recently as 30th of August, Educational Decree Number 22 was passed to ensure that in the event of the current headmaster being unable to provide a candidate for a teaching post, the ministry should select an appropriate person. That's how Dolores Umbridge came to be appointed to the teaching staff at Hogwarts, said Weasley last night. Dumbledore couldn't find anyone so the minister put in Umbridge, and of course, he's been an immediate success. He's been a what? said Harry loudly. Wait, there's more, said Hermione grimly. An immediate success, totally revolutionising the teaching of Defence Against the Dark Arts and providing the minister with on-the-ground feedback about what's really happening at Hogwarts. It is the last function that the ministry has now formalised with the passing of Educational Decree Number 23, which creates the new position of Hogwarts High Inquisitor. This is an exciting new phase in the minister's plan to get to grips with what some are calling the falling standards at Hogwarts, said Weasley. The Inquisitor will have power to inspect her fellow educators and make sure that they are coming up to scratch. Professor Umbridge has been offered this position in addition to her own teaching post, and we are delighted to say that she has accepted. The ministry's new moves have received enthusiastic support from parents of students at Hogwarts. I feel much easier in my mind now that I know Dumbledore is being subjected to fair and objective evaluation, said Mr. Lucius Malfoy. This is 41, speaking from his Wiltshire mansion last night. I love the colors in this one, yes. So what do you think of the e-boat, Yvonne? And I'm glad to know that the Ministry is keeping an eye on the situation. Among those, those eccentric decisions are undoubtedly the controversial staff appointments previously described in this newspaper, which have included the employment of Werewolf, Remus Lupin, Half-Giant, Rubius Hagrid, and delusional ex Audra Aura, Mad-Eye Moody. Rumours abound, of course, that Albus Dumbledore, once supreme mugwump of the International Confederation of Wizards and chief warlock of the Wizendermot, is no longer up to the task of managing the prestigious school of Hogwarts. I think the appointment of the Inquisitor is a first step towards ensuring that Hogwarts has a headmaster in whom we can all repose our confidence, said a ministry insider last night. Wizengamot elders Griselda Marchbanks and Tiberius Ogden have resigned in protest at the introduction of the post of Inquisitor to Hogwarts. Hogwarts is a school, not an outpost of Cornelius Fudge's office, said Madame Marchbanks. 
This is a further disgusting attempt to discredit Albus Dumbledore. For a full account of Madame Marchbank's alleged links to subversive goblin groups, turn to page 17. Hermione finished reading and looked across the table at the other two. So now we know it's amazing. I can't wait to use it. Fudge. Now I have to get my other ones done. Yes, what, what are your other ones? Hermione was breathing fast, and her eyes were. What are your other ones? It's outrageous. I know it is, said Harry. He looked down at his right hand clenched on the tabletop and saw the faint white outline of the words Umbridge had forced him to cut into his skin. But a grin was unfurling on Ron's face. What? said Harry and Hermione together, staring at him. Oh, I can't wait to see McGonagall inspected, said Ron happily. Umbridge won't know what's hit her. Well, come on, said Hermione, jumping up. We'd better get going. If she's inspecting Bing's class, we don't want to be late. But Professor Umbridge was not inspecting their ministry of mag their history of magic lesson which was just as dull as the previous Monday, nor was she in Snape's dungeon when they arrived for double potions, where Harry's Moonstone essay was handed back to him with a large spiky black D scrawled in the upper corner. I've awarded you grades you would have received if you presented this work in your owl, said Snape with a smirk, as he swept among them, passing back their homework. This should give you a realistic idea of what to expect from the Which is really funny, because he Snape passes his owls. The general standard of this homework. Time to do it. Most of you have failed. Uh, I'll lick one for me. And I'm going to work on the words. Are uh, are hard one. Words are heard. Of venom antidote, or I shall have to start handing out detentions to those dunces who get a D. He smirked as Malfoy sniggered and said in a carrying whisper, "Some people have got a D." <laughs> Harry realized that Hermione was looking sideways to see what grade he had received. He slid his Moonstone essay back into his bag as quickly as possible, feeling that he would rather keep that information private. Determined not to give Snape an excuse to fail him this lesson, Harry read and reread every line of instructions on the blackboard at least three times before acting on them. The strengthening solution was not precisely the clear turquoise shade of Hermione's, but it was at least blue rather than pink, like Neville's, and he delivered a flask of it to Snape's desk at the end of the lesson with a feeling of mingled de defiance and relief. Well... And that wasn't as bad as last week, was it? Said Hermione as they climbed the steps out of the dungeon. It's really funny. The towards like I'm and pretty sure the next one is Half Blood Prince, it. and he is Whether in his class. Answered, she pressed on. I mean, all right. I didn't expect the top grade. Not if it's um, he's marking to Owl standard, but a pass is quite encouraging at this stage, wouldn't you say? Harry made a non-committal noise in his throat. Of course, a lot can happen between now and the exam. We've got plenty of time to improve, but. The grades we're getting now are a sort of baseline, aren't they? Something we can build on. They sat down together at the Gryffindor table. Obviously, I'd have been thrilled if I'd got an O. Hermione, said Ron sharply, if you want to know what grades we got, ask. I don't, I didn't mean, well, well, if you want to tell me. I got a P, said Ron, ladling soup into his bowl. Happy? Well, that's nothing to be ashamed of, says Fred, who had just arrived at the table with George and Lee Jordan, Jordan and was sitting down on Harry's right. Nothing wrong with a good, healthy P. But, said Hermione, doesn't P stand for poor? Yeah, said Lee Jordan. Still better than D, isn't it? Dreadful. Harry felt his face grow warm and faked a small coughing fit over his roll. When he emerged from this, he was sorry to find that Hermione was still in full flow about owl grades. So, top grades, O for outstanding, he was saying. And then there's A. No, E, George corrected her. E for exceeds expectations. And I've always thought Fred and I should have got E in everything because we exceeded expectations just by turning up for the exams. They all laughed except mm. Hermione, who plowed on. Smog so art. It's A for acceptable, and that's the last pass grade, isn't it? Yep, said Fred. What setting? Entire role in his I don't use the setting. Mouth and swallowing it whole. Um, then, P for Paul. Hold up, so I can think. Um, uh, so I don't use a setting. What I use is, uh, so you go up to your file, you create a new... And then I, right now I'm using 300 by 300 in a resolution of 90. And that should be your, uh, your size. It is 300 by 300 in resolution 90. You're going to fill up the entire, you're going to try to fill up the entire thing which I might just need to pull up a little bit so it's filling up. 
Disturbia, Disturbia, Ron raised both his arms in mock celebration, and D for dreadful. And then T, George reminded him. T, asked Hermione, looking at Paul, even lower than a D? What on earth does T stand for? Troll, said George promptly. Harry laughed again, but he was not sure whether or not George was joking. He imagined trying to conceal from Hermione that he had received T's, and all his owls, and immediately resolved to work harder from now on. Have you lot had an expected lesson yet? Fred asked him. No, said Hermione at once. Have you? Just now, before lunch, said George. Charms. What was it like? Harry Resolution 90, yeah, thanks. Well, well, I hate my uh, autocorrect. Just lurked in the corner, so it it's all good. Um, like. Just remember to fill up the screen. Just to remember, like, just like my, uh, the one that I made, you got to fill up the screen. You got to really, got to really fill up the screen, make it uh, fit, fit to it, and make sure that it, uh, that you can, because the emote, your, uh, all of that white space is usable space. You want to make sure that when they look at that emote, they see uh, usable, they you you're using all of the space. <laughs> Taking notes. No. Was normally like. Alicia told her they were really good. That was it. I can't see old Footwork getting marked down. Said George. He usually gets everything through their exams. All right. We. Who have you got this afternoon? Fred asked Harry. Trelawney. A T. If ever I saw one. And Umbridge herself. Well, be a good boy and keep your temper with Umbridge today, said George. Angelina will do her nut if you miss any more Quidditch practices. But Harry did not have to wait for Defence Against the Dark Arts to meet Professor Umbridge. He was pulling out his green diary and a seat at the very back of the shadowy divination room when Ron elbowed him in the ribs. And looking around, he saw Professor Umbridge emerging through the trapdoor in the Use pool. as much space as possible. Part, Got it. Same here, Zara. Theory, he fell silent at once. The abrupt fall in the noise level made Professor Trelawney who had been wafting about handing out copies of the Dream Oracle, look around. Good afternoon, Professor Trelawney, said Professor Umbridge with her wide smile. You received my note, I trust, giving the uh, time and date of your inspection. Professor Trelawney nodded curtly and looked very disgruntled, turned her back on Professor Umbridge and continued to give out books. Still smiling, Professor Umbridge grasped the back of the nearest armchair and pulled it to the front of the class so that it was a few inches behind Professor Trelawney's seat. She then sat down, took her clipboard from her flowery bag and looked up expectantly, waiting for the class to begin. Professor Trelawney pulled her shawl tight about her with slightly trembling hands and surveyed the class through her hugely magnifying lenses. We shall uh, be continuing our study of prophetic dreams today, she said in a brave attempt at her usual mystic tones, though her voice shook slightly. Divide into pairs, please, and interpret each other's uh, latest night-time visions with the aid of the oracle. She made as though to sweep back to her seat, saw Professor Umbridge sitting right beside it, and immediately veered left towards Pavati and Lavender, who were already deep in discussion about Pavati's most recent dream. Harry opened his copy of the Dream Oracle, watching Umbridge covertly. She was already making notes on her clipboard. After a few minutes, she got to her feet and began to pace the room in Trelawney's wake, listening to her conversations with students and posing questions here and there. Harry bent his head hurriedly over his book. Think of a dream quick, he told Ron in case the old toad comes our way. I did it last time, Ron protested. It's your turn. You tell me one. Oh, I don't know, said Harry desperately. He could not remember dreaming anything at all over the last few days. Let's say I dreamed I was a drowning snake in my cauldron. Yeah, that'll do. Ron chortled as he opened his dream oracle. Okay, you've got to add your age to the date you had the dream. The number of letters in the subject. Would that be drowning or cauldron or snake? It doesn't matter. Pick any of them, said Harry, chancing a glance behind him. Professor Umbridge was now standing at Professor Trelawney's shoulder, making notes, while the divination uh, da, 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 about his dream diary. Well, what night did you dream this again? Ron said, well, well, immersed in calculations. I don't know, last night? Whenever you like, Harry told him, trying to listen to what Umbridge was saying to Professor Trelawney. They were only a table away from him and Ron now. Professor Umbridge was making another note on her clipboard, and Professor Trelawney was looking extremely put out. Now, said Umbridge, looking up at Trelawney, you've been in this post how long exactly? Professor Trelawney scowled at her, arms crossed and shoulders hunched, 
as though wishing to protect herself as much as possible from the indignity of the Hate that question. After a slight pause in which she seemed to decide that the question was not so offensive that she could reasonably ignore it, she said in a deeply resentful tone, Nearly sixteen years. Quite a period, said Professor Umbridge, making note on her clipboard. So it was Professor Dumbledore who appointed you? That's right, said Professor Trelawney shortly. Professor Umbridge made another note. And you are a great-great-granddaughter of the celebrated seer Cassandra Trelawney? Yes, said Professor Trelawney, holding her head a little higher. Another note on the clipboard. But I think, correct me if I am mistaken, that you are the first in your family since Cassandra to be possessed of second sight. These things often skip, er, uh, three generations, said Professor Trelawney. Professor Umbridge's toad-like smile widened. Ah, of course, she said sweetly, making yet another note. Well, if you could just predict something for me then. And she looked up inquiringly, still smiling. Professor Trelawney stiffened, as though unable to believe her ears. I, I don't understand you, she said, clutching convulsively at the shawl around her scrawny neck. <laughs> I'd like you to make a prediction for me, said Professor Umbridge very clearly. Harry and Ron were not the only people now watching and listening sneakily from behind their books. Most of the class were staring, transfixed, at Professor Trelawney as she drew herself up to her full height, her beads and bangles clinking. The inner eye uh, does not see upon command, she said in scandalized tones. I see, said Professor Umbridge softly, making yet another note on her clipboard. I, but, 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 but wait, said Professor Trelawney suddenly, in an attempt at her usual ethereal voice though the mystical, mystical effect was ruined somewhat by the way it was shaking with anger. I I think I do see something. Oh, my uh, goodness. Oh, you. my gracious. I, I sense something, something, something dark, some grave peril. Professor Trelawney pointed a shaking finger at Professor Umbridge, who continued to smile blandly at her, eyebrows raised. I, I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid you're in grave danger, Professor Trelawney finished dramatically. There was a pause. Professor Umbridge's eyebrows were still raised. Right, she said softly scribbling on her clipboard once more. Well, if that's really the best you can do. She turned away, leaving Professor Trelawney standing rooted to the spot, her chest heaving. Harry caught Ron's eye and knew that Ron was thinking exactly the same as he was. They both knew that Professor Trelawney was an old fraud, but on the other hand, they loathed Umbridge so much that they felt very much on Trelawney's side, until she swooped down on them a few seconds later, that is. Well, she said, snapping her long fingers under Harry's nose, uncharacteristically brisk. Let's see the start you've made on your dream diary, please. And by the time she had interpreted Harry's dreams at the top of her voice, all of which, even the ones that involved eating porridge, apparently foretold a gruesome and early death, he was feeling much less sympathetic towards her. All the while, Professor Umbridge stood a few feet away, making notes on that clipboard, and when the bell rang, she was descended the silver ladder first and was waiting for them all when they reached their Defence Against the Dark Arts lesson ten minutes later. She was humming and smiling to herself when they entered the room. Harry and Ron told Hermione, who had been in arithmetic, exactly what had happened in divination, while they all took out their copies of Defensive Magical Theory. But before Hermione could ask any questions, Professor Umbridge had called them all to order and silence fell. Ron's away, she instructed them all with a smile, and those people who had been hopeful enough to take them out sadly returned them to their bags. As we finished Chapter 1 last lesson, I would like you all to turn to page 19 today and commence Chapter 2. Common defensive theories and their derivation. There will be no need to talk. Still smiling, her wide, self-satisfied smile, she sat down at her desk. The class gave an audible sigh as it turned as one to page 19. Harry wondered dully whether there were any enough chapters in the book to keep them reading through all this year's lessons, and was on the point of checking the contents page when he noticed that Hermione had her hand in the air again. Professor Umbridge had noticed too. And what was more, she seemed to have worked out a strategy for just such an eventuality. Instead of trying to pretend she had not noticed Hermione, she got to her feet and walked around the front row of desks until Burger they were town. face to face. Then she bent down and whispered so that the rest of the class could not hear. What is it this time, Miss Granger? I I've already read chapter two, said Hermione. Well then, proceed to chapter three. I've read that too. I've read the whole book. Professor Umbridge blinked but recovered her poise almost instantly. Well then. You should be able to tell me what Slinkhard says about counterjinxes in Chapter 15. He says the counterjinxes are improperly named, said Hermione promptly. He says counterjinx is just a name people give their jinxes when they want to make them sound more acceptable. Professor Umbridge raised her eyebrows, and Harry knew she was impressed against her will. But I disagree, Hermione continued. Professor Umbridge's eyebrows rose a little higher, and her gaze became distinctly colder. You disagree? Yes, I do, said Hermione. 
who, unlike Umbridge, was not whispering, but speaking in a clear, carrying voice that by now attracted the attention of the rest of the class. Mr. Slinger yeah, does burger, like burger. Stories, does he? Burger, but burger. I think they can be very useful when they're used defensively. Oh, you do, do you? said Professor Umbridge, forgetting to whisper and straightening up. Well, I'm afraid it is Mr. Slinkard's opinion and not yours that matters within this classroom, Miss Granger. But, Hermione began, that is enough, said Professor Umbridge. She walked back to the front of the class and stood before them, all the jauntiness she had shown at the beginning of the lesson gone. Miss Granger, I'm going to take five points from Gryffindor House. There was an outbreak of muttering at this. What for, said Harry angrily. Don't you get involved, Hermione whispered urgently to him. For disrupting my class with pointless interruptions, said Professor Umbridge smoothly. I'm here to teach you, you using a ministry-approved method that does not include inviting students to give their opinions on matters about which they understand very little. Your previous teachers in the subject may have allowed you more license, but as none of them, with the possible exception of Professor Quirrell, who did at least appear to have restricted himself to age-appropriate subjects, would have passed a ministry inspection. Yes, Quirrell was a great teacher, said Harry loudly. There was just that minor drawback of him having Lord Voldemort sticking out the back of his head. This pronouncement was followed by one of the loudest silences Harry had ever heard. Then, I think another week's detention would do you some good, Mr. Potter, said Umbridge sleepily. The cut on the back of Harry's hand had barely healed, and by the following morning it was bleeding again. He did not complain during the evening's detention. He was determined not to give Umbridge the satisfaction. Over and over again he wrote, I must not tell lies, and not a sound escaped his lips though the cut deepened with every letter. The very worst part of the second, the second week's worth of detentions was, just as George had predicted, Angelina's reaction. She cornered him just as he arrived at the Gryffindor table for breakfast on Tuesday and shouted so loudly that Professor McGonagall came sweeping down upon the pair of them from the staff table. Miss Johnson, how dare you teach such a racket in the Great Hall? Five points from Gryffindor. But Professor, he's gone and landed himself in detention again. What's this, Potter? said Professor McGonagall sharply, rounding on Harry. Detention? From whom? From Professor Umbridge, muttered Harry, not meeting Professor McGonagall's beady, square-framed eyes. Are you telling me? she said, lowering her voice, so that the group of curious Ravenclaws behind them could not hear. But after the warning I gave you last Monday, you lost your temper in Professor Umbridge's class again. Yes, Harry muttered, speaking to the floor. Potter, you must get a grip on yourself. You are heading for serious trouble. Another five points from Gryffindor. But... What? Professor, no! Harry said, furious at his injustice. I'm already being punished by her. Why do you have to take points as well? Because detentions do not appear to have any effect on you whatsoever, said Professor McGonagall tartly. Not, no, no, not another word of complaint, Potter. And as for you, Miss Johnson, you will confine your shouting about matters to the Quidditch pitch in future, or risk losing the team captaincy. Professor McGonagall strode back towards the staff table. Angelina gave Harry a look of deepest disgust and stalked away, upon which he flung himself onto the bench before Ron, beside Ron, fuming. He's taken points off Gryffindor because I'm having my hand sliced open every night. How is that fair? How? I know, mate, said Ron sympathetically, tipping bacon onto Harry's plate. He's bang out of order. Hermione, however, merely rustled the pages of her daily prophet and said nothing. You think McGonagall was right, do you? said Harry angrily to the picture of Cornelius Fudge obscuring Hermione's face. I wish she hadn't taken points from you, but... I think she's right to warn you not to lose your temper with Umbridge, said Hermione's voice, while Fudge gesticulated forcefully from the front page, clearly giving some kind of speech. Harry did not speak to Hermione all through charms, but when they entered Transfiguration, he forgot about being cross with her. Professor Umbridge and her clipboard were sitting in a corner, and the sight of her drove the memory of breakfast right out of his head. Excellent, whispered Ron, as they sat down in their usual seat. Let's see Umbridge get what she deserves. Professor McGonagall marched into the room without giving the slightest indication that she knew Professor Umbridge was there. That will do, she said, and silence fell immediately. Mr. Finnegan, kindly come here and hand back your homework. Miss Brown, please take this box of mice. Don't be silly, girl. We won't hurt you. And hand one to each student. Hem, bem, said hem, hem, said Professor Umbridge, employing the silly, same silly little cough she had used to interrupt Dumbledore on the first night of term. Professor McGonagall ignored her. Seamus handed back Harry's essay. Harry took it out looking, look, without looking at him and saw, to his relief, that he had managed an A. Right then, everyone, listen closely. Dean Thomas, if you do that to the mouse again, I shall put you in detention. Most of you have now successfully banished your snails, and even those who were left with a certain amount of shell 
I've got the gist of the spell. Today we shall be uh, ahem, said Professor Umbridge. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, turning around. Her eyebrows so close together, they seem to form one long, severe line. I was just wondering, Professor, whether you received my note telling you of the date and time of your inspection. Obviously I received it, for I would have asked you what you were doing in my classroom, said Professor McGonagall, turning her back firmly on Professor Umbridge. Many of the students... <laughs> She's done. She's done with her. We're seeing today, we shall be practicing the altogether the more difficult vanishment of mice. Now, the vanishing spell. Ahem. I wonder, said Professor McGonagall in cold fury, turning on Professor Umbridge, how you expect to gain an idea of my usual teaching methods if you continue to interrupt me? You see, I do not generally permit people to talk while I am talking. Professor Umbridge looked as though she had just been slapped in the face. She did not speak, but straightened the parchment on her clipboard and began scribbling furiously. Looking supremely unconcerned, Professor McGonagall addressed the class once more. It As I was seeing, does not the care. spell becomes more difficult with the complexity of the animal to be vanished. The snail is an invertebrate, does not present much of a challenge. The mouse, as a mammal, offers a much greater one. This is not, therefore, magic you can accomplish with your mind on your dinner. So, you know the incantation. Let me see what you can do. How can she lecture me about not losing my temper with umbrage? Harry muttered to Ron under his breath. But he was grinning. His anger with Professor McGonagall had quite evaporated. Professor Umbridge did not follow Professor McGonagall around the class as she had followed Professor Trelawney. Perhaps she realized Professor McGonagall would not permit it. She did, however, take many more notes while sitting in her corner. Mm, and when Professor yes. McGonagall finally told her this smug lad, she rose with a grim expression on her face. Well, to start, said Ron, holding up a long, wriggling mouse tail, and uh, holding it back. Uh, the I love the McGonagall as well. She is, she is harsh, but sweet. The teacher's desk. He nudged Ron, who nudged Hermione in turn, and the three of them deliberately fell back to eavesdrop. How long have you been teaching at Hogwarts? Professor Umbridge asked. Thirty-nine years this December, said Professor McGonagall brusquely, snapping her bag shut. Professor Umbridge made a note. Very well, she said. You will receive the results of your inspection in ten days' time. I can hardly wait, said Professor McGonagall in a coldly indifferent voice, and she strode off towards the door. Hurry up, you three, she added, sweeping Harry, Ron, and Hermione before her. Harry could not help giving her a faint smile and could have sworn he received one in return. He had thought that the next time he would see Umbridge would be his detention that evening, but he was wrong. When they walked down the lawns towards the forest to the care of magical creatures, they found her and her clipboard waiting for them beside Professor Grumbly Plank. You do not usually take this class, is that correct? Harry heard her ask as they arrived in the, at the trestle table, where the group of captive bow truckles were scrabbling around for woodlice like so many light living twigs. Quite correct, said Professor Grumbly Plank, hands behind her back and bouncing on the balls of her feet. I am a substitute teacher standing in for Professor Hagrid. Harry exchanged uneasy looks with Ron and Hermione. Malfoy was whispering with Crabbe and Goyle. He would surely love this opportunity to tell tales on Hagrid to a member of the Ministry. Hmm, said Professor Umbridge, dropping her voice, though Harry could still hear her quite clearly. I wonder, the headmaster seems strangely reluctant to give me any information on the matter. Can you tell me what is causing Professor Hagrid's very extended leave of absence? Harry saw Malfoy look up eagerly. Afraid I can't, said Professor Grubbly Plank breezily. Don't know anything more about it than you do. Got an owl from Dumbledore. Would I like a couple of weeks teaching work? I accepted. That's as much as I know. Well, shall I get started then? Yes, please do, said Professor Umbridge, scribbling on her clipboard. Umbridge took a different tack in this class and wandered amongst the students, questioning them on magical creatures. Most people were able to answer well, and Harry's spirits lifted somewhat. At least the class was not letting Hagrid down. Overall, said Professor Umbridge, returning to Professor Grubbly Plank's side, after a lengthy interrogation of Dean Thomas, how do you, as a temporary member of staff, an objective outsider, I suppose you might say, how do you find Hogwarts? Do you feel you receive enough support from the school management? Oh yes, Dumbledore's excellent, said Professor Grubbly Plank heartily. Yes, I'm very happy with the way things are run. Very happy indeed. Looking politely incredulous, Umbridge made a tiny note on her clipboard and went on. And what are you planning to cover with this class this year? Assuming, of course, that Professor Hagrid does not return. Oh, I'll take them through the creatures that most often come up in owls, said Professor Grubbly Plank. Not much left to do. They've studied unicorns and nipplers. I thought we'd cover porlocks and measles. Uh, make sure they can recognize crops and gnarls, you know. Well, you seem to know what you're doing at any rate, said Professor Umbridge, making a very obvious tip on her clipboard. Harry did not like the emphasis she put on you, and liked it even less when she put her next question to Goyle. Now, 
I hear there have been injuries in this car. Goyle gave a stupid grin. Malfoy hastened to answer the question. That was me, he said. I was slashed by a hippogriff. A hippogriff, said Professor Umbridge, now scribbling frantically. Only because he was too stupid to listen to what Hagrid told him to do, said Harry angrily. Both Ron and Hermione groaned. Professor Umbridge turned her head slowly in Harry's direction. Another night's detention, I think, he said softly. Well, thank you very much, Professor Grubby Pank. I think that's all I need here. You will be receiving the results of your inspection within ten days. Jolly good, said Professor Grubby Pank, and Professor Umbridge set off back across the lawn to the castle. It was nearly midnight when Harry left Umbridge's office that night, his hands now bleeding so severely that it was staining the scarf he had wrapped around it. He expected the common room to be empty when he returned, but Ron and Hermione had sat up waiting for him. He was pleased to see them, especially as Hermione was disposed to be sympathetic rather than critical. Here, she said anxiously, pushing a small bowl of yellow liquid towards him. Soak your hand in that. It's a solution of strained and pickled Myrtlap tentacles. It should help. Harry placed his bleeding, aching hand into the bowl and experienced a wonderful feeling of relief. Crookshank curled around his legs, purring loudly, then leapt into his lap and settled down. Thanks, he said gratefully, scratching behind Crookshank's ears with his left hand. Yeah, look at that. Look at that, lad. Ron in a low voice. No, said Harry flatly. McGonagall would go nuts if she knew. Yes, she probably would, said Harry. And how long do you reckon it would take Umbridge to pass another decree saying anyone who complains about the High Inquisitor gets sacked immediately? Ron opened his mouth to retort, but nothing came out. And after a moment, he closed it again, defeated. She's an awful woman, said Hermione in a small voice. Awful. You know, I was just saying to Ron when you came in, we've got to do something about her. I suggested poison, said Ron grimly. No, I mean something about what a dreadful teacher she is and how we're not going to learn any defence from her at all, said Hermione. Well, what can we do about that, said Ron, yawning. Too late, isn't it? She's got the job. She's here to stay. Fudge will make sure of that. Well, said Hermione tentatively, you know, I was thinking today. She shot a tightly, a slightly nervous look at Harry and then plunged on. I was thinking that maybe the time has come when we should just just do it ourselves. Do what ourselves, said Harry suspiciously, still floating his hand in the essence of Myrtlap tentacles. Well, learn defence against the dark arts ourselves, said Hermione. Come off it, groaned Ron. You want us to do extra work? Do you realise Harry and I are behind on homework again and it's only the second week? But this is much more important than homework, said Hermione. Harry and Ron goggled at her. I didn't think there was anything in the universe more important than homework, said Ron. Don't be silly, of course there is, said Hermione. And Harry saw, with an ominous feeling, that her face was suddenly alight, with the kind of fervour that spew usually inspired in her. It's about preparing ourselves, like Harry said in Umbridge's first lesson, for what's waiting for us out there. It's about making sure we really can defend ourselves. If we don't learn anything for a whole year, we can't do much by ourselves, said Ron in, de in a defeated voice. I mean, all right, we can go and look jinxes up in the library and try and practice them, I suppose. No, I agree, we've gone past the stage where we can just learn things out of books, said Hermione. We need a teacher. A proper one, who can show us how to use the spells and correct us if we're going wrong. If you're talking about Lupin, Harry began. No, no, I'm not talking about Lupin, said Hermione. He's too busy with the order. And anyway, the most we could see him was during Hogsmeade weekends, and that's not nearly often enough. Do then, said Harry, frowning at her. Hermione heaved a very deep sigh. Isn't it obvious, she said. I'm talking about you, Harry. There was a moment's silence. A light night breeze rattled Baba. behind Ron, and the fire guttered. About me what, said Harry. I'm talking about you teaching us defence against the dark arts. Harry stared at her. Then he turned to Ron, ready to exchange the exasperated looks they sometimes shared when Hermione elaborated on far-fetched schemes like spew. To Harry's consternation, however, Ron did not look exasperated. He was frowning slightly, apparently thinking, and then he said, That's an idea. What's an idea, said Harry. You, said Ron, teaching us to do it. But Harry was grinning now, sure the pair of them were pulling his leg. But I'm not a teacher. I can't. Harry, you're the best in the year at Defence Against the Dark Arts, said Hermione. Me, said Harry, now grinning more broadly than ever. No, I'm not. You've beaten me in every test. Actually, I haven't, said Hermione coolly. You beat me in our third year, the only year we both sat the test and had a teacher who actually knew the subject. But I'm not talking about test results, Harry. Think what you've done. How do you mean? You know what? I'm not sure I want someone this stupid teaching me, Ron, said Hermione, smirking slightly. He turned to Harry. Let's think, he said, pulling a face like Goyle, concentrating. Uh, first year, you saved the Philosopher's Stone from you-know-who. That was luck, said Harry. It wasn't skill. Second year, Ron interrupted, you killed the Basilisk and destroyed Riddle. Yeah, but if Hawks hadn't turned up, I... 
third year, said Ron louder still, we fought off about 100 Dementals at once. You know that was a fluke. By the time Turner hadn't... Last year, Ron said, almost shouting now, we fought off you-know-who again. Listen to me, said Harry, almost angrily, because Ron and Hermione were both smirking now. Just listen to me, all right? It sounds great when you say it all like that, but all that stuff was luck. I didn't know what I was doing half the time. I didn't plan any of it. I just did whatever I could think of, and I nearly always had help. Ron and Hermione were still smirking, and Harry felt his temper rise. He wasn't even sure why he was feeling so angry. Don't sit there grinning like you know better than I do. I was there, wasn't I? He said heatedly. I know what went on, all right? And I didn't get I just just that because I was had a help, against the dark to help a giant no, horror because with arms and legs right out of, of the ground. Bibbis, see, he had gotten stuck. Doing, not a person. Laughing. Stuck in a giant him. jar. No, no, no. A humanoid jar. Nice. Nice. Sounds like Germanic, uh... Germanic folktale to me. Neither of you. You've never had to face them, have you? You think it's just memorizing a bunch of spells and throwing them at you, like you're in a class or something. The whole time you know there's nothing between you and dying except your own your own brain or guts or whatever. It's like you can think straight when you know you're about a nanosecond from being murdered or tortured or watching your friends die. They've never taught us that in their classes. And it's <laughs> what it's like to deal with things like that. And you two sit there acting like I'm a clever little boy to be standing here alive, like Diggory was stupid, like he messed up. You just don't get it. That could just as easily have been me. It would have been if Voldemort hadn't needed me. We weren't saying anything like that, mate, said Ron, looking aghast. We weren't having a go at Diggory. We didn't. You've got the wrong end of the... He looked helplessly at Hermione, whose, whose face was stricken. Harry, she said timidly, don't you see? This. This is exactly why we need you. We need to know what it's really like. Facing him. Facing the... Voldemort. It was the first time she had ever said Voldemort's name, and it was this more than anything else that calmed Harry. Still breathing hard, he sank back into his chair, becoming aware as he did. Sounds like a fun time. Sounds like a fun time. He wished he had not smashed the bowl of Myrtle Ap essence. Well, think about it, said Hermione quietly. Please? Harry could not think of anything to say. He was feeling ashamed of his outburst already. He nodded, hardly aware of what he was agreeing to. Hermione stood up. Well, I'm off to bed, she said, in a voice that was clearly as, an, as natural as she could make it. Um, night. Ron had to get to his feet, too. Coming, he said awkwardly to Harry. Yeah, said Harry. In a minute. I'll just clear this up. He indicated a smashed bowl on the floor. Ron nodded and left. Reparo, Harry muttered, pointing his wand at the broken pieces of china. They flew back together, good as new. There was no returning the Myrtle essence to the bowl. He was suddenly so tired, he was tempted to sink back into his armchair and sleep there. But instead, he forced himself to his feet and followed Ron upstairs. His restless night was punctuated once more by dreams of long corridors and locked doors, and he awoke next day with his scar prickling again. Chapter 16. In the Hog's Head Hermione made no mention of Harry giving Defence Against the Dark Arts lessons for two whole weeks after her original suggestion. Harry's detentions with Umbridge were finally over. He doubted whether the words now etched into the back of his hand would ever fade entirely. Ron had had four more Quidditch practices and not been shouted at during the last two, and all three of them had managed to vanish their mice in transfiguration. Hermione had actually progressed to vanishing kittens before the subject was broached again on a wild, blustery evening at the end of September, when the three of them were sitting in the library looking at potion ingredients for Snape. I was wondering, Hermione said suddenly, whether you'd thought any more about Defense Against the Dark Arts, Harry. Of course I had, said Harry grumpily. Can't forget it, can we, with the hag teaching us? I meant the idea Ron and I had. Ron cast her an alarmed, threatening kind of look. She frowned at him. Oh, all right, the idea I had then. About you teaching us. Harry did not answer at once. He pretended to be per per perusing a page of Asiatic anti-venoms because he did not want to say what was on his mind. He had given the matter a great deal of thought over the past fortnight, Sometimes it seemed an insane idea, just as it had on the night Hermione had proposed it, but on others he had found himself thinking about the spells that had served him best in his various encounters with dark creatures and death eaters, found himself, in fact, subconsciously planning lessons. Well, he said slowly, when he could no longer pretend to find Asiatic anti-venoms interesting, yeah, I, I thought about it a bit. And, said Hermione eagerly, I don't know, said Harry, playing for time. He looked up at Ron. I thought it was a good idea from the start, said Ron, who seemed keener to join in this conversation now that he was sure Harry was not going to start shouting again. 
Harry shifted uncomfortably in his chair. You did listen to what I said about a load of it being luck, didn't you? Yes, Harry said Hermione gently. But all the same, there's no point. Hey, go question. Good at How long are your uh, comms open? You were the only I guess forever. You could throw off the I've got to make money. I've got to eat. Uh, they're open forever. Uh, for the time being, they're open forever until I get too many commissions. And when I get so many commissions, I literally can't do anything else. That's when I'll that's when I'll close them and then reopen them afterwards. So as far as I know, they're open. Cronus, you can do all sorts of stuff that full-grown wizards can't. Victor always said. Ron looked around at her so fast he appeared to prick his neck. Rubbing it, he said, "Yeah, what did Victor say?" Ho ho," said Hermione in a bored voice. He and Harry knew how to do stuff even he didn't. And he was in the final year at Durmspring. Ron was looking at Hermione suspiciously. You're not still in contact with him, are you? So what if I am, said Hermione coolly, though her face was a little pink. I can have a pen pal if I... He didn't only want to be your pen pal, said Ron accusingly. Hermione shook her head exasperatedly, and ignoring Ron, who was continuing to watch her, said to Harry, Well, what do you think? Will you teach us? Just you and Ron, yeah? Well, said Hermione, looking a mite anxious again. Well... Now, don't fly off the handle again, Harry, please, but I really think you ought to teach anyone who wants to learn. I mean, we're talking about defending ourselves against the... Voldemort. Oh, don't be pathetic, Ron. It doesn't seem fair if we don't offer the chance to other people. Harry considered this for a moment and then said, Yeah, but I doubt anyone except you two would want to be taught by me. I'm a nutter, remember? Well, I think you might be surprised how many people would be interested in hearing what you've got to say, said Hermione seriously. Look, he leaned towards him. Ron, who was still watching her with a frown on his face, leaned forwards to listen too. You know the first weekend in October is a hog Hogsmeade weekend. How would it be if we tell anyone who's interested to meet us in the village and we can talk it over? Why do we have to do it outside school, said Ron? Because, said Hermione, returning to the diagram of the Chinese chomping cabbage she was copying, I don't think Umbridge would be very happy if she found out what we were up to. Harry had been looking forward to the weekend trip, in, trip into Hogsmeade, but there was one thing worrying him. Sirius had maintained a stony silence since he had appeared in the fire at the beginning of September. Harry knew they had made him angry by saying they didn't want him to come. He still worried from time to time that Sirius might throw caution to the wind and turn up anyway. What were they going to do if the great black dog came bounding? Uh, big, baby, big baby, big baby, just uh, Draco he dies at the end of this book. You can't blame him Spoilers. For about, said Ron, when Harry discussed his fears with him and Hermione. I mean, he's been in the on the run for over two years, hasn't he? And I know that can't have been a laugh, but at least he was free, wasn't he? And now he's just shut up all the time with that ghastly elf. Hermione scowled at Ron, but otherwise ignored the slight on, the slight on creature. The trouble is, she said to Harry, until the... Uh, Voldemort, oh, for heaven's sake, Ron, come, Ron, comes out into the open. Sirius is going to have to stay hidden, isn't he? I mean, the stupid ministry isn't going to realize Sirius is innocent until they accept that Dumbledore... I would pet him if he came up to me. Big pop pop. And once the fools start catching real Death Eaters again, it'll be obvious Sirius isn't one. I mean, he hasn't got the mark, for one thing. I don't reckon he'd be stupid enough to turn up, said Ron bracingly. Dumbledore go mad if he did, and Sirius listens to Dumbledore, even if he doesn't like what he hears. When Harry continued to look worried, Hermione said, Listen, Ron, Ron, Ron and I have been sounding out people who, who we thought might want to learn some proper defense against the dark art. And there are a couple who seem interested. We told them to meet us in Hogsmeade. Right, said Harry vaguely, his mind still on Sirius. Don't worry, Harry, Hermione said quietly. You've got enough on your plate without Sirius too. He was quite right, of course. He was barely keeping up with his homework, though he was doing much better now that he was no longer spending every evening in detention with Umbridge. Ron was even further behind with his work than Harry, because... While they both had Quidditch practice twice a week, Ron also had his prefect duties. However, Hermione, who was taking more subjects than either of them, had not only finished all her homework, but was also finding time to knit more elf clothes. Harry had to admit that she was getting better. It was now almost always possible to distinguish between a hat and a sock. The morning of the Hogsmeade visit dawned bright but windy. After breakfast, they queued up in front of Filch, who matched their names to the long list of students who had permission from their parents or guardian to visit the village. With a slight pang, Harry remembered that if he hadn't if it hadn't been for Sirius, he would not have been going at all. When Harry reached Filch, the caretaker gave a great sniff as though trying to detect a whiff of something from Harry. Then he gave a curt nod that set his jowls a quiver again, and Harry walked on, out onto the stone steps on a cold, sunlit day. Uh, 
Why was Filch sniffing you? asked Ron, as he, Harry and Hermione set off at a brisk pace down the wide drive to the gate. I suppose he was checking for the smell of gun bombs, said Harry, with a small laugh. I forgot to tell you. And he recounted the story of sending his letter to Sirius, and Filch bursting in seconds later, demanding to see the letter. To his slight surprise, Hermione found this story highly interesting, much more indeed than he did himself. He said he was tipped off. That you were ticked off, you were ordering gun bombs. But who tipped him off? I don't know, said Harry, shrugging. Maybe Malfoy? He'd think it was a laugh. They walked between the tall stone pillars topped, uh, topped with winged boars and turned left onto the road. And there you go. The wind whipping their hair. Into their is, is that what you were looking Malfoy, for? said Hermione skeptically. Well, yes, maybe. And she remained deep in thought all the way into the outskirts of Hogsmeade. Where are we going anyway? Harry asked. The free broomsticks? Oh, no, said Hermione coming out of her reverie. No, it's always packed and really noisy. I've told the others to meet us in the Hog's Head. That's other pub. You know the one. It's not on the main road. I think it's a bit, you know, dodgy. But students don't normally go in there, so I don't think we'll be overheard. They walked down the main street past Zonko's Wizarding Joke Shop, where they were not surprised to see Fred, George and Lee Jordan past the post office from which owls issued at regular intervals and turned up a side street at the top of which stood a small inn. A battered wooden sign hung from a rusty bracket over the door with a picture on it of a wild boar's severed head leaking blood onto the white cloth around it. The sign creaked in the wind as they approached. All three of them hesitated outside the door. Well, come on, said Hermione. Looking for the command that brings up your commission sign. page. It was oh! It's all like the free broomstick, whose large bar gave an impression of gleaming warmth and cleanliness. The hog's head bar compromised one small, dingy, and very dirty room that smelled strongly of something yeah. that might have been goat. The bay windows were so encrusted with grime that very That's where my commissions are. Which was lit instead with the stubs of candles sitting on rough uh, tables. Uh, the floor uh, seemed at first glance uh, to be compressed earth. So as Harry stepped onto it, he realised that there was stone beneath what seemed to be the accumulated filth of centuries. Harry remembered Hagrid mentioning the pub in his first year. Yeah, got a lot of funny folk in a hog's head, he had said, explaining how he had won a dragon's egg from a hooded stranger there. At the time, Harry had wondered why Hagrid had not found it odd that the stranger kept his face hidden throughout their encounter. Now he saw that keeping your face hidden was something of a fashion in the hog's head. There was a man at the bar whose whole head was wrapped in dirty grey bandages, though he was still managing to gulp endless glasses of some smoking, fiery substance through a slit over his eyes, through his, through his mouth. Two figures, shrouded in hoods, sat at a table in one of the windows. Harry might have thought them dementors if they had not been talking in strong Yorkshire accents. In a shadowy corner beside the fireplace sat a witch with a thick black veil that fell to her toes. They could just see the tip of her nose because it caused the veil to protrude slightly. I don't know about this, Hermione, Harry muttered as they crossed to the bar. He was looking particularly at the heavily veiled witch. As it occurred to it's in my coffee. It's in my coffee. You've commissioned me before, demonic. Umbridge is shorter than so that. So weird. He said quietly. But anyway, even if Umbridge does come in here, there's nothing she can do to stop us, Harry, because I've double and triple checked the school rules. We're not out of bounds. I specifically asked Professor Flitwick whether students were allowed to come into the hog's head, and he said yes, but he advised me strongly to bring our own glasses, and I've looked up everything I can think of about study groups and homework groups, and they're definitely allowed. I just don't think it's a good idea if we parade what we're doing. No, said Harry dryly, especially as it's not exactly a homework group we're planning, is it? The barman sidled towards them out of a back room. He was a grumpy-looking old man with a great deal of long grey hair and beard. He was tall and thin and looked vaguely familiar to Harry. What? he grunted. Three uh, butterbeers, please, said Hermione. The man reached beneath the counter and pulled up three very dusty, very dirty bottles, which he slammed onto the bar. Six sickles, he said. I'll get them, said Harry quickly, passing over the silver. The barman's eyes travelled over Harry, resting for a fraction of a second on his scar. Then he turned away and deposited Harry's money in an ancient wooden till, whose drawer slid open automatically to receive it. Harry, Ron, and Hermione retreated to I the first table from the bar. But I don't have, have your copy page. The dirty or I don't have, I don't, have, I don't on my laptop. Well, now you do. Yeah, you do, my friend. Watch, Ron murmured, looking over at the bar with enthusiasm. We could order anything we like in here. I bet that bloke would sell us anything. He wouldn't care. I'm always wanting to try fire whiskey. You are a prefect, snarled Hermione. Oh, said Ron, the smile fading from his face. Yeah. So, who did you say is supposed to be meeting us? Harry asked, wrenching open the rusty top of his butterbeer and taking a swig. Just a couple of people, Hermione repeated, 
checking her watch and looking anxiously towards the door. I told them to be here about now. I'm sure they all know where it is. Oh, look, this might be them now. The door of the pub had opened. A thick band of dusty sunlight split the room in two for a moment and then vanished, blocked by the incoming rush of a crowd of people. First came Neville, Houdin and Lavender, who were closely followed by Pavati and Padma Patil. With Harry's stomach did a backflip, Cho and one of her usually giggling girlfriends. Then, on her own and looking so dreamy she might have walked in by accident, Luna Lovegood, then Katie Bell, Alicia Spinett and Angelina Johnson. Oh Colin no. And Dennis Freeby, Ernie McMillan, Justin Finch Bexley. Oh Tara no. Hufflepuff Harry. With a long plait down her black, on her, down her back, whose name, Harry, whose name Harry did not know. Three Ravenclaw boys who was pretty sure were called Anthony Goldstein, Michael Corner and Terry Boot. And then Ginny, followed by a tall, skinny, blonde boy with an upturned nose, whom Harry recognised vaguely as being a member of the Hufflepuff Quidditch team. And bringing up the rear, Fred and George Weasley, with their friend Lee Jordan, all three of whom were carrying large paper bags crammed with Zonko's merchandise. A couple of Luda, people, you're Harry, my other favourite character. A couple of people? Yes, well, the idea seemed quite popular, said Hermione happily. <laughs> Come on, do you want to pull up some more chairs? I, I, I think this is party at this point. The barman had frozen in the act of wiping out a glass with a rag, so it was so filthy it looked as though it had never been washed. Possibly he had never seen his pub so full. Hi, said Fred, reaching the bar first and counting his companions quickly. Could we have a 25 butterbeers, please? The barman glared at him for a moment, then throwing down his rag irritably as though he had been interrupted in something very important. He started passing up dusty butterbeers from under the bar. Cheers, said Fred, handing them out. Cough up, everyone. I haven't got enough gold for all of these. Yeah, oh, big grins. Big grins. From Fred and rummaged in their robes to find coins. I want to. I want to make sure that the ear fits. The so I'm going to put it right. But they might be expecting some kind of speech, at which he rounded on Hermione. What have you been telling people? He said in a low voice. What are they expecting? I've told you. They just want to hear what you've got to say. Said Hermione soothingly. But Harry continued to look at her so furiously that she added quickly, You don't have to do anything yet. I'll speak to them first. Hi, Harry, said Neville, beaming and taking a seat opposite him. Harry tried to smile back, but did not speak. His mouth was exceptionally dry. Cho had just smiled at him and sat down on Ron's right. Her friend, who had curly reddish blonde hair, did not smile, but gave Harry a thoroughly mistrustful look, which plainly told him, told him that, given her way, she would not be here at all. In twos and threes, the new arrivals settled around Harry, Ron, and Hermione, some looking rather excited, others curious. Luna Lovegood gazed dreamily into space. When everybody had pulled up a chair, the chatter died out. Every eye was upon Harry. Er, uh, said Hermione, her voice slightly higher than usual out of nerves. Well, er, uh, hi. The group focused its attention on her instead, though eyes continued to dart back regularly to Harry. Well, um, well, you know why you're here? Um, well... Harry here had an idea. I mean, Harry had thrown her a sharp look. I, I had the idea that it might be good if people who wanted to study Defence Against the Dark Art, and I mean really study it, you know, not the rubbish that Umbridge is doing with us. Hermione's voice became suddenly much stronger and more confident, because nobody could call that Defence Against the Dark Art. Here, here, said Anthony Goldstein, and Hermione looked heartened. Well, I thought it would be good if we, well, took matters into our own hands. She paused, looked sideways at Harry and went on. And by that, I mean learning how to defend ourselves properly, not just in theory, but doing the real spells. You want to pass your defense against the dark arts owl too, though, I bet, said Michael Corner. Of course I do, said Hermione at once. But more than that, I, I want to be properly trained in defense because, because, he took a great breath and finished, because Lord Voldemort is back. The reaction was immediate and predictable. Cho's friend shrieked and slopped Butterbeer down herself. Terry Boot gave a kind of involuntary twitch. Padma Patil shuddered, and Neville gave an old yelp that he managed to turn into a cough. All of them, however, looked fixedly, even eagerly, at Harry. Well, that's the plan anyway, said Hermione. If you want to join us, we need to decide how we're going to... Where's the proof you know who is back? said the blonde Hufflepuff player, in a rather aggressive voice. Well, Dumbledore believes it, Hermione began. You mean Dumbledore, Dumbledore believes him, said the blonde boy, nodding at Harry. Who are you? said Ron, rather rudely. Zacharias Smith, said the boy, and I think we've got the right to know exactly what makes him say you know who is back. Look, said Hermione, intervening swiftly, that's really not what this meeting was supposed to be about. It's okay, Hermione, said Harry. 
But it just dawned on him why there were so many people there. He thought Hermione should, should have seen this coming. Some of these people, maybe even most of them, had turned up in the hopes of hearing Harry's story firsthand. What makes you say, do you know who's back? He asked, looking Zacharias straight in the face. I saw him. But Dumbledore told the whole school what happened last year. And if you didn't believe him, you won't believe me. And I'm not wasting an afternoon trying to convince anyone. The whole group seemed to have held its breath while Harry spoke. Harry had had the impression that even the barman was listening. He was wiping the same glass with a filthy rag, making it steadily dirtier. Zacharias said dismissively, All Dumbledore told us last year was that Cedric Diggory was killed by you-know-who, and you brought Diggory's body back to Hogwarts. He didn't give us details. He didn't tell us exactly how Diggory got murdered. I think we'd all like to know. If you come here, come to hear exactly what it looks like when Voldemort murders someone, I can't help you, Harry said. His temper, always so close to the surface this day, these days, was rising again. He did not take his eyes off Zacharias Smith's aggressive face and was determined not to look at Cho. I don't want to talk about Cedric Diggory, all right? So if that's what you're here for, you might as well clear out. He cast an angry look in Hermione's direction. This Do you allow, her, like, her fault. calm things from games in the comms? Some sort of like, and of let's course, say I wanted a Dark Souls up, setting with an armor set wanted, from. But none of them left their yeah, it's fine. I don't care. As long as I have reference, I'm good. I don't care. As long as I have reference, I'm good. Cancel. No, don't get rid of the entire. There we go. There we go. As long as I have reference, I will be 100% a okay. Not even Zachariah Smith, though he continued to gaze intently at Harry. So, said Hermione, her voice very high pitched again. So, uh, like I was saying, if you want to learn some defense, then we need to work out how we're going to do it, how often we're going to meet and and where we're going to... Is it true? Interrupted the girl with a long plait down her back, looking at Harry, that you can produce a Patronus. There was a murmur of interest around the group at this. Yes, said Harry, slightly defensively. A, a corporeal Patronus. The phrase stirred something in Harry's memory. Uh, you don't know Madame Bones, do you, he asked. The girl smiled. She's my auntie, she said. I'm Susan Bones. She told me about your hearing. So, is it really true? You make a stag, Patronus. Yes, said Harry. Blimey, Harry, said Lee, looking deeply impressed. I never knew that. Mum and Ron, uh, Mum told Ron not to spread it around, said Fred, grinning at Harry. She said you got enough attention as it was. She's not wrong, mumbled Harry, and a couple of people laughed. The veiled witch, sitting alone, shifted very slightly in her seat. And did you kill a basilisk with that sword in Dumbledore's office, demanded Terry Boot. That's what one of the portraits on the wall told me when I was in there last year. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, said Harry. Justin Finch Fletchley whistled. The Creevy brothers exchanged awestruck looks, and Lavender Brown said, Wow, softly. Harry was feeling slightly hot around the collar now. He was determinedly looking anywhere but, in, but at Cho. And in our first year, said Neville to the group at large, he saved that philo 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 philological stone. Philosophers, hissed Hermione. Yes, that... That from you know who finished Neville. Hannah Abbott's eyes were as round as galleons. And that's not to mention, said Cho. Harry's eyes snapped across to her. She was looking at him, smiling. His stomach did another somersault. All the tasks he had to get through in the Triwizard Tournament last year, getting past dragons and mer people and acromantula and things. There was a murmur of impressed agreement around the table. Harry's insides were squirming. He was trying to arrange his face so that he did not look too pleased with himself. The fact that Joe had just praised him made it much, much harder for him to say the thing he had sworn to himself he would, t he would tell them. Look, he said, and everyone fell silent at once. I, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be modest or anything, but I had a lot of help with all that stuff. Not with a dragon, you didn't, said Michael Corner at once. That was a seriously cool bit of flying. Yeah, well, said Harry, feeling it would be churlish to disagree. And nobody helped you get rid of those Dementors this summer, said Susan Bones. No, said Harry. No, okay, I know I did bits of it without help, but the point I'm trying to make is, are you trying to weasel out of showing us any of this stuff, said Zachariah Smith. Here's an idea, said Ron loudly, before Harry could speak. Why don't you shut your mouth? Perhaps the word weasel had affected Ron particularly strongly. In any case, he was now looking at Zacharias as though he would like nothing better than to thump him. Zacharias flushed. Well, we've all turned up to learn from him, and now he's telling us he can't really do any of it, he said. That's not what he said, snarled Fred. 
Would you like us to clean out your ears for you, inquired George, pulling a long and lethal-looking metal instrument from inside one of the Zonko's bags. Or any part of your body, really. We're not fussy where we stick this, said Fred. Yes, well, said Hermione hastily. Moving on, the point is, are we agreed we want to take lessons from Harry? There was a murmur of general agreement. Zacharias folded his arms and said nothing, though perhaps this was because he was too busy keeping an eye on the instrument in Fred's hand. Right, said Hermione, looking relieved that something had at last been settled. Well then, the next question is, how often do we do it? I really don't think there's any point in meeting less than once a week. Hang on, said Angelina. We need to make sure this doesn't clash with our Quidditch practice. No, said Cho, nor with ours. Nor ours, added out Zacharias Smith. I'm sure we can find a night that suits everyone, said Hermione, slightly impatiently. But you know, this is rather important. We're talking about learning to defend ourselves against the and Voldemort's Death Eaters. Well said, barked Ernie Macmillan, who Harry had been expecting to speak long before this. Personally, I think this is really important, possibly more important than anything else we'll do this year, even with our owls coming up. He looked around impressively, as though waiting for people to cry, surely not. When nobody spoke, he went on. I personally am at a loss to see why the Ministry has foisted such a useless teacher on us at this critical period. Obviously, they are in denial about the return of you-know-who, but to give us a teacher who is trying to actively prevent us from using defensive spells... We think the reason Umbridge doesn't want us trained in defence against the dark arts, said Hermione, is that she's got some, some mad idea that Dumbledore could use the students in the school as a kind of private army. She thinks he'd mobilise us against the Ministry. Nearly everybody looked stunned at the news. Everybody except Luna Lovegood, who piped up. Well, that makes sense. After all, Cornelius Fudge has got his own private army. What? said Harry, completely thrown by this unexpected piece of information. Yes, he's got an army of heliopaths, said Luna solemnly. No, he hasn't, snapped Hermione. Yes, he has, said Luna. You know poo. Who's heliopaths? asked Neville, looking blank. I know poo. Spirits of fire, said Luna. I After know poo. I know poo. Well, I didn't know I knew poo. Who's poo? Who are we talking about? Who? Who are we talking about? Gotcha. Thank you. I'll start on it. Uh, I will start on it. Today is Friday. I will start on it Monday. Is that okay, uh, Demonic, if I start on it Monday? Voldemort. You know poo. <laughs> okay, now I get it. I was like, is this is this something I don't know? Oh, okay. Eyes widening so that you know, moldy butt. Flaming creatures that gallop across the ground, burning everything in front of. They don't exist, Neville said Hermione tartly. Oh, oh yes, they do said Luna angrily. I'm sure, but but where's? I'm sorry, but where's the proof of that? Snapped Hermione. There are plenty of eyewitness accounts. Just because you're so narrow-minded, you need to have everything shoved under your nose before you... Ahem, said Ginny, in such a good imitation of Professor Umbridge that several people looked around in alarm and then laughed. Weren't we going to decide how often we're going to meet and have defence lessons? Yes, said Hermione at once. Yes, we were. You're right. It is the name of well, one of Fred well, and George's gag. Sadly, George. It's vaguely well, mentioned yes, what I think. Luna. Yes, yes, we know about the Quidditch, said Hermione in a tense voice. Well... The other thing to decide is where we're going to meet. This was rather more difficult. The whole group fell silent. Library? Suggested Katie Bell, after a few moments. I can't see Madame Pinch being too tough with us doing jinxes in the library, said Harry. Maybe an unused classroom, said Dean. You know, yes, poo. McGonagall might let us have hers. I love that. Harry was practicing for the Triwizard. 
but Harry was pretty certain that McGonagall would not be so accommodating this time. For all that Hermione had said about study and homework groups being allowed, he had the distinct feeling that this one might be considered a lot more rebellious. Right, well, we'll try to find somewhere, said Hermione. We'll send a message round to everybody when we've got a time and a place for the first meeting. She rummaged in her bag and produced parchment and quill, then hesitated, rather as though she was steeling herself to say something. I, I think everybody should write their name down, just so we know who was here. But I also think, she took a deep breath, that we all ought to agree not to shout about what we're doing. So if you sign, you're agreeing not to tell Umbridge or anybody else what we're up to. Fred reached out for the parchment and cheerfully wrote his signature, but Harry noticed at once that several people looked less than happy at the prospect of putting their names on the list. Uh, said Zachariah slowly, not taking the parchment that George was trying to pass to him. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure Ernie will tell me when the meeting is, but Ernie was looking rather hesitant about signing too. Hermione raised her eyebrows at him. I, well, we are prefects, Ernie burst out, and if this list was found, well, I mean to say, you said yourself, if Umbridge finds out, you just said this group was the most important thing you'd do this year, Harry reminded him. I, yes, said Ernie, yes, I do believe that. It's just, Ernie, do you really think I'd leave the list lying around, said Hermione testily. No, no, of course not, said Ernie, looking slightly less anxious. I, yes, of course I'll sign. Nobody raised objections after Ernie, though Harry saw Cho's friend give her a rather reproachful look before adding her own name. When the last person, Zacharias, had signed, Hermione took the parchment back and slipped it carefully into her bag. There was an odd feeling in the group now. It was as though they had just signed some kind of contract. Well, time's ticking on, said Fred briskly, getting to his feet. George Lee and I have got items of sensitive na nature to, pur to purchase. We'll be seeing you all later. In twos and threes, the rest of the group took their leave too. Cho made a, a rather a business of fastening the catch on her bag before leaving, her long, dark curtain of hair swinging forward to hide her face. But her friend stood beside her, arms folded, clicking her tongue, so that Cho had little choice but to leave with her. As her friend ushered her through the door, Cho looked back and waved at Harry. Well, well that went quite well, said Hermione happily, as she, Harry and Ron walked out of the hog's head into the bright sunlight a few moments later. Harry and Ron were clutching their bottles of butterbeer. That Zacharias bloke's a wart, said Ron, who was glowering after the figure of Smith just discernible in the distance. Don't like, like him much either, admitted Hermione, but he overheard me talking to Ernie and Hannah at the Hufflepuff table, and he seemed really interested in coming. So what could I say? But the more people, the better, really. I mean, Michael Corner and his friends couldn't have come if he hadn't been going out with Ginny. Ron, who had been draining the last few drops from his butterbeer bottle, gagged and sprayed butterbeer down his front. He's what? fluttered Ron, outraged, his ears now resembling pearls of raw beef. He's going out with my sisters, going, what do you mean, Michael Corner? Well, that's why he and his friends came, I think. Well, they're obviously interested in learning defence, but if Ginny hadn't told Michael what was going on, when did this, or when did she? They met at the Yule Ball and got together at the end of last year, said Hermione composedly. They'd turn into the high street and she paused outside Shriven's, craft, Sh Shriven's Shaft's quill shop, where there was a handsome display of pleasant feather quills in the window. Hmm, if you do have a new quill. She turned into the shop. Harry and Ron followed her. Which one was Michael Corner? Ron demanded furiously. The dark one, said Hermione. I didn't like him, said Ron at once. Big surprise, said Hermione under her breath. But, said Ron, following Hermione along a row of quills and copper pots. I thought Ginny fancied Harry. Hermione looked at him rather pityingly and shook her head. Ginny used to fancy Harry, but she gave up, gave up on him months ago. Not that she doesn't like you, of course, she added kindly to Harry while she examined a long black and gold quill. Harry, whose head was still full of Cho's parting wave, did not find this subject quite as interesting as Ron, who was positively quivering with indignation, but it did bring something home to him that until now he had not really registered. So that's why she talks now. That's why is, uh, he asked Hermione. She never used to talk in front of me. Exactly, said Hermione. Yes, I think I'll have this one. She went up to the counter and handed over 15 sickles and two nuts with Ron still breathing down her neck. Ron, she said severely as she turned and trod on his feet, this is exactly why Ginny hasn't told you. She's seeing Michael. She knew you'd take it badly. So don't harp on about it, for heaven's sake. What do you mean? Who's taking anything badly? I'm not going to harp on about anything. Ron continued to chuntle under his breath, all the way down the street. Hermione rolled her eyes at Harry, 
and then said in an undertone, while Ron was still muttering imprecations about Michael Corner. And talking about Michael and Ginny, what about Cho and you? What do you mean, said Harry quickly. It was as though boiling water was rising rapidly inside him, a burning sensation that was causing his face to smart in a cold. Had he been that obvious? Well, said Hermione, smiling slightly. She just couldn't keep her eyes off you, could she? Harry had never been appreciated, but before appreciated just how beautiful the village of Hogsmeade was. Chapter 17, Educational Decree Number 24 Harry felt happier for the rest of the weekend than he had done in all term. He and Ron spent much of Sunday catching up with all their homework again, and although this could hardly be called fun, the last burst of autumn sunshine persisted. So rather than sitting hunched over tables in the common room, they took their work outside and lounged in the shade of a large beech tree on the edge of the lake. Hermione, who of course was up to date with all her work, brought more wool inside with her and bewitched her knitting needles so that they flashed and clipped in mid-air beside her, producing more hats and scarves. Knowing they were doing something to resist Umbridge and the Ministry, and that he was a key part of the rebellion, gave Harry a feeling of immense satisfaction. He kept re reliving Saturday's meeting in his mind. All those people coming to him to learn defence against the dark arts, and the looks on their faces as they had heard some of the things he had done, and Cho praising his performance in the Triwizard Tournament, knowing all those people did not think him a lying weirdo, but someone to be admired, buoyed him up so much that he was still cheerful on Monday morning, despite the imminent pros prospect of all his least favourite classes. He and Ron headed downstairs from their dormitory, discussing Angelina's idea that they were to work on a new move called the Sloth Grip Roll during the night's Quidditch practice, and not until they were halfway across the sunlit common room did they notice the addition to the room that had already attracted the attention of a small group of people. A large sign had been affixed to the Gryffindor notice board, so large it covered everything else on it. The lists of second-hand spell books for sale, the regular reminders of school rules from Argus Filch, the Quidditch team training timetable, the offers to barter certain chocolate frog cards for others, the Weasley's latest advertisement for testers, the dates of the Hogsmeade weekends, and the lost and found notices. The new sign was printed in large black letters, and there was a highly official-looking seal at the bottom, beside a neat and curly signature. By order of the High Inquisitor of Hogwarts, all student organisations, societies, teams, groups and clubs are henceforth disbanded. An organisation, society, team, group or club is hereby defined as a regular meeting of three or more students. Permission to reform may be sought from the High Inquisitor, Professor Umbridge. No student, organisation, society, team, group or club may exist without the knowledge and approval of the High Inquisitor. Any student found to have formed or to belong to an organisation, society, team, group or club that has not been approved by the High Inquisitor will be expelled. The above is in accordance with Educational Decree number 24, signed Dolores Jane Umbridge. Hi, oh my god, I just found a scary mod for Dark Souls 3. It spawns 99 of each boss in the each, in each area. They're going to shut down the gobstones. Damn. One of them asked his friend. I reckon you'll be okay with gobstones, Ron said darkly, making the second year jump. I don't think we're going to be as lucky, though. Are you? He asked Harry as the second years hurried away. Harry was reading the notice through again. The happiness that had filled him since Saturday was gone. His insides were pulsing with rage. This isn't a coincidence, he said, his hands forming fists. She knows. She can't, said Ron at once. There were people listening in at the pub. Let's face it, we don't know how many of the people who turned up we can trust. Any of them could have run off and told Umbridge. And he had thought they believed him, thought they even admired him. Zachariah Smith, said Ron at once, punching a fist into his hand. Or, I thought that Michael Corner had a really shifty look, too. I wonder if Hermione's seen this yet, Harry said, looking around at the door to the girls' dormitories. Let's go and tell her, said Ron. He bounded forwards, pulled open the door, and set off up the spiral staircase. He was on the sixth stair when there was a loud, wailing, klaxon-like sound, and the steps melted together to make a long, smooth stone slide like a helter-skelter. There was a brief moment when Ron tried to keep running, arms working madly like windmills. Then he toppled over backwards and shot down the newly created slide, coming to rest on his back at Harry's feet. Uh, I don't think we're allowed to uh, go to the dirt girls' dormitory, said Harry, pulling Ron to his feet and trying not to laugh. Two fourth-year girls came zooming gleefully down the stone slide. Ooh, we tried to get upstairs, they giggled happily, leaping to their feet and ogling Harry and Ron. Me, said Ron. It was still rather dishevelled. I didn't realise that would happen. It's not fair, he added to Harry as the girls headed off to the portrait hole, still giggling madly. Hermione's allowed in our dormitory. How come we're not allowed? 
Well, an old-fashioned rule, said Hermione, who had just slid neatly onto a rug in front of them and was now getting to her feet. But it says in Hogwarts the history that the founders thought boys were less trustworthy than girls. Anyway, why were you trying to get in there? To see you. Look at this, said Ron, dragging her over to the notice board. Hermione's eyes slid rapidly apart down on the notice. Her expression became stony. Someone must have blabbed to her, Ron said angrily. They can't have done, said Hermione in a low voice. You're so naive, said Ron. You think just because you're all honourable and trustworthy? No, they can't have done because I put a jinx on that piece of parchment we all signed, said Hermione grimly. Believe me, if anyone's run off and told Umbridge, we'll know exactly who they are and they will really regret it. What will happen to them, said Ron eagerly. Well, put it this way, said Hermione. It'll make Eloise Midgen's acne look like a couple of scooped freckles. Come on, let's get down to breakfast and see what the others think. I wonder whether this has been put up in all the houses. It was immediately apparent yeah. on entering the Great Hall that Umbridge Yeah, Hermione is, is uh, uh, it, it might be a bit sadistic. Intensity about the chatter and an extra measure of movement in the hall as people scurried up and down their tables, conferring on what they had read. Harry, Ron, and Hermione had barely taken their seats when Neville, Dean, Fred, George, and Ginny descended upon them. Did you see it? Do you reckon she knows? What are we going to do? They were all looking at Harry. He glanced around to make sure there were no teachers near them. We're going to do it anyway, of course, he said quietly. Knew you'd say that, said George. He is sneaky girl. Harry on the arm. Hermione insane. Well, said Hermione Fred. is he best character. Of course, said Hermione coolly. Here come Ernie and Hannah Abbott, said Ron, looking over his shoulder. I sent the uh, I sent the first emote to uh, Lava Gale. They like it. Really suspicious. I don't know if Lava Lava Gale is a is a girl or a boy. I don't know. We'll talk. It's been a. I'm real bad at this. Swinging herself off her bench, the fool. Honestly, she hurried off towards the Ravenclaw table. Harry watched her go. Cho was sitting not far away, talking to the curly-haired friend she had brought along to the hog's head. Would Umbridge's notice scare her off meeting them again? But the full repercussions of the sign were not felt until they were leaving the Great Hall, the history of magic. Harry, Ron, it was Angelina, and she was hurrying towards them, looking perfect, perfectly desperate. It's okay, said Harry quietly, when she was near enough to hear them. We're still going to... You realise she's including Quidditch in this, Angelina said over him. We have to go and ask permission to reform the Gryffindor team. What? said Harry. No way, said Ron, appalled. You read the sign. It mentions teams, too. So listen, Harry, I'm saying this for the last time. Please, please don't lose your temper with Umbridge again. Or she might not let us play anymore. Okay, 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 said Harry. For Angelina looked as though she was on the verge of tears. Don't worry, I'll behave myself. Bet Umbridge is in History of Magic, said Ron grimly, as they set off for Bin's lesson. She hasn't inspected Bin's yet. Bet you anything she's there. But he was wrong. The only teacher present when they entered was Professor Binns, floating an inch or so above the chair as usual, and preparing to continue the monotonous groan on giant wars. Harry did not even attempt to follow what he was saying today. He doodled idly on his parchment, ignoring Hermione's frequent glares and nudges, until a particularly painful poke in the ribs made him look up angrily. What? He pointed at the window. Harry looked around. Hedwig was perched on the narrow window ledge, gazing through the thick glass at him, a letter tied to her leg. Harry could not understand it. They had just had breakfast. Why on earth hadn't she delivered the letter then? As usual, many of his classmates were pointing out Hedwig to each other, too. Oh, I've always loved that owl. She's so beautiful, Harry heard Lavender sigh to Pavati. He glanced around at Professor Binns, who continued to read his notes, serenely unaware that the class's attention was even less focused upon him than usual. Harry slipped quietly off his chair, crouched down and hurried along the road to the window, where he slid the catch and opened it very slowly. He had expected Hedwig to hold out her legs so that he could remove the letter and then fly off to the owlery, but the moment the window was open wide enough, he hopped inside, hooting dolefully. He closed the window with an anxious glance at Professor Binns, crouched low again, and sped back to his seat with Hedwig on his shoulder. He regained his seat, transferred Hedwig to his lap, and made to remove the letter tied to her leg. Only then did he realise that Hedwig's feathers were oddly ruffled. Some were bent the wrong way, and she was holding one of her wings at an odd angle. She's hurt. Harry whispered, bending his head low over her. Hermione and Ron leaned in closer. Hermione even put down her quill. Look, there's something wrong with her wing. Hedwig was quivering. When Harry made to touch the wing, she gave a little jump, all her feathers on end, as though she was inflating herself, and oh. gazed at him reproachfully. Professor Binns, said Harry loudly, and everyone in the class turned to look at him. 
I I'm not feeling well. Professor Binns raised his eyes from his notes, look, am looking amazed, as always, to find the room in front of him full of people. Not feeling well, he repeated, repeated hazily. Not at all well, said Harry firmly, getting to his feet with Hedwig concealed behind his back. I think I need to go to the hospital wing. <laughs> Not yes, Hedwig! Professor clearly very much wrong-footed. Yes, yes, hospital wing. Well, off you go then, Perkins. Once outside the room, Harry returned Hedwig to his shoulder. <laughs> if I was Perkins, I would immediately leave. I'd be like, well, he said so. All right, see you his later. The choice of somebody to cure Hedwig would have been Hagrid, of course. But as he had no idea where Hagrid was, his only remaining option was to find Professor Grubbly Plank and hope she could help. He peered out of a window at the blustery, overcast grounds. There was no sign of her anywhere near Hagrid's cabin. If she was not teaching, she was probably in the staff room. He set off downstairs. I'm going to go to bed, Mr. Goat. I hope you have a good rest of your night, as well as you, Heaven. You have an amazing one, Demonic. Stay beautiful. Stay, uh, stay sweet. Stay cover, girl. Easy, breezy cover, girl. Damn it. There's no immediate easy breezy cover girl. Because it, it it's on my brain. In a high pitched voice. Well, that puts us in our place, hasn't it? Harry knocked. He heard footsteps. Then the door opened and he found himself face to face with Professor McGonagall. You haven't been given another detention, she said at once, her square spectacles flashing alarmingly. No, Professor, said Harry hastily. Well then, why are you out of class? It's urgent, apparently, said the second gargoyle snidely. I'm looking for Professor Grubbly Plank, Harry explained. It's my owl. She's injured. Injured owl, did you say? Professor Grubbly Plank appeared at Professor McGonagall's shoulder, smoking a pipe and holding a copy of the Daily Prophet. Yes, said Harry, lifting Hedwig carefully off his shoulder. She turned up after the other post owls, and her wings all funny. Look. Professor Grubbly Plank stuck her pipe firmly between her teeth and took Hedwig from Harry, while Professor McGonagall watched. Hmm, said Professor Grubbly Plank her pipe waggling slightly as she talked. Looks like somebody's attacked her. Can't think what would have done it, though. Press rules are, will sometimes go for birds, of course, but Hagrid's got the Hogwarts press rules well trained not to touch owls. Harry neither knew nor cared what press rules were. He just wanted to know if Hedwig was going to be all right. Professor McGonagall, however, looked sharply at Harry and said, Do you know how far this owl's travelled, Potter? Uh, said Harry, from London, I think? He met her eyes briefly and knew, by the way her eyebrows had joined in the middle, that she understood London to mean number 12 Grimald Place. Professor Grubbly Plank pulled a monocle out of the inside of her robe and screwed it into her eye to examine Hedwig's wing closely. I should be able to sort this out if you leave her with me, Potter, she said. She shouldn't be flying long distances for a few days in any case. Uh, right, thanks, said Harry, just as the bell rang for break. No problem, said Professor Grubbly Plank roughly, turning back into the staff room. Just a moment, Wilhelmina, said Professor McGonagall. Potter's letter. Oh, yeah, said Harry, who had momentarily forgotten the scroll tied to Hedwig's leg. Professor Grubbly Plank handed it over and then disappeared into the staff room carrying Hedwig. He was staring at Harry as though unable to believe he would give her away like this. Feeling slightly guilty, he turned to go, but Professor McGonagall called him back. Potter? Uh, yes, Professor? She glanced up and down the corridor. There were students coming from both directions. Bear in mind, she said quickly and quietly, her eyes on the scroll in his hand, that channels of communication in and out of Hogwarts may be being watched, won't you? I, uh, said Harry, but the flood of students rolling along the corridor was almost upon him. Professor McGonagall gave him a curt nod and retreated into the staff room, leaving Harry to be swept out into the courtyard with a crowd. He spotted Ron and Hermione already standing in a sheltered corner, their cloaked collars turned up against the wind. Harry slit open the scroll as he hurried towards them and found five words in Sirius, his handwriting. Today, same time, same place. Is Hedwig okay? asked Hermione anxiously, the moment he was within earshot. Where did you take her? asked Ron. To Grubbly Plank, said Harry, and I met McGonagall. Listen. And he told them what Professor McGonagall had said. To his surprise, neither of the others looked shocked. On the contrary, they exchanged significant looks. What, said Harry, looking from Ron to Hermione and back again. Well, 
I was just saying to Ron, what if someone had tried to intercept Hedwig? I mean, she's never been hurt on a fight before, has she? Who's the letter from, anyway? Asked Ron, taking the note from Harry. Snuffles, said Harry quietly. Same time, same place. Does he mean the fire in the common room? Obviously, said Hermione, also reading the note. She looked uneasy. Just hope nobody else has read this. But it was still sealed in everything, said Harry, trying to convince himself as much as her. Nobody would understand what it meant if they didn't know where we'd been spoken to, to him before, would they? I don't know, said Hermione anxiously, hitching her bag back over her shoulder as the bell rang again. It wouldn't be exactly difficult to reseal the scroll by magic. And if anyone's watching the flu network, but, but I, I don't really see how we can warn him not to come without that being intercepted too. They trudged down the stone steps of the dungeons for potions, all three of them lost in thought, but as they reached the bottom of the steps, they were recalled to themselves by the voice of Draco Malfoy, who was standing just outside Snape's classroom door, waving around an official-looking piece of parchment, and talking much louder than was necessary, so that they could hear every word. Yeah, Umbridge gave the slivering Quidditch team permission to continue playing straight away. I went to ask her first thing this morning. Well, it was pretty much automatic. I mean, she knows my father really well. He's always popping in and out of the ministry. It'll be interesting to see whether Gryffindor are allowed to keep playing, won't it? Don't rise. Hermione whispered imploringly to Harry and Ron, who were both watching Malfoy, faces set and fists clenched. It's what he wants. I mean, said Malfoy, raising his voice a little more, his grey eyes glittering malevolently in Harry and Ron's direction. If it's a question of influence with the Ministry, I don't think they've got much chance. From what my father says, they've been looking for an excuse to sack Arthur Weasley for years. As for Potter, my father says it's a matter of time before the Ministry has him carted off to St Mungo's. Apparently they've got a special ward for people whose brains have been addled by magic. Malfoy made a grotesque face. Really his funny. Mouth sagging open and his eyes rolling. Crab and Goyle gave their usual grunts of laughter. Which is so funny. And shrieked with glee. For what's going to happen. Something collided hard with Harry's shoulder, knocking him sideways. A split second later, he realized that Neville had just charged past him, heading straight for Malfoy. Neville, no! Harry leapt forward and seized the back of Neville's robe. Neville struggled frantically, his fists flailing, trying desperately to get at Malfoy, who looked for a moment extremely shocked. Help me! Harry flung at Ron, managing to get an arm around Neville's neck and dragging him backwards, away from the Slytherins. Crabbe and Goyle were flexing their arms as they stepped in front of Malfoy, ready for the fight. Ron seized Neville's arms, and together he and Harry succeeded in dragging Neville back into the Gryffindor line. Neville's face was scarlet. The pressure Harry was exerting on his throat rendered him quite incomprehensible. But odd words spluttered from his mouth. Not funny. Don't Mungo's show him. The dungeon door opened. A snake appeared there. His black eyes swept up the Gryffindor line to the point where Harry and Ron were wrestling with Neville. Fighting Potter, Weasley, Longbottom, Snape said in his cold, sneering voice. Ten points from Gryffindor. Release Longbottom Potter or it will be detention. Inside, all of you. Harry let go of Neville, who stood panting and glaring at him. I have to stop you, Harry gasped, picking up his bag. Crab and Goyle would have torn you apart. Neville said nothing. He merely snatched up his own bag and stalked off into the dungeon. What in the name of Merlin, said Ron slowly, as they followed Neville, was that about? Harry did not answer. He knew exactly why the subject of people who were in St Mungo's because of magical damage to their brains was highly distressing to Neville. But he had sworn to Dumbledore that he would not tell anyone Neville's secret. Even Neville did not know Harry knew. Harry, Ron and Hermione took their usual seats at the back of the class, pulled out parchment, quills and their copies of 1,000 magical herbs and fungi. The class around them was whispering about what Neville had just done. But when Snape closed the dungeon door for an, with an echoing bang, everybody immediately fell silent. You will notice, said Snape in his low, sneering voice, that we have a guest with us today. He gestured towards the dim corner of the dungeon, and Harry saw Professor Umbridge sitting there, clipboard on her knee. He glanced sideways at Ron and Hermione, his eyebrows raised. Snape and Umbridge, the two teachers he hated most. It was hard to decide which one he wanted to triumph over the other. We are continuing with our strengthening solution today. You will find your mixtures as you left them last lesson. If correctly made, they should have matured well over the weekend. Instructions. He waved his wand again. On the board. Carry on. Professor Umbridge spent the first half hour of the lesson making notes in her corner. Harry was very interested in hearing her question, Sna her question, Snape. So interested that he was becoming careless with his potion again. Salamander blood, Harry, Hermione moaned, grabbing his wrist to prevent him adding the wrong ingredient for the third time. Not pomegranate juice. 
right, said Harry vaguely, putting down the bottle and continuing to watch the corner. Umbridge had just got to her feet. Ha, she said softly, as she strode between two lines of desk towards Snape, who was bending over Dean Thomas's cauldron. Well, the class seemed fairly advanced for their level, she said briskly to Snape's back, so I would question whether it's advisable to teach them a potion like the strengthening solution. I think the Ministry would prefer it if that was removed from the syllabus. Snape straightened up slowly and turned to look at her. Now, how long have you been teaching at Hogwarts? she asked, her quill poised over her clipboard. Fourteen years, Snape replied. His expression was unfathomable. His eyes on Snape. Harry added a few drops to his potion. It hissed menacingly and turned from tur turquoise to orange. You applied first for the Defence Against the Dark Arts post, I believe, Professor Umbridge asked Snape. Yes, said Snape quietly, but you were unsuccessful. Snape's lip curled. Obviously. Professor Umbridge scribbled on her clipboard. And you have applied regularly for the Defence Against the Dark Arts post since you first joined the school, I believe. Yes, said Snape quietly, barely moving his lips. He looked very angry. Do you have any idea why Dumbledore has consistently refused to appoint you? asked Umbridge. I suggest you ask him, said Snape jerkily. Oh, I shall, said Professor Umbridge with a sweet smile. I suppose this is relevant, Snape asked. His black eyes narrowed. Oh, yes, said Professor Umbridge. Yes, the Ministry wants a thorough understanding of teachers. Uh, background. She turned away, walked over to Pansy Parkinson, and began questioning her about the lessons. Snape looked around at Harry, and their eyes met for a second. Harry hastily dropped his gaze to his potion, which was now con congealing foully and giving off a strong smell of burned rubber. No marks again, then, Potter, said Snape maliciously, emptying Harry's cauldron of a wave of his wand. You will write me an essay on the correct composition of this potion, indicating how and why you went wrong. To be handed in next lesson, do you understand? Yes, said Harry furiously. Snape had already given him homework, and he had Quidditch practice this evening. This would mean another couple of sleepless nights. It did not seem possible that he had awoken that morning feeling very happy. All he felt now was a fervent desire for this day to end. Maybe I'll skive off divination, he said glumly, as they stood in the courtyard after lunch, the wind whipping at the hems of robes and brims of hats. I'll pretend to be ill and do Snape's essay instead. Then I won't have to stay up half the night. You can't skive off divination, said Hermione severely. Ask who's talking. You walked out of divination. You hate Trelawney, said Ron indignantly. I don't hate her, said Hermione loftily. I just think she's an absolutely appalling teacher and a real old fraud. But Harry's already missed history of magic, and I don't think he ought to miss anything else today. There was too much truth in this to ignore. So half an hour later, Harry took his seat in the hot, <sighs> perfumed atmosphere there we in go. the divination classroom, feeling angry at everybody. Professor Trelawney was yet again handing out copies of the Dream Oracle, Harry thought he'd surely be much better employed doing Snape's punishment essay than sitting here trying to find meaning in a lot of made-up dreams. It seemed, however, that he was not the only person in divination who was in a temper. Professor Trelawney slammed a copy of the Oracle down on the table between Harry and Ron and swept away, her lips pursed. She threw the next copy of the Oracle at Seamus and Dean, narrowly avoiding Seamus's head, and thrust the final one into Neville's chest with such force that he slipped off his boot. Well... Carry on, said Professor Trelawney loudly, her voice high-pitched and somewhat hysterical. Do you know what to do? Or am I such a substandard teacher that you have never learned how to open a book? The class stared perplexed at her, then at each other. Harry, however, thought he knew what was the matter. As Professor Trelawney flanked back to the high-backed teacher's chair, her magnified eyes full of angry tears, he leaned his head closer to Ron's and muttered, I think she's got the results of her inspection back. Professor, said Pavati Patil in a hushed voice, she and Lavender had always rather admired Professor Trelawney. Professor, is there anything a, a wrong? Wrong, cried Professor Trelawney, in a voice throbbing with emotion. Certainly not. I have been insulted. Certainly. Insinuations have been made against me. Unfounded accusations leveled. But no, no, there's nothing wrong. Certainly not. He took a great shuddering breath and looked away from Pavati, angry tears spilling from under her glasses. I say nothing, she choked, of sixteen years of devoted service. It has passed apparently unnoticed, but I shall not be insulted. No, I shall not. But, Professor, who's insulting you? asked Pavati timidly. The establishment, said Professor Trelawney, in a deep, dramatic, wavering voice. Yes, those with eyes too clouded by the mundane to see as I see, as to know as I know. Of course, we seers have always been feared, always persecuted. Mm. It is, alas, 
our fate. She gulped, dabbed at her wet cheek with the end of her shawl, Save. She pulled a small embroidered handkerchief from her sleeve and blew her nose to the heart, sound like Eve's blowing a raspberry. Ron sniggered. Lavender shot him a disgusted look. Professor, said Pavati, do you mean, is it something Professor Umbridge? Do not speak to me about that woman, cried Professor Tarani, leaping to her feet, her beads rattling and her spectacles flashing. Kindly continue with your work. And she spent the rest of the lesson striding among them, tears still leaping from behind her glasses, muttering what sounded like threats under her breath. May hell choose to leave. The indignity of it. On probation, we shall see how she dares. You and Umbridge have got something in common, Harry told Hermione quietly when they met again in defence against the dark art. She obviously reckons Trelawney's an old fraud too. Looks like she put her on probation. Umbridge entered the room as he spoke, wearing her black velvet bow and an expression of great smugness. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, Professor Umbridge, they chanted drearily. Wands away, please. But there was no answering flurry of movement this time. Nobody had bothered to take out their wands. Please turn to page 34 of Defense Magical Theory and read the third chapter entitled The Case for Non-Offensive Responses to Magical Attack. There will be no need to talk, Harry, Ron and Hermione said together under their breath. No Quidditch practice, said Angelina in hollow tones when Harry, Ron and Hermione entered the common room after dinner that night. But I kept my temper, said Harry, horrified. I didn't say anything to her. Angelina, I swear, I, I know. I know, said Angelina miserably. She just said she needed a bit of time to consider. Consider what, said Ron angrily. She's given the Slytherins permission. Why not us? But Harry could imagine how much Umbridge was enjoying holding the threat of no Gryffindor Quidditch team over their heads and could easily understand why she would not want to relinquish that weapon over them too soon. Well, said Hermione, look on the bright side. At least now you'll have time to do Snape's essay. That's a bright side, is it? snapped Harry, while Ron stared incredulously at Hermione. No Quidditch practice and extra potions. Harry slumped down into a chair, dragged his potions essay reluctantly from his bag and set to work. It was very hard to concentrate even though he knew Sirius was not due in the fire until much later. He could not help glancing into the flames every few minutes just in case. There was also an incredible amount of noise in the room. Fred and George appeared finally to have perfected one type of skiving snack box, which they were taking turns to demonstrate to a cheering and whooping crowd. First Fred would take a bite out of the orange end of a chew, at which he would vomit spectacularly into a bucket they had placed in front of them. Then he would force down the purple end of the chew, at which the vomiting would immediately cease. Lee Jordan, who was assisting the demonstration, was lazily banishing the vomit at regular intervals with the same banishing spell Snape kept using on Harry's potions. What were the regular sounds of retching, cheering, and the sound of Fred and George taking advance orders from the crowd, Harry was finding it exceptionally difficult to focus on the correct method for strengthening solution. Hermione was not helping matters. The cheers and the sound of vomit hitting the bottom of Fred and George's bucket were punctuated by her loud and disapproving sniff which Harry found, if anything, more distracting. Just go and stop them then, he said irritably, after crossing out the wrong weight of powdered griffin claw for the fourth time. I can't. They're not technically doing anything wrong, said Hermione through gritted teeth. They're quite within their rights to eat the foul things themselves. And I can't find a rule that says the other idiots aren't entitled to buy them, not unless they're proven to be dangerous in some way. And it doesn't look as though they are. She, Harry and Ron watched George projectile vomit into the bucket, gulp down the rest of the chew and straighten up, beaming with his arms wide to a protracted applause. You know, I, I don't get why Fred and George only got three owls each, said Harry, watching as Fred, George and Lee collected gold from the eager crowd. They really know their stuff. Oh, they only know flashy stuff that's no real use to anyone, said Hermione disparagingly. No real use, said Ron in a strained voice. Mine, they've made about 26 galleons already. It was a long while before the crowd around the Weasley twins dispersed. And then Fred, Lee and George sat up counting their takings even longer. So it was well past midnight when Harry, Ron and Hermione finally had the common room to themselves. At long last, Fred had closed the doorway to the boys' dormitories behind him, rattling his box of galleons ostentatiously so that Hermione scowled. Harry, who was making very little right. progress with his potions essay, decided to give it up there for the go. night. As he put his books away, Ron, who was dozing lightly in an armchair, gave a muffled grunt awoke and looked blearily into the fire. Sirius, he said. Harry whipped around. Sirius's untidy dark beard was sitting in the fire again. Hi, he said, grinning. Hi, chorused Harry, Ron, and Hermione, all three kneeling down on the hearth rug. Crookshanks purred loudly and approached the fire, trying, despite the heat, to put his face close to Sirius's. How are things, said Sirius. 
Not that good, said Harry, as Hermione pulled Crookshanks back to stop him, singeing his whiskers. The Ministry is forced through another decree, which means we're not allowed to have Quidditch teams. Or secret defence against the Dark Arts group, said Sirius. There was a short pause. How did you know about that? Harry demanded. You want to choose your meeting places more carefully, said Sirius, grinning still more broadly. The hog's head, I ask you. Well, we're better than the free broomsticks, said Hermione defensively. That's always tackled people, which means you've been harder to overhear, said Sirius. You've got, you've got a lot to learn, Hermione. Who overheard us, Harry demanded. Mum Dungus, of course, said Sirius. And when they all looked puzzled, he laughed. He was the witch under the veil. That was Mum Dungus, Harry said, stunned. What was he doing in the hog's head? What do you think he was doing, said Sirius impatiently. Keeping an eye on you, of course. I'm still being followed, asked Harry angrily. Yeah, you are, said Sirius. And just as well, isn't it? But the first thing you're going to do on your weekend off is to organise an illegal defence group. But he looked neither angry nor worried. On the contrary, he was looking at Harry with distinct pride. Why was Dung hiding from us? asked Ron, sounding disappointed. We'd have liked to have seen him. He was banned from the Hogshead 20 years ago, said Sirius. And that barman's got a long memory. He lost Moody's spare invisibility cloak when Sturgis was arrested. So Dung's been dressing as a witch a lot lately. Anyway, first of all, Ron, I've sworn to pass on a message from your mother. Oh, yes, said Ron, sounding apprehensive. She says on no account whatsoever are you to take part in an illegal secret defence against the dark arts group. She says you'll be expelled for sure and your future will be ruined. She says there will be plenty of time to learn how to defend yourself later and that you are too young to be worrying about that right now. She also, Sirius's eyes turned to the other two, advises Harry and Hermione not to proceed with the group, which she accepts that she had no authority over either of them and simply begs them to remember that she has their best interests at heart. She would have written all this to you, but... If the owl had been intercepted, you'd have all been in real trouble, and she can't say it for herself because she's on duty tonight. On duty doing what, said Ron quickly. Never you mind, just stuff for the order, said Sirius. So it's fallen to me to be the messenger. Make sure you tell her I passed it all on, because I don't think she trusts me too. There was another pause in which Crookshanks, mewing, attempted to paw Sirius's head, and Ron fiddled with a hole in the half rug. So you want me to say I'm going to take part in the defence group? or not going to take part in the defence group, he muttered finally. Me? Certainly not, said Sirius, looking surprised. I think it's an excellent idea. You do, said Harry, his heart lifting. Of course I do, said Sirius. Do you think your father and I would have lain down and taken orders from an old hag like Umbridge? But last time, last term, all you did was tell me to be careful and not take risks. Last year, all the evidence was that someone inside Hogwarts was trying to kill you, Harry, said Sirius impatiently. This year, we know there's someone outside Hogwarts you would like to kill us all, so I think learning to defend yourselves properly is a very good idea. And if we do get expelled, Hermione asked, a quizzical, quizzical look on her face. Hermione, this whole thing was your idea, said Harry, staring at her. I know it was. I just wonder what Sirius thought, she said, shrugging. Well, better expel and able to defend yourselves than sitting safely in school without a clue, said Sirius. Hear, hear, said Harry and Ron enthusiastically. So, said Sirius, how are you organising this group? Where are you meeting? Well, that's a bit of a problem now, said Harry. Don't know where we're going to be able to go. How about the Shrieking Shrack? Shack, suggested Sirius. Hey, that's an idea, said Ron excitedly. But Hermione made a sceptical noise, and all three of them looked at her. Sirius's head turned in the flames. Well, Sirius, it's just that there were only four of you meeting in the Shrieking Shack when you were at school, said Hermione, and all of you could transform into animals. And I suppose you could all have squeezed under a single invisibility cloak if you wanted to. But there are 28 of us, and none of us is an animagus. So we wouldn't need so much as an invisibility, invisibility cloak as an invisibility marquee. Fair point, said Sirius, looking slightly crestfallen. Well, I'm sure you'll come up with some way. There used to be a pretty roomy secret passageway behind that big mirror on the fourth floor. You might have enough space to practice jinxes in there. Fred and George told me it's blocked, said Harry, shaking his head. Caved in or something. Oh, said Sirius, frowning. Well, I'll have to think and get back to you. He broke off. His face was suddenly tense, alarmed. He turned sideways, apparently looking into the solid brick wall of the fireplace. Sirius, said Harry anxiously, but he had vanished. Harry gaped at the flames for a moment, then turned to look at Ron and Hermione. Why did he? Hermione gave a horrified gasp and leapt to her feet, still staring at the fire. A hand had appeared amongst the flames, groping as though to catch hold of something. A stubby, short-fingered hand covered in ugly old-fashioned rings. The three of them ran for it. At the door of the boys' dormitory, Harry looked back. 
Umbridge's hand was still making snapping movements amongst the flames, as though she knew exactly where Sirius's hair had been moments before and was determined to seize it. Chapter 18 Dumbledore's Army Umbridge has been reading your mail, Harry. There's no other explanation. You think Umbridge attacked Hedwig, he said outright. You want certain of it, said Hermione grimly. Watch your frog. It's escaping. Harry pointed his wand at the bullfrog that had been hopping hopefully towards the other side of the table. Cassio, and it zoomed gloomily back into his hand. Charms was always one of the best lessons in which to enjoy a private chat. There was generally so much movement and activity that the danger of being overheard was very slight. Today, with the room full of croaking bullfrogs and cawing ravens, and with a heavy downpour of rain clattering and pounding against the classroom windows, Harry, Ron and Hermione's whispered discussion about how Umbridge had nearly caught Sirius went quite unnoticed. I've been suspecting You've been all right. You're, I'm jamming right now. What you jamming about? You want to jam? Hermione we can jam. I mean, once your letter had been read, it, it, it would have been quite clear you weren't ordering them. So you wouldn't have been in trouble at all. It's a bit of a feeble joke, isn't it? But then I thought, what if somebody just wanted an excuse to read your mail? Well, then, it would be a perfect way for Umbridge to manage it. Pop, tip off Filch, let him do the dirty work and confiscate the letter. Then, either find a way of stealing it from him or else demand to see it. I don't think Filch would object. When he's ever stuck up, the, when has he ever stuck up for the student's right? Harry, you're squashing your frog. Harry looked down. He was indeed squeezing his bullfrog so tightly its eyes were popping. He replaced it hastily upon the desk. It was a very, very close call last night, said Hermione. I just wonder if Umbridge knows how close it was. Listening to deadlift Lolita. Uh. The bullfrog in which she was practicing her silencing charm was struck dumb mid-croak and glared at her reproachfully. If she'd caught Snuffles, Harry finished the sentence for her. He'd probably be back in Azkaban this morning. He waved his wand without really concentrating. His bullfrog swelled like a green balloon and emitted a high-pitched whistle. Silencio, said Hermione hastily, pointing her wand at, Harry, wand at Harry's frog, which deflated silently before them. Well, he mustn't do it again, that's all. I just don't know how we're going to let him know. We can't send him an owl. I don't reckon he'll risk it again, said Ron. He's not stupid. He knows she nearly got him. Silencio, the large and ugly raven in front of him, let out a derisive caw. Silencio! Silencio! The raven cawed more loudly. It's the way you're moving your wand, said Hermione, watching Ron critically. You don't want to wave it. It's more of a sharp jab. Ravens are harder than frogs, said Ron testily. Fine, let's swap, said Hermione, seizing Ron's raven and replacing it with her own fat bullfrog. Silencio! The raven continued to open and close its sharp beak, but no sound came out. Very good, Miss Granger, said Professor Flitwick's squeaky little voice, making Harry, Ron, and Hermione all jump. Now, let me see you try, Mr. Weasley. Oh, oh, oh right, said Ron, very flustered. Uh, silencio, he jabbed at the bullfrog so hard he poked it in the eye. The frog gave a deafening croak and leapt off the desk. It came as no surprise to any of them that Harry and Ron were given additional practice in the silencing charm for homework. They were allowed to remain inside over break. To do, to, due to the downpour outside, they found seats in a noisy and overcrowded classroom on the first floor in which Peeves was floating dreamily up near the chandelier, occasionally blowing an ink pellet at the top of somebody's head. They had barely sat down when Angelina came struggling towards them through the groups of gossiping students. I've got permission, she said, to reform the Quidditch team. Excellent, said Ron and Harry together. Yes, yeah, said Angelina, beaming. We went to McGonagall. And I think she might have appealed to Dumbledore. Anyway, Umbridge had to give in. Ah, so, I want you down at the pitch at 7 o'clock tonight, all right? Because we've got to make up time. You realise we're only three weeks away from our first match. She squeezed away from them, narrowly dodged an ink pellet from Peeves, which hit a nearby first year instead, and vanished from sight. Ron's smile slipped slightly as he looked out of the window, which was now opaque with hammering rain. Hope this clears up. What's up with you, Hermione? She, too, was gazing at the window, but not as though she really saw it. Her eyes were unfocused, and there was a frown on her face. Just thinking, she said, still frowning at the rain-washed window. About Siri... Uh, snuffles, said Harry. No, not exactly, said Hermione slowly. More, uh, wondering, uh, I suppose... I suppose we're doing the right thing. I think, aren't we? Harry and Ron looked at each other. Well, that clears that up, said Ron. It would have been really annoying if you hadn't explained yourself properly. Hermione looked at him as though she had only just realised he was there. I was just wondering, she said, her voice stronger now, whether we're doing the right thing, starting this defence against the Dark Arts group. What? said Harry and Ron together. 
Hermione, it was your idea in the first place, said Ron indignantly. I know, said Hermione, twisting her fingers together, but after talking to Snuffles. But he's all right, said Harry. Yes, said Hermione, staring at the window again. Yes, that's what made me think maybe it wasn't a good idea after all. Steve's floated over them on his stomach. Pea shooter at the ready. Automatically, all three of them lifted their bags to cover their heads until he had passed. Let's get this straight, said Harry angrily, as they put their bags back on the floor. Sirius agrees with us. So, you don't think we should do it anymore? Hermione looked tense and rather miserable. Now staring at her own hands, she said, Do you honestly trust his judgment? Yes, I do, said Harry at once. He always gives us great advice. An ink pellet whizzed past them, striking Katie Bell squarely in the ear. Hermione watched Katie leap to her feet and start throwing things at Peeves. It was a few moments before Hermione spoke again, and it sounded as though she was choosing her words very carefully. You don't think he has become sort of reckless since he's being cooped up in Grimold Place? You don't think he's kind of living through us? What do you mean, living through us? Harry retorted. I mean, well, I think he'd love to be forming secret defence societies right under the nose of someone from the Ministry. I think he's really frustrated at how little he can do where he is. So I think he's keen to kind of egg us on. Ron looked utterly perplexed. Sirius is right, he said. You do sound just like my mother. Hermione bit her lip and did not answer. The bell rang just as Pee swooped down on Katie and emptied an entire ink bottle over her head. The weather did not improve on the, uh, as the day wore on, so that at seven o'clock that evening, when Harry and Ron went down to the Quidditch pitch for practice, they were soaked through within minutes, their feet slipping and sliding on the sodden grass. The sky was deep, thundery grey, and it was a relief to gain the warmth and the light of the changing rooms, even if they knew the respite was only temporary. They found Fred and George debating whether to use one of their own sniving snack boxes to get out of flying. But I bet she'd know what we've done, Fred said out of the corner of his mouth. If only I hadn't wanted mm. to sell her some puking pastels yesterday. We could try the fever fudge, George muttered. No one's seen that yet. Does it work? inquired Ron, hopefully, as the hammering of rain on the roof intensified and wind howled around the building. Well, yeah, said Fred. Your temperature will go right up. But you get these massive pus-filled boils too, said George. We haven't worked out how to get rid of them yet. I can't see any boils. Hello. No, well, uh, you wouldn't. The Shyron Fox. Not in a place we My God. Public, but they make sitting on a broom. Shyron like Fox. Famous. All right, everyone, listen up, said Jack Angelina loudly, emerging from the captain's office. I know it's not ideal weather. My God. Be playing Slytherin in conditions like this. I didn't but even know you were streaming. How we're going to cope with them. Ah. Harry, didn't you do something to your I didn't even know you were streaming. I wasn't up. even paying attention. I was story. trying to get commissions I done. It, said Harry. He pulled out his wand, tapped his glasses, and said, Impervious. I think we all ought to try that, said Angelina. If we could just keep the rain off our faces, it would really help visibility. All together. Come on. Impervious. Okay, let's go. They all stowed their... Bomb armed. God damn it. Shouldered their brooms and followed Angelina Ugh. to the changing rooms. That got me so fucking hard. mud to the middle of the pitch. Visibility was still very poor, even with the impervious charm. Ugh. Light was fading. Ugh. Oh, I forgot that 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 was there. Oh, give me a second. Hey, everybody. We all came. Ooh, fucking scared scared me out of my seat. Jesus. Hello. Welcome, Raiders. Welcome, everybody. I'm Go Chimera. I I make comics. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How were you? How was your stream? What did you draw? What did you do? Were you even drawing? That's a, that's a good question. What were you? Oh, yeah, you were. You were drawing. You were doing the drawing. Tara, what you need? That didn't scare me. Yes, you were. I was just trying to fix this tail. It's me, Austin. It was me all along, Austin. There you go. <laughs> just catch that one. 
Oh, you scared me so much, Husky Police. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're enjoying yourself. God damn. Thank you so much. If you wanna if you wanna pop in shy, if you wanna go to bed, that's fine. Either way. If you just want to chill out for just a little bit before you have to go to bed, that's totally fine too. Just chilling out in the chat. Just be hanging out with the goat. I'm working on this page, trying to get all these speech bubbles done. and curtains of rain were sweeping the ground. All right, on my whistle, shouted Angelina. Harry kicked off from the ground, spraying mud in all directions and shot upward, the wind pulling him slightly off course. He had no idea how he was going to see the snitch in this weather. He was having enough difficulty seeing the one bludger with which they were practicing. A minute into the practice, it almost unseated him, and he had to use the sloth grip roll to avoid it. Unfortunately, Angelina did not see this. In fact, she did not appear to be able to see anything. None of them had a clue what the others were doing. The wind was picking up, even at a distance. Harry could hear the swishing, pounding I'm sound very of the rain, tired, tumbling the so I will be going to bed. I hope Angelina you have a wonderful stream. But you stay amazing and beautiful, and wonderful, shy. And disgruntled teams Get some rest. Back into the changing rooms, insisting that the practice had not been a waste of time. But without any real conviction in her voice, Fred and George were looking particularly annoyed. Both were bandy legged and winced with every movement. Harry could hear them complaining in low voices as he toweled his hair dry. I think a few of mine have ruptured, said Fred in a hollow voice. Mine haven't, said George, wincing. They're throbbing like mad. I feel bigger, if anything. Ouch, said Harry. He pressed the towel to his face. His eyes screwed tight with pain. The scar on his forehead had seared again, more painfully than it had in weeks. What's up, said several voices. Harry emerged from behind his towel. The changing room was blurred because he was not wearing his glasses, but he could still tell that everyone's face was turned towards him. Nothing, he muttered. I, I poked myself in the eye, that's all. But he gave Ron a significant look, and the two of them hung back at the rest, as the rest of the team filed back outside, muffled in their coats. Their well, thank you for coming in. Thank ears. you for being awesome. What happened, said Ron, the moment Alicia had disappeared through the door. Was it your scar? <laughs> Harry nodded. But, looking scared, Ron strode across to the window and stared out into the rain. He, he can't be near us now, can he? No, Harry muttered sinking onto the bench and rubbing his forehead. He's probably miles away. It hurt because he's he's angry. Harry had not meant to say that at all, and heard the words as though a stranger had spoken them, yet knew at once that they were true. He did not know how he knew it, but he did. Voldemort, wherever he was, whatever he was doing, was in a towering temper. Did you see him, said Ron, looking horrified. Did you get a vision or something? Harry sat, sat quite still, staring at his feet allowing his mind and his memory to relax in the aftermath of the pain. A confused tangle of shapes, a howling rush of voices. He wants something done, and it's not happening fast enough, he said. Again, he felt surprised to hear the words coming out of his mouth, and yet was quite certain they were true. But how do you know, said Ron. Man. He shook his head and covered his eyes with his hands, pressing down upon them in his palms. Time to get he ready to go to uh, uh, Glasgow. Have a great rest of the stream and stay awesome and amazing. I might not be here for a couple of streams. No! My heaven. That's fine. What is it then? You stay amazing, heaven. He'd been looking into Umbridge's face. His scar had hurt. And he had had that odd feeling in his stomach, a strange leaping feeling. A happy feeling, but of course, he had not recognized it for what it was, as he had been feeling so miserable himself. Last time, it was because he was pleased, he said, really pleased. He thought something good was going to happen, and the night before we came back to Hogwarts, he, he thought back to the moment when his scar had hurt so badly in his and Ron's bedroom in Grimaud Place. He was furious. He looked around at Ron, who was gaping at him. You could take over from Trelawney, mate, he said in an awed voice. I'm not making prophecy, said Harry. No, you know what you're doing, Ron said, sounding both scared and impressed. Harry, you're reading, you know who's mine. No, said Harry, shaking his head. More like his mood, I suppose. I I'm just getting flashes of what mood he's in. Dumbledore said something like this was happening last year. 
He said that when Voldemort was near me, or when he was feeling hatred, I could tell. Well, now I'm feeling it when he's pleased, too. There was a pause, the wind and rain lashing at the building. You've got to tell someone, said Ron. I told Sirius last time. Well, tell him about this time. Can't, can I, said Harry grimly. Umbridge is watching the owls and the fires, remember? Well, then Dumbledore. I just told you he already knows, said Harry shortly, getting to his feet and taking his cloak off his peg and swinging it around him. There's no point telling him again. Ron did up the plastering of his own cloak, watching Harry thoughtfully. Dumbledore wants to know, he said. Harry shrugged. Come on, we've still got silencing charms to practice. They hurried back through the dark grounds, sliding and sliding. I'll miss the you, heathen. Harry was thinking, my good friend. What was it that Voldemort wanted done that was not happening quickly enough? He's got other plans. Plans he can put into operation very quietly indeed. Stuff he can only get by stealth. Good like time, Vol uh, Vlad isn't uh, pleased too Harry often. Harry about those words in weeks. He'd been too Vladdy? in what was going on at Hogwarts. Hey, He'd it's me. When good booty. When good booty. But now they came back to him and made him wonder. Voldemort's anger could make sense if he was no nearer to la laying hands on the weapon, whatever it was. Had the order thwarted him? Stopped him from seizing it? What was it he kept? What, where was it kept? Who had it now? Mimbulus, Mimbletonia, said Ron's voice, and Harry came back to his senses just in time to clamber through the portrait hole into the common room. It appeared that Hermione had gone to bed early, leaving Crookshanks curled in a nearby chair and an assortment of knobbly knitted elf hats lying on a table by the fire. Harry was rather grateful that she was not around because he did not much want to discuss his scar hurting and have her urge him to go to Dumbledore too. Ron kept throwing him anxious glances, but Harry pulled out his charms book and set to work on finishing his essay. Though he was only pretending to concentrate, but by the time Ron said he was going to bed too, he had written hardly anything. Midnight came and went while Harry was reading and rereading re a passage about the uses of scurvy grass, lovage and sneeze wart, and not taking in a word of it. These plants are most efficacious in the inflaming of the brain and are therefore much used in confusing and befuddlement grass where the wizard is desirous of producing hot-headedness and recklessness. Hermione and Sirius was becoming reckless. Said, Hermione said Sirius was becoming reckless, cooped up in Grimmauld Place. Most efficacious in the inflaming of the brain, and are therefore much used. The Daily Prophet would think his brain was inflamed if they found out that he knew what Voldemort was feeling, therefore much used in confusing and befuddlement draft. Confusing was the word, all right. Why did he know what Voldemort was feeling? What was this weird connection between them, which Dumbledore had never been able to explain satisfactorily? When the wizard is desirous, how Harry would like to sleep, by producing hot-headedness. It was warm and comfortable in his armchair before the fire, with the rain and still beating heavily on the window panes, crookshanks purring and the crackling of the flames. The book slipped from Harry's slack grip and landed with a dull thud on the half rug. His head lolled sideways. He was walking once more along a windowless corridor, his footsteps echoing in the silence. As the door at the end of the passage loomed larger, his heart beat fast with excitement. If he could only open it, enter beyond. He straight stretched out his hand. His fingertips were inches from it. Harry Potter, sir. He awoke with a start. The candles had all been extinguished in the common room, but there was something moving close by. Who's there? said Harry, sitting upright in his chair. The fire was almost out, the room very dark. Dobby has your owl, sir, said a squeaky voice. Dobby, said Harry quickly, peering through the gloom towards the source of the voice. Dobby, the house elf, was standing beside the table on which Hermione had left half a dozen of her knitted hats. His large pointed ears were now sticking out from beneath what looked like all the hats. Awesome job. Thank you. He was wearing one on top of the other so that his head seemed elongated by two or three feet. And on the very topmost bobble sat Hedwig, hooting serenely and obviously cured. Thank you, no problem. Harry Potter's owl, said the elf squeaking. How are you? A positive adoration on his face. Professor Grubby Plank says she is all well now, sir. He sank into a deep bow so that his pencil-like nose brushed the threadbare surface of the hearth rug, and Hedwig gave an indignant hoot and fluttered onto the arm of Harry's chair. Thanks, Dobby, said Harry, stroking Hedwig's head and blinking hard, trying to rid himself of the image of the door in his dream. It be very vivid. Looking back at Dobby, he noticed that the elf was also well good in yourself. I'm doing good. So that just here, there, everywhere. Uh, 
Have you been taking all the clothes Hermione's been leaving out? Oh, no, sir, said Dobby happily. Dobby has been taking some for Winky, too, sir. Yes, how is Winky, asked Harry. Dobby's ears drooped slightly. Winky is still drinking lots, sir, he said sadly. His enormous round green eyes, largest tennis balls. I've down. been doing She's good. Been Just been working hard and Harry Potter. No, got another commission. None of them will clean Gryffindor Tower anymore. Not with the hats and socks hidden everywhere. They find them insulting, sir. Dobby does it all himself, sir, but Dobby does not mind, sir. For he always hopes to meet Harry Potter, and tonight, sir, he has got his wish. Dobby sank into a deep bow again. But Harry Potter does not seem happy. Dobby went on, straightening up again, and looking timidly at Harry. Dobby heard him muttering in his sleep. Was Harry Potter having bad dreams? Not really bad, said Harry, yawning and rubbing his eyes. I've had worse. The elf surveyed Harry out of his vast, orb-like eyes. Then he said very seriously, his ears drooping, Dobby wishes he could help Harry Potter, but Harry Potter set Dobby free, and Dobby is much, much happier now. Harry smiled. You can't help me, Dobby, but thanks for the offer. He bent and picked up his potions. Oh, the commission very yeah. The essay tomorrow. He closed the Always box, working. Also, the firelight illuminated the Always the working. Of hands, the result of his detentions with Umbridge. Wait a moment. There is something you can do for me, Dobby, said Harry slowly. The elf looked around, beaming. Name it, Harry Potter, sir. I need to find a place where 28 people can practice defense against the dark arts without being discovered by any of the teachers, especially... Harry clenched his fist, his hand onto the book, so that the scars shone pearly white. Professor Umbridge. He expected the elf's smile to vanish, his ears to droop. He expected him to say it was impossible, or else that he would try to find somewhere, but his hopes were not high. What he had not expected... Very nice. Sorry my words sick. turned into an emoji. I meant very nice. Very nice. Dobby knows the perfect place, sir, he said happily. Dobby heard tell of it from the other house elves when he came to Hogwarts, sir. It is known by us as the come and go room, sir, or else as the room of requirement. Yes. Why, said Harry curiously, because it is a room that a person can only enter, said Dobby seriously, when they have a real need for it. Sometimes it is there and sometimes it is not, but when it appears, it is always equipped for the seeker's needs. Dobby has used it, sir, said the elf, dropping his voice and looking guilty, when Winky has been very drunk. He has hidden her in the room of requirement, and he has found antidote, the butterbeer there, and a nice elf-sized bed to settle her on while she sleeps it off, sir. And Dobby knows Mr. Filch has found some extra cleaning materials then, there, when he has run short, sir, and... And if you really needed a bathroom, said Harry, suddenly remembering something Dumbledore had said at the Yule Ball the previous Christmas, would it fill itself with chamber pots? Dobby expects so, sir, said Dobby, nodding earnestly. It is a most amazing room, sir. How many people know about it, said Harry, sitting up straighter in his chair. Very few, sir. Mostly people stumble across it when they use it, I would love to have a bottle of two of booty. You can't really make liquid buttocks, bet. You sound brilliant, said Harry, his heart racing. Sounds perfect, Dobby. When can you show me where it is? Any time, Harry Potter, sir, said Dobby, looking delighted at Harry's enthusiasm. We could go now if you like. For a moment, Harry was tempted to go with Dobby. He was halfway out of his seat intending to hurry upstairs for his invisibility cloak, when, not for the first time, a voice very much like Hermione's whispered in his ear, Reckless. It was, after all, very late, and he was exhausted. Not tonight, Dobby, said Harry reluctantly, sinking back into his chair. This is really important. I don't want to blow it. You'll need proper planning. Listen, can you just tell me exactly where this room of requirement is, and how you get in there? Their robes billowed and swirled around them as they splashed, across the flooded vegetable patch to double herbology, where they could hardly hear Liquid the but with a hammering of raindrops hard as hailstones on the greenhouse roof. The afternoon's care of magical creatures lesson was to be relocated from the storm-swept grounds to a free classroom on the ground floor. To their in intense relief, Angelina had sought out her team at lunch to tell them that Quidditch practice was cancelled. Good, said Harry quietly when he told them, because we found somewhere to have our first defence meeting. Tonight, 8 o'clock, 7th floor, opposite that tapestry of Barnabas, the Barney being clubbed by those trolls. Can you tell Katie and Alicia? She looked slightly taken aback, but promised to tell the others. Harry returned hungrily to his sausages and mash. When he looked up to take a drink of pumpkin juice, he found Hermione watching him. What? he said thickly. Well, just that Dobby's plans aren't always that safe. 
Don't you remember when he lost you all the bones in your arm? This room isn't just some mad idea of Dobby's. Dumbledore knows about it too. He mentioned it to me at the Yule Ball. Hermione's expression cleared. Dumbledore told you about it. Just in passing, said Harry, shrugging. Oh, well, that's all right then, said Harry, Hermi said Hermione briskly, and raised no more objections. Damn. Whoever was wrong, they had spent most it's of the possibly the process. The process is something I would tell my priest or rabbi. Uh -huh. Where to meet that evening? Damn. Somewhat to Harry's disappointment, it was Ginny who managed to find Cho Chang and her friend first. However, by the end of dinner, he was confident that the news had been passed to every one of the twenty-five people who had turned up in the Hog's Head. At half past seven, Harry, Ron, and Hermione left the Gryffindor common room. Harry, clutching the certain piece of aged parchment in his hand. Fifth years were allowed to be out of the corridors until nine o'clock, but all three of them kept looking around nervously as they made their way along the seventh floor. Hold it, Harry warned, unfolding the piece of parchment at the top of the last staircase, tapping it with his wand and muttering, I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. A map of Hogwarts appeared on the blank surface of the parchment. Tiny black moving dots, labelled with names, showed where various people were. Filch is on the second floor, said Harry, holding the map close to his eyes. Mrs. Norris is on the fourth. An umbridge? said Hermione anxiously. In her office, said Harry, pointing. OK, let's go. They hurried along the corridor to the place Dobby had described to Harry, a stretch of blank wall opposite an enormous tapestry depicting Barnabas the Barmy's foolish attempt Zara? to the ballet. <laughs> okay, I don't know what quietly. she's up to. While I don't know what Zara's up to, but it's probably something. would-be ballet teacher to watch them. Dobby said to walk past this bit of the wall three times, concentrating hard on what we need. They did so, turning sharply at the window just beyond the blank stretch of wall, then at the man-sized vase on its other side. side. Ron had screwed up his eyes in concentration. Hermione was whispering something under her breath. Harry's fists were clenched as he stared ahead of him. We need somewhere to learn to fight, he thought. Just give us a place to practice, somewhere they can't find us. Harry, said Hermione sharply, as they wheeled around after their third walk past. A highly polished door had appeared in the wall. Ron was staring at it, looking slightly wary. Harry reached out, oh, well. seized the brass oh, well. and pulled open the door, and led the way into a spacious room no. lit with flickering torches. Like Zara means a woo. No, no, uh, no, 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 She means a woo. Instead of chairs, there were large silk cushions on the floor. A set of shelves at the far end of the room carried a range of instruments such as sneaker scopes, secrecy sensors, and a large cracked faux glass that Harry was sure had hung the previous year in the fake Moody's office. These will be good when we're practicing stunning, said Ron enthusiastically, prodding one of the cushions with his foot. And just look at these books, said Hermione excitedly, running a finger along the spines of the large leather-bound tomes, a compendium of common curses and their counteractions, the dark arts, outsmart, self-defensive spe spellwork. Wow! She looked around at Harry, her face glowing, and he saw that the presence of hundreds of books had finally convinced Hermione that they were doing what they were doing was right. Harry, this is wonderful. Uh, There's everything we need here. What's uh, a Oh, it's uh, it's just its garbage speak. The nearest cushion and began to read. There was a gentle knock on the door. Harry looked around. Ginny, Neville, Lavender, Pavati, and Dean had arrived. Whoa, said Dean, staring around, impressed. What is this place? Harry began to explain. But before he had finished, more people had arrived, and he had to start all over again. By the time eight o'clock arrived, every cushion was occupied. Harry moved across to the door and turned the key protruding from the lock. It clicked in a satisfyingly loud way, and everybody fell silent, looking at him. Hermione carefully marked her page of jinxes for the jinx and set the book aside. Well, said Harry slightly nervously. Garbage day. A face. Sessions, yeah. And you've uh, the woo is just uh is just Fantastic, said garbage Fred. speech. And several people murmured their agreement. For uh, Bizarre, said Fred, frowning around at it. For excited. You know what? It was just a broom what does the Urban Dictionary hey, say? Urban Dictionary. Ooh, ooh. Uh, the basic spider face emotion uh, used in texting. Uh, uh, it's... Um, I, I don't know. W what does a woo mean? It, a woo in British English 
uh, exclamation slang, an expression of surprise used especially in text messaging and social media. Yeah. What's this stuff? Asked Dean from the rear of the room, indicating the sneaker scope and the faux glass. Dark detectors, said Harry, stepping between the cushions to reach them. Basically, they yeah, really it's a motorcar. Dark wizards or enemies are around, but you don't want to rely on them too much. They can be fooled. He gazed for a moment into the cracked faux glass. Shadowy figures were moving around inside it, though none was recognizable. He turned his back on it. Well, I've been thinking about the sort of stuff we ought to do first, and uh, he noticed a raised hand. What, Hermione? I think we ought to elect a leader, said Hermione. Harry's leader, said Cho at once, looking at Hermione as though she were mad. Harry's stomach did yet another backflip. Yes, but I think we ought to vote on it properly, said Hermione, unperturbed. It makes it formal and gives him authority, so everyone who thinks Harry ought to be the leader. Everybody put up their hand, even Zachariah Smith, though he did it very half-heartedly. Uh, right, uh, thanks, said Harry, who could feel his face burning. And what, Hermione? I also think we ought to have a name, she said brightly, her hand still in the air. It will promote a feeling of team spirit and unity, don't you think? Can we be the anti-Umbridge League, said Angelina, hopefully. Or the Ministry of Magic are morons group, suggested Fred. I was thinking, said Hermione, frowning at Fred, more of a name that didn't tell everyone that what we were up to, so we can refer to it safely outside meetings. The Defence Association, said Cho. The DA, for short, so nobody knows what we're talking about. Yeah, the DA's good, said Ginny. Only, let's make it stand for Dumbledore's Army, because that's the Ministry's worst fear, isn't it? There was a good deal of appreciative murmuring and laughter at this. All in favour of the DA, said Hermione bossily, kneeling up on her cushion to count. That's a majority. Motion passed. She pinned the piece of parchment with all their signatures on it onto the wall and wrote across the top in large letters, Dumbledore's Army. Right, said Harry, when he had sat when she had sat down again. Should we get practising then? I was thinking the first thing we should do is Experiamus, you know, the disarming charm. I know it's pretty basic, but I found it really useful. Oh, please, said Zachariah Smith, rolling his eyes and folding his arms. I don't think Expelliarmus is exactly going to help us against you-know-who, do you? I've used it against him, said Harry quietly. Saved my life in June. Smith opened his mouth, stupidly. The rest of the room was very quiet. But if you think it's beneath you, you can leave, Harry said. Smith did not move, nor did anybody else. Okay, said Harry, his mouth slightly drier than usual with all these eyes upon him. I reckon we should all divide into pairs and practice. It felt very odd to be issuing instructions, but not nearly as odd as seeing them followed. Everybody got to their feet at once and divided up. Predictably, Neville was left par left partnerless. You can practice with me, Harry told him. Right, on the count of three then. One, two, three. The room was suddenly full of shouts of Expelliarmus. Wands flew in all directions, missed spells, hit books on shelves, and sent them flying into the air. Harry was too quick for Neville, whose wand went spinning out of his hand, hit the ceiling in a shower of sparks, and landed with a clatter on top of a bookshelf, from which Harry retrieved it with a summoning charm. Glancing around, he thought he had been right to suggest they practice the basics first. There was a lot of shoddy spell work going on. Many people were not succeeding in summoning their opponents at all, but merely causing them to jump backwards a few paces or wince as their feeble spell whooshed over them. Expelliarmus, said Neville. And Harry, caught unawares, felt his wand fly out of his hand. I did it, said Neville gleefully. I've done it before, but I did it. Good one, said Harry encouragingly, deciding not to point out that in a real duel, Neville's opponent was unlikely to be staring in the opposite direction with his wand held loosely at his side. Listen, Neville, can you take it in turns to practice with Ron and Hermione for a couple of minutes so I can walk around and see how the rest are doing? Harry moved off into the middle of the room. Something very odd was happening to Zachariah Smith. Every time he opened his mouth to disarm Anthony Goldstein, his own wand would fly out of his hand. Yet Anthony did not seem to be making a sound. Harry did not have, a look, have to look far to solve the mystery. Fred and George were several feet from Smith and taking it in turns to point their wands at his back. Sorry, Harry, said George hastily, when Harry caught his eye. Couldn't resist. Harry walked around the other pairs, trying to correct those Thanks. who were doing the spell <laughs> wrong. He the schemes with Michael Paul. <laughs> He's doing very well whereas Michael was either very bad or unwilling to jinx her. Ernie McMillan was flourishing his wand un unnecessarily, giving his partner time to get in under his guard. The Creevy brothers were enthusiastic but erratic, and mainly responsible for all the books leaping off the shelves around them. Luna Lovegood was similarly patchy, occasionally sending Justin Finch Fletchley's wand spinning out of his hand, 
at other times merely causing his hair to stand on end. Okay, stop, Harry shouted. Stop, stop! Nita whistled, he thought, and immediately spotted one lying on top of the nearest row of books. He caught it up and blew hard. Everyone lowered their wands. That wasn't bad, said Harry, but there's definite room for improvement. Zachariah Smith glared at him. Let's try again. He moved off around the room again, stopping here and there to make suggestions. Slowly, the general performance improved. He avoided going near Cho and her friend for a while, but after walking twice around every other pair in the room, he felt he could not ignore them any longer. Oh no, said Cho rather wildly as he approached. Expelliarmus! I mean, ex expelli Expelliarmus! Oh, sorry, Mar Marietta. Her curly-haired friend's sleeve had caught fire. Marietta extinguished it with her own wand and glanced at Harry, as though it was his fault. You made me nervous. I was doing all right before then, Cho told Harry ruefully. That was quite good, Harry lied. But when she raised her eyebrows, he said, Well, no, it was lousy, but I know you can do it properly. I was watching from over there. She laughed. Her friend Marietta looked at them rather sourly and turned away. Don't mind her, Cho muttered. She doesn't really want to be here, but I made her come with me. Her parents have forbidden her to do anything that might upset Umbridge. You see, her mum works for the Ministry. What about your parents? asked Harry. Well, they've forbidden me to get, the, get on the wrong side of Umbridge too, said Cho, drawing herself up proudly. But if they think I'm going to fight, you know who. After what happened to Cedric, she broke off, looking rather confused, and an awkward silence fell between them. Terry Boots' wand went whizzing past Harry's ear and hit Alicia Spinnet hard on the nose. Well, my dad is very supportive of any un anti ministry action, said Luna Lovegood, proudly from just behind Harry. Evidently, she had been eavesdropped. What's the give me a name button for? Could you change your name to. Uh, is it just a nickname? No, no. So I'm making a comic book. I'm writing, I'm writing, and I'm literally making this this graphic novel like this is my slow but monotonous thing that i am making this is something that i want to do with my life i want to make i want to make people happy and smile and the best way to do that is with what what i have as a craft what i have is i make comic books so I'm making this, and with if you've spent enough time in my chat, if you spent enough time chatting with me, talking to me, and just being around, you earn, you know, you took the time. You should earn something for it. That's what I'm saying. So, when you see stuff like that... I say he believed he'd believe anything of Fudge. I mean, the number of goblins Fudge has had assassinated. And of Me course, smile, he very uh, good content, plus per, uh, no, personality. Goat is really uh, uh, better, uh, great. Some uh, uh, really the greatest of all time. Harry muttered to Cho as she opened her mouth, looking puzzled. She giggled. Hey, Harry! Hermione called from the other end of the room. Have you checked the time? He looked down at his watch and was shocked to see it was already ten past nine, which meant they needed to get back to the common rooms immediately or risk being caught and punished by Filch for being out of bounds. He blew his whistle. Everybody stopped shouting Expelliarmus, and the last couple of wands pattered to the floor. Well, that was pretty good, said Harry, but we've overrun. We'd better leave it here. Same time, same place next week. Sooner, said Dean Thomas eagerly, and many people nodded in agreement. Angelina, however, said quickly, The Quidditch season's about to start. We need team practices too. Let's say next Wednesday night then, said Harry. We can decide in additional meetings then. Come on, we'd better get going. He pulled out the Marauder's map again and checked it carefully, the signs of teachers on the seventh floor. He let them all leave in threes and fours, watching their tiny dots anxiously to see that they returned safely to their dormitories. The Hufflepuffs in the basement corridor were also led to the kitchens the Ravenclaws to a tower on the west side of the castle, and the Gryffindors along the corridor to the fat lady's portrait. That was
was really, really good, Harry, said Hermione, when finally it was just her, Harry and Ron who were left. Yeah, it was, said Ron enthusiastically, as they slipped out of the door and watched it melt back into stone behind them. Did you see me disarm Hermione, Harry? Only once, said Hermione, stung. I got you loads more than you got me. I do not only I did not only get you once, I got you at least three times. Well, if you're counting the one where you tripped over your own feet and knocked the wand out of my hand. They argued all the way back to the common room, but Harry was not listening to them. He had one eye on the marauder's map, but he was also thinking of Cho, saying he made her nervous. Chapter 19. The Lion and the Serpent Harry felt as though he were carrying some kind of talisman inside his chest over the following few weeks, a glowing secret that supported him through Umbridge's classes and even made it possible for him to smile. Now that we've like a polygon, where the border will curve with each other, the program will pick the line color and fill color for your word balloon. The line color refers to the outline, and the fill color to the color inside the balloon. Additionally, in the ellipse and square balloon tools, you can change the shape of the tool between rectangle, ellipse, and the default ellipse. But that is just my own preference. You can also change the style of the outline underneath the structure. Try experimenting with the different settings to find what works best. Smiled blandly as he looked into her horrible, bulging eyes. Me when you she scream. PA were Ignore the B. Very nose, doing the very thing she and the ministry. You are so down to earth and humble. To I try to be because I'm not perfect. perfect. As you can clearly tell, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. Uh. Editing a balloon, uh, select the balloon. Uh, on the tool palette, select. And then. Okay. Okay. And then, okay. Okay. Can I change the color of the word balloon? God damn it. God dang you. Gosh dang you. During the lessons, he dwelled instead on satisfying... Go literally perfect. No, I'm not! Remembering how Neville had successfully disarmed Hermione, how Colin Creevy had mastered the impediment <laughs> in, after three meetings, hard effort, how Pavati Patil... That's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. She reduced the table carrying all the sneaker scopes to dust. He was finding it almost impossible to fix a regular night of the week for the DA meeting, as they had to accommodate three separate teams' Quidditch practices, which were often rearranged due to bad weather conditions. But Harry was not sorry about this. He had a feeling that it was probably better to keep the timing of their meeting unpredictable. I got it. I figured it out. Them, it would be hard to make out a pattern. Hermione soon devised a very clever method of communicating the time and date of the next meeting to all the members in case they needed to change it at short notice because it would look suspicious if people from different houses were seen crossing the Great Hall to talk to each other too often. She gave such each of the members of the DA a fake galleon. Ron became very excited when he first saw the basket and was convinced she was actually giving out gold. You see the numerals around the edge of the coins, Hermione said, holding one up for examination at the end of their fourth meeting. The coin gleamed fat and yellow in the light from the torches. On real galleons, that's just a serial number referring to the goblin who cast the coin. On these fake coins, though, the numbers will change to reflect the time and date of the next meeting. The coins will grow hot when the date changes, so if you're carrying them in a pocket, you'll be able to feel them. We take each one, and when Harry sets the date of the next meeting, he'll change the numbers on his coin, and because I put a prote protean charm on them, they'll, be, they'll, they'll all change to, hit, to mimic his. A blank silence greeted Hermione's words. She looked around at all the faces upturned to her, rather disconcerted. Well... I thought it was a good idea, she said uncertainly. I mean, even if Umbridge asked us to turn out our pockets, there's nothing fishy about carrying a galleon, is there? But, well, if you don't want to use them, you can do a protein charm, said Terry Boots. Yes, said Ch Hermione. But that's, that's new standard, that is, he said weakly. Oh, said Hermione, trying to look modest. Oh, well, yes, I suppose it is. How come you're not in Ravenclaw, he demanded, staring at Hermione with something close to wonder. Yeah, I like can't believe you've done this. Well, the sorting hat did seriously consider putting me in Ravenclaw during my sorting, 
said Hermione brightly, but it decided on Gryffindor. I saw luggage at last. How do you know all? All knowing being punched by wood. <laughs> Harry looked sideways at Hermione. You know what these remind me of? It is sadly Marglar. Well, scars. they said it. It's Marglar. My name is Marglar Pansley. <laughs> you caught me red-handed. Margla Pansley, the squat, the squat that lives here. Mm. Oh, nobody picks that. The joke is me, Napalm. The joke is me. If you want, I can go through a list. Tell me a bad joke. Let's see. All right. Three fish are in a tank. One asks the other, how do you drive this thing? Why do bees have sticky hair? Because they use honeycombs. What kind of streets do ghosts haunt? Dead ends. Ever tried to eat a clock? It's time consuming. A man and a giraffe walk into a bar. After a few drinks, the giraffe falls over and dies. The man begins to walk out. The bartender stops him. Hey, you can't leave that lion there. The bartender yells out, turns around. It's not a lion, it's a giraffe. That's such a bad joke. What the fuck? Whispers. Say something about airline food. Bro, that's actually a good one, honey comes. Voldemort touches one of them and all their skulls. Thank you, them, Napalm. And they know they've got to join him. Well, yes, said Hermione quietly. That is where I got the idea. But you'll notice I decided to engrave the date on bits of metal rather than on our members' skin. Yeah, I prefer your way, said Harry, grinning, as he slipped his galleon into his pocket. I suppose the only danger with, with, with these is that we, most, we might accidentally spend them. Fat chance, said Ron, who was examining his own fake galleon with a slightly mournful air. Haven't got any real galleons to confuse it with. As the first Quidditch match of the season, Gryffindor versus Slytherin drew nearer. Their DA meetings were put on hold because Angelina insisted on almost daily practices. The fact that the Quidditch Cup had not been held for so long added considerably to the interest and excitement surrounding the forthcoming game. The Ravenclaws and Hufflepuff there we go. were taking a lively interest in the outcome, for they, of course, will be playing both teams over the coming year, and the heads of house of the competing teams, though they attempted to disguise it under there a decent, we go. Uh, decent pretense I of I figured it out. They determined to see their own side victorious. Harry realised how much Professor McGonagall cared about beating Slytherin when she abstained from giving them homework in the weeks leading up to the match. I think you've got enough to be getting on with at the moment, she said loftily. Nobody could quite believe their ears until she looked directly at Harry and Ron and said grimly, I've become accustomed to seeing the Quidditch Cup in my study, boys, and I really don't want to have to hand it over to Professor Snape, so use the extra time to practice, won't you? Snape was no less obviously partisan. He had booked the Quidditch pitch for sliver in practice so often that the Gryffindors had difficulty getting on to play. He was also turning a deaf ear to the many reports of sliver in attempts to hex Gryffindor players in the corridors. When Alicia Spinnet turned up at the hospital, Galactic B. So thick and fast, they obscured her vision and have obstructed her mouth. Snape insisted hey, Bob, that she be a hair thickening. Stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong. To listen to the fourteen eyewitnesses, it's, it is bad. Seen the sliver in Peter Dang, I missed a word. Hits her from behind with a jinx while she worked in the library. Harry felt optimistic about Gryffindor's chances. They had, after all, never lost to Malfoy's team. Admittedly, Ron was still not performing to Wood's standard, but he was also extremely hard to improve. His greatest weakness was a tendency to lose confidence after he'd made a blunder. If he let in one goal, he became flustered and was therefore likely to miss more. On the other hand, Harry had seen Ron make some truly spectacular saves when he was on form. During one memorable practice, he had hung one-handed from his broom and kicked the quaffle so hard away from the goal hoop that it soared the length of the pitch and through the centre hoop at the other what? end. The rest of the team oh, there's a butt. The compared oh, God. The one made recently by Barry Ryan, the Irish international keeper, almost po against Poland's top chaser. 
Ladislaw Zamoski, even Fred had said that Ron might yet make him and George proud, and they were seriously considering admitting he was related to them, something they assured him they'd been trying to deny for four years. The only thing really worrying Harry was how much Ron was allowing the tactics of the Slytherin team to upset him before they even got onto the pitch. Harry, of course, had endured their snide comments for over four years, so whispers of, hey, potty, I heard Warrington sworn to knock you off your broom on Saturday. Far from chilling his blood made him laugh. Warrington's aim so pathetic I'd be more worried if he was aiming for the person next to me, he retorted, which made Ron and Hermione laugh and wiped a smirk off Pansy Parkinson's face. But Ron had never endured a relentless campaign of insults, jeers and intimidation when Slytherins, some of them seventh years and considerably larger than he was, muttered as they passed in the corridors. Got your bed booked in the hospital wing, Weasley. He didn't laugh, but turned a delicate shade of green when Draco Malfoy imitated Ron dropping the twattle, which he did whenever they came within sight of each other. Ron's ears glowed red and his hands shook so badly that he was likely to drop whatever he was holding at the time, too. October extinguished itself in a rush of howling winds and driving rain. November arrived, cold as frozen iron, with hard frosts every morning and icy draughts that bit as it had exposed hands and faces. The skies and the ceiling of the Great Hall turned pale, pearly grey. The mountains around Hogwarts were snow-capped, and the temperature in the castle dropped so low that many students wore their dark, thick, protective dragon-skin gloves in the corridors between lessons. The morning of the match dawned bright and cold, when Harry awoke, he looked around at Ron's bed and saw him sitting bolt around his knees. Hello, Lavagale. You're right, sir. Ah. Oh my god, thank Harry you for the amazing art. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lavagale. Do you find you me a nuisance? Sweaty. Never gonna so give men. you up. To his reluctance to open I cannot wait for my BF to wake up so I can show him. Yay! Now he's sick. He needs rest. He's been throwing up off and on for two days now. Don't do that, actually. I care about rest and mental health. Yes. Scarves and hats. Every one of them was wearing a silver badge in the shape of what seemed to be a crown. For some reason, many of them waved at Ron, laughing uproariously. Harry tried to see what was written on the badges as he walked by, but he was too concerned to get Ron past the te their table quickly to linger long enough to read them. They reached the rousing welcome at the Gryffindor table, where everyone was wearing red and gold. But far from raising Ron's spirits, the cheer seemed to sap the last of his morale. He collapsed onto the nearest bench, looking as though he was facing his final meal. Must have been mental to do this, he said in a croaky whisper. Mental? Don't be thick, said Harry firmly, passing him a choice of cereals. It's going to be fine. It's normal to be nervous. I'm rubbish, croaked Ron. I'm lousy. I can't play to save my life. What was I thinking? Get a grip, said Harry sternly. Look at that save you made with your foot the other day. Even Fred and George said it was brilliant. Ron turned a tortured face to Harry. That was an accident. He whispered miserably. I didn't mean to do it. I slipped off my broom when none of you were looking. When I was trying to get back on, I kicked the twaffle by accident. Well, said Harry, recovering quickly from his unpleasant surprise. A few more accidents like that and the game's in the bag, isn't it? Hermione and Ginny sat down opposite them wearing red and gold scarves, gloves and rosettes. How are you feeling? Ginny asked Ron. He was now staring into the dregs of milk at the bottom of his empty cereal bowl, as though seriously considering attempting to drown himself in them. He's just nervous, oh, no. Harry. I hope it'll pass the system. I yes. I hope he feels better, Lavagale. Nervous, said Hermione heartily. Sorry that I'm I'm trying to get this done. It's just that I finally I'm finally getting this page done, and it's been a fucking month. Cause I've because instead of doing this, I've been doing commissions, which is fine. I like doing the commissions. I got a bunch uh done, and I love getting commissioned by everybody. Don't get me wrong, I love money, but also I wanted to get this done. So, you know, slowly trying to get it done, trying to make sure that, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, where there's any white space or any like, like this and all that. I'm probably going to move that, so. Uh, uh, uh.
Damn it. There we go. Thank around. Yeah. Bam. Bam. Like that. Oh. Hello, said a vague and dreamy voice from behind them. Harry looked up. Luna Lovegood had drifted over from the Ravenclaw table. Many people were staring at her, and a few were openly laughing and pointing. He's in he good care. I wish him like good health. Sorry lion he's lion going through that. Same. Harry's someone at his job came in sick and, and got almost Ravenclaw. everyone sick. No! Oh, crap! Look what it does. Money she crab! And tapped the hat with her wand. It opened its mouth wide. But I just wanted to really say thank you again uh, before I went to sleep. I have work, so I'm going to go uh, get some rest. I'll get some rest. Have a lovely night. Have a lovely night. They'd not quite recovered from the shock of Have an amazing one. You're wonderful and amazing. You need to know that. My eyebrows had mercifully been returned to normal by Madame Pomfrey. When you're ready, she said, we're going get to get some rest. We will see you Check later. Change. We'll be there in a bit, Harry assured her. Ron's just got and I'm, I'm always so open for commission, so don't don't feel uh, like a stranger Harry either. And if you just want to chill room. out sometime, just let us know. Hermione got up too, and taking Harry's arm, she drew him to one side. Don't let Ron see what's on those sliver in badges, she whispered urgently. Harry looked questioningly at her, but she shook her head warningly. Ron had just ambled over to them, looking lost and desperate. Good luck, Ron, said Hermione. Oh, uh, will. Oh, uh, will. Oh, uh, will. And you, Harry. Oh, uh, will. Seemed to come to that's, uh, that's the sound. The great hall. Also, he done my pin-up. Mm. Let's see. Him, looked puzzled. But. He was not quite sure what but. just happened. He seemed too distracted to notice much around him. But Harry cast a curious glance at the crown-shaped badges as they passed the sliver in table. And this time he made out the words etched onto them. Weasley is our king. With an unpleasant feeling that this could mean nothing good, he hurried Ron across the entrance hall, down the stone steps, and out into the icy air. The frosty grass crunched under their feet as they hurried down the sloping lawns to the And the furthermore... There was no wind at all, and the sky was a uniform pearly white, which meant that visibility would be good without the drawback of direct sunlight in the eyes. Harry pointed out these encouraging factors to Ron as they walked, but he was not sure that Ron was listening. Angelina had changed already and was talking to the rest of the team when they entered. Harry and Ron pulled on their robes. Ron attempted to do his up back to front for several minutes before Alicia took pity on him and went to help, then sat down to listen to the pre-match talk while the babble of voices outside grew steadily louder as the crowd came pouring out of the castle towards the pitch. OK, I've only just found out the final lineup for Slytherin, said Angelina, consulting a piece of parchment. Last year's beaters, Derek and Bol, had left but it looks as though Montague's replaced them with the usual gorillas, rather than anyone who can fly particularly well. There are two blokes called Crabbe and Goyle. I don't know much about them. We do, said Harry and Ron together. Well, they don't look bright enough to tell one end of a broom from the other, said Angelina, pocketing her parchment. But then I was always surprised Derek and Bowl managed to find their way onto the pitch without signposts. Crabbe and Goyle are in the same mould, Harry assured her. They could hear hundreds of footsteps mounting the bank benches of the spectators' stands. Some people were singing, though Harry could not make out the words. He was starting to feel nervous, but he knew his butterflies were as, were as nothing compared to Ron's. He was clutching his stomach and staring straight ahead again, his jaw set in his complexion pale grey. It's time, said Angelina in a hushed voice, looking at her watch. Come on, everyone. Good luck. The team rose, shouldered their brooms and marched in single the most file, updated and whip. Changing them whip. Into the Forgive me, sky. Father, for I have sinned. It's fine. Them, in which Harry it's fine. Singing. But it was muffled by the cheers and whistles. And see, the Slytherin team was standing tool man. for them. Uh? They too were wearing those silver crown uh? badges. The new captain, Montague, was built along the side uh? of Dudley Dursley with massive forearms, uh, forearms like hairy hands. Behind him lurked Crab and Goyle, uh? the large, blinking stupidly, swinging their new beaters' backs. Malfoy stood to one side, the sunlight gleaming on his uh? right on head. He caught Harry's eye and smirked, tapping the crown-shaped badge on his chest. Captains, shake hands, ordered the referee, Madame Hooch, as Angelina and Montague reached out to each other. Harry could tell that Montague was trying to crush Angelina's fingers, so she did not wince. Mount your brooms! Madame Hooch placed her whistle in her mouth and blew. The balls were released, and the 14 players shot upwards. 
Out of the corner of his eye, Harry saw Ron streak off towards the goal hoop. Harry zoomed higher, dodging a bludger, and set off on a wide lap of the pitch, gazing around for a glimpse of goal. On the other side of the stadium, Draco Malfoy was doing exactly the same. And it's Johnson. Johnson with the quaffle. What a player that girl is. I've been saying it for years, but she still won't go out with me. Jordan, yelled Professor McGonagall. Just a fun fact, Professor. Adds a bit of interest. And she's Duck Warrington. She's past Montague. She's, ouch, been hit from behind by a bludger from Crab. Montague catches the quaffle. Montague heading back up to the pitch. And nice bludger there from George Weasley. I was referring to my chungus that I drew on Discord. By Katie Bell. Katie I said when I posted that, it didn't have a spoiler warning since I didn't know how to do it. That's fine. I, wa I wasn't bothered by it. Wah. Dodges Warrington, avoids the bludger, close call, Alicia, and the crowd are loving this. Just listen to them. What's that they're singing? And as Lee paused to listen, the song rose loud and clear from the sea of green. I like that one. That one's a good one. That one's a good one. That's a good one. Green and silver in the slivering section of the stands. Weasley cannot say the thing. No. He cannot block a single ring. No. That's why slivering all sing. Weasley is our king. Weasley was born in a bin. He always lets the quaffle in. You're Weasley good. We'll make sure we win. Weasley is our king. And Alicia passes back to Angelina, Lee shouted. And as Harry swerved, his insides boiling at what he had just heard, he knew Lee was trying to drown out the words of the song. Come on now, Angelina. Looks like she's got just the keeper to beat. She shoots. She, ah. Fletchley, the slivering keeper, had saved the goal. He threw the quaffle to Warrington, who sped off with it, zigzagging in between Alicia and Katie. The singing from below grew louder and louder as he drew nearer and nearer Ron. Weasley is our king. Weasley is our king. He always lets the quaffle in. Weasley is our king. Harry could not help himself, abandoning his search for the snitch. He turned his firebolt towards Ron, a lone figure at the far end of the pitch, hovering before the three goal hoops while the massive Warrington pelted towards him. And it's Warrington with a quaffle. Warrington heading for goal. He's out of bludger range with just the keeper ahead. A great swell of song rose from the sliver in stands below. Weasley cannot say the thing. He cannot block a single ring. So it's the first test for new Gryffindor keeper Weasley, brother of Beaters Fred and George, and a promising new talent on the team. Come on, Ron. But the scream of delight came from the Slytherin's end. Ron had dived wildly, his arms wide, and the quaffle had soared between them straight through Ron's central hoop. Slytherin score, came Lee's voice, amid the cheering and booing from the crowd below. So that's 10 mil to Slytherin. Bad luck, Ron. Slytherin sang even louder. Weasley was born in a bin. He always let the quaffle in. And Gryffindor, back in possession. And it's Katie Bell tanking up the pitch, cried Lee valiantly. Though the singing was now so deafening that he could hardly make himself heard above it. Weasley will make sure we win. Weasley is our king. Harry, what are you doing? screamed Angelina, soaring past him to keep up with Katie. Get going! Harry realised he'd been stationary in mid-air for over a minute, watching the progress of the match without sparing a thought for the whereabouts of the snitch. Horrified, he went into a dive and started circling the pitch again, staring around, trying to ignore the chorus now thundering through the stadium. Weasley is our king! Weasley is our king! There was no sign of the snitch anywhere he looked. Malfoy was still circling the stadium, just as he was. They passed one another midway around the pitch, going in opposite directions, and Harry heard Malfoy singing loudly, Weasley was born in a bin! And it's Warrington again, bellowed Lee. He passes to Pusey. Pusey's off past Spinach. Come on now, Angelina, you can take him. Turns out you can't. But nice bludger from Fred Weasley. I mean, George Weasley. Oh, who cares? One of them. Anyway, and Warrington drops the quaffle. And Katie Bell uh, drops it too. So that's Montague with the quaffle. Sliver in Captain Montague takes the quaffle. And he's... <laughs> Come on now, Gryffindor, block him. Harry zoomed around the end of the stadium behind the slivering goal hoop, willing himself not to look at what was going on 
at Ron's end. As he sped past the slivering keeper, he heard Bletchley singing along with the crowd below. Weasley cannot say the thing. And Pusey dodged Alicia again. He's heading straight for goal. Stop it, Ron. Harry did not have to look to see what had happened. There was a terrible groan from the Gryffindor end, coupled with fresh screams and applause from the Slytherins. Looking down, Harry saw the pug-faced Pansy Parkinson right at the front of the stands, her back to the pitch, as she conducted the Slytherin supporters who were roaring, That's why Slytherins all sing. Weasley is our king. But 20 mil was nothing. There was still time for Gryffindor to catch up or catch the snitch. A few goals, and they could be in the lead. As usual, Harry assured himself, bobbing and weaving through another through other players in pursuit of something shiny that turned out to be Montague's watch strap. But Ron let in two more goals. There was an edge of panic in Harry's desire to find the snitch now, if he could just get it soon and finish the game quickly. And Katie Bell of Gryffindor dodges Pusey, ducks Montague. Nice swerve, Katie. And she throws to Johnson. Angelina Johnson takes the quaffle. She's past Warrington. She's heading for goal. Come on now, Angelina. Gryffindor score! It's uh, you should draw whatever you want, man. And Pusey has the quaffle. Draw whatever you want. Harry could hear Luna's ludicrous lion hat roaring amidst the Gryffindor cheers and felt heartened. Only 30 points in it. That was nothing. They could pull back easily. Harry ducked a bludger that Crab had sent rocketing in his direction and resumed his frantic scouring of the pitch for the snitch, keeping one eye on Malfoy. Yeah, you see that shiny nice hair. It. But Malfoy, like him, was continuing to soar around the stadium, searching fruitlessly. Pusey throws to Warrington. Warrington to Montague. Montague back to Pusey. Johnson intervenes. Johnson takes the quaffle. Yep. Johnson to Bell. This looks good. I mean, bad. Bell's hit by a bludger from Doyle of Slytherin, and it's Pusey in possession again. Weasley was born in a bin. He always lets the quaffle in. Weasley will make sure we win. But Harry had seen it at last. The tiny, fluttering gold snitch was hovering, feet from the ground at the Slytherin end of the pitch. He dived. In a matter of seconds, Malfoy was streaking out of the sky on Harry's left. A green and silver blur lying flat on his broom. The snitch. You should draw. In one of the goal hoops and scooted off towards the other what side of the stands. What do you think? All right, old computer noises. Um... Harry pulled his firebolt around. What should I draw? Draw an object and give it a face. Create an alternate cover uh, to your favorite book or album. Illustrate a uh, scene from a favorite song. Draw a scene or a character from your favorite book. Illustrate your favorite fairy tale. Invent your own insects. Draw an intricate made-up flower. Okay. Here you go. Boy, we're now neck and neck. Feet from the ground, Harry lifted his right hand from his broom, stretching towards the snitch. To his right, Malfoy's arm extended too, was reaching, groping. It was over in two breathless, desperate, windswept seconds. Harry's fingers closed around the tiny, struggling ball. Malfoy's fingernails grabbed and scrabbled the back of Harry's hand hopelessly. Harry pulled his broom upwards, holding the struggling ball in his hand, and the Gryffindor spectators screamed their approval. They were saved. It did not matter that one oh, nice. in those goals. Nobody will remember. As long as Gryffindor had won, wham! A bludger hit Harry squarely in the small of the back, and he flew forwards off his broom. Luckily, he was only five or six feet above the ground, having dived so low to catch the snitch. But he was winded all the same as he landed flat on his back on the frozen pitch. He heard Madame Hooch's shrill whistle, an uproar in the stands compounded of catcalls, angry yells and jeering, a thud, and then Angelina's frantic voice. Are you all right? Of course I am, said Harry grimly, taking her hand and allowing her to pull him to his feet. Madame Hooch was zooming towards one of the Slytherin players above him though he could not see who it was from this angle. It was the thud, grab, said Angelina angrily. He whacked the bludger at you the moment he saw you got the snitch. But we won, Harry. We won. Harry heard a snort from behind him and turned around, still holding the snitch tightly in his hand. Draco Malfoy had landed close by, white-faced with fury. He was still managing to sneer. Saved Weasley's neck, haven't you? He said to Harry. I've never seen a worse keeper, but then he was born in a bin. Did you like my lyrics, Potter? Harry didn't Loved him. He turned away to meet the rest of the team, who were now landing one by one, yelling and punching the air in triumph, all except Ron, who had dismounted from his broom over by the goalpost and seemed to be making his way slowly back to the changing rooms alone. We wanted to write another couple of verses, Malfoy called, as Katie and Alicia hugged Harry. But we couldn't find rhymes for fat and ugly. We wanted to sing about his mother, see? 
talk about sour grapes, said Angelina, casting Malfoy a disgusted look. We couldn't fit in, useless loser, either. For his father, you know. Fred and George had realised what Malfoy was talking about. Halfway through shaking Harry's hand, they stiffened, looking round at Malfoy. Leave it, said Angelina at once, taking Fred by the arm. Leave it, Fred. Let him, let him yell. He's just sorry lost, the jumped up little. But you like the Weasleys, don't you, Potter? said Malfoy, sneering. Spend holidays there and everything, don't you? Can't see how you stand the stink, but I suppose when you've been dragged in up by muggles, even the Weasleys' hovel smells okay. Harry grabbed hold of George. Meanwhile, it was taking the combined efforts of Angelina, Alicia and Katie to stop Fred leaping on Malfoy, who was laughing openly. Harry looked around for Madame Hoot, but she was still berating Crab for his illegal bludger attack. Or perhaps, said Malfoy, leering as he backed away, you can remember what your mother's house stank like, Potter, and Weasley's pigsty reminds you of it. Harry was not aware of releasing George. All he knew was that a second later both of them were sprinting towards Malfoy. He had completely forgotten that all the teachers were watching. All he wanted to do was cause Malfoy as much pain as possible. With no time to draw out his wand, he merely drew back the fist touching the snit and sank it as hard as he could into Malfoy's stomach. Harry! Harry! George! No! He could hear girls' voices screaming, Malfoy yelling, George swearing, a whistle blowing and the bellowing of the crowd around him. But he did not care. Not until somebody in the vicinity yelled, Impedimenta! And he was knocked over backwards by the force of the spell. Did he abandon the attempt to punch every inch of Malfoy he could reach? What do you think you're doing? screamed Madame Hoot as Harry leapt to his feet. It seemed to have been her who had hit him with the in in impediment jinx. She was holding her whistle in one hand and a wand in the other. Her broom lay abandoned several feet away. Malfoy was curled up on the ground, whimpering and moaning, his nose bloody. George was sporting a swollen lip. Fred was still being forcibly restrained by the three chasers, and Crab was cackling in the background. I've never seen behaviour like it. Back up to the castle, both of you, and straight to your head of house's office. Go, now! Harry and George marched off the pitch, both panting, neither saying a word to the other. The howling and jeering of the crowd grew fainter and fainter until they reached the entrance hall, where they could hear nothing except the sound of their own footsteps. Harry became aware that something was still struggling in his right hand, the knuckles of which had been bruised against Malfoy's jaw. Looking down, he saw the snitch's silver wings protruding from between his fingers, struggling for relief. They had barely reached the door of Professor McGonagall's office when she came marching along the corridor behind them. She was wearing a Gryffindor scarf that tore it from her throat and shaking hands as she strode towards them, looking livid. In, she said furiously, pointing to the door. Harry and George entered. She strode around behind her desk and faced them, quivering with rage as she threw the Gryffindor scarf aside on the floor. Well, she said, I have never seen such a disgraceful exhibition. Two on one, explain yourselves. Malfoy provoked her, said Harry stiffly. Provoked you, shouted Professor McGonagall, slamming her fist on her desk so that her tartan tin slid. So its tin slid sideways off it and burst open, littering the floor with ginger newt. He just lost, hadn't he? Of course he wanted to provoke you. What was on earth he, he can have said that justified what you two... He insulted my parents, snarled George, and Harry's mother. But instead of leaving it to Madame Hooch to sort out, you two decided to give an exhibition of muggle dueling, did you? Bellowed Professor McGonagall. Have you any idea what you... Ahem. Harry and George both spun around. Dolores Umbridge was standing in the doorway, wrapped in a green tweed cloak that greatly enhanced her resemblance to a giant toad, and was smiling in the horrible, sickly, ominous way that Harry had come to associate with imminent misery. May I help, Professor McGonagall? asked Professor Umbridge in her most poisonously sweet voice. Blood rushed into Professor McGonagall's face. Help, she repeated in a constricted voice. What do you mean, help? Professor Umbridge moved forwards into the office still smiling her sickly smile. Why, I thought you might be grateful for a little extra authority. Harry would not have been surprised to see sparks fly from Professor McGonagall's nostrils. You fought wrong, she said, turning her back on Umbridge. No, you two had better listen closely. I do not care what provocation Malfoy offered you. I do not care if he insulted every family member you possess. Your behaviour was disgusting, and I am giving each of you a week's worth of detention. Do not look at me like that, Potter. You deserve it. And if either of you ever... Ahem. Professor McGonagall closed her eyes, as though praying for patience, as she turned her face towards Professor Umbridge again. Yes, I think they deserve rather more than detention, 
said Umbridge, smiling still more broadly. Professor McGonagall's eyes flew open. But unfortunately, she said with an attempt of a reciprocal smile that made her look as though she had locked jaw. I drew a little milk carton with an old man's face. In my house, Dolores. Well, actually, Minerva, simpered Professor Umbridge, I think you'll find that is what I think does count. Now, where is it? Cornelius just sent it. I mean, he gave a false little laugh as she rummaged in her handbag. The minister just sent it. Ah, yes. She had pulled out a piece of parchment, which she now unfurled, clearing her throat fussily before starting to read what it said. Ahem. Educational Decree Number 25. Not another one, exclaimed Professor McGonagall violently. Well, yes, said Umbridge, still smiling. As a matter of fact, Minerva, it was you who made me see what we needed. We needed a further amendment. You remember how you overrode me when I was unwilling to allow the Gryffindor Quidditch team to reform? How you took the case to Dumbledore, who insisted that the team be allowed to play? Well, now I couldn't have that. I contacted the minister at once, and he quite agreed with me that the High Inquisitor has to oh. have the power to stop or strip pupils of privileges. Or she, that is to say, I, would have less authority oh, than I... common teachers. If I was, now, if I was her, right I, was in attempting to I don't know what I, what would happen. I think I would tempers. kill anyway, this woman. I, out our I would uh, unalive this woman if I was her. Will henceforth have supreme authority over all punishments, sanctions, and removal of privileges pertaining to the students of Hogwarts, and the power to alter such punishments, sanctions, and removals of privileges as may have been ordered by other staff members. Signed, Cornelius Fudge, Minister for Magic. Order of Merlin, first class, etc., etc. She rolled up the parchment and put it back into her handbag, still smiling. So, I really think I have to ban these two from playing Quidditch ever again, she said, looking from Harry to George and back again. Harry felt the snitch fluttering madly in his hand. Ban us, he said, and his voice sounded strangely distant, from playing ever again. Yes, Mr. Potter, I think a lifelong ban ought to do the nick said Umbridge, her smile widening still further as she watched him struggle to comprehend what she had said. You and Mr. Weasley here, and I think to be safe, this young man's twin ought to be stopped too. If his teammates had not restrained him, I feel sure he would have attacked young Malfoy as well. I will want their broomsticks confiscated, and of course I shall keep them safely in my office to make sure there is no infringement of my ban. But I am not unreasonable, Professor McGonagall. She continued, turning back to Professor McGonagall, who was now standing as still as though carved from ice, staring at her. The rest of the team can, 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 can continue playing. I saw no signs of violence from any of them. Well, good afternoon to you. And with a look of the utmost satisfaction, Umbridge left the room, leaving a horrified silence in her wake. Avada Kedavra. Avada Kedavra. Right into, into her fucking back. Avada Kedavra. Right into her fucking back. No sneaker. Unalive. No sneaker. What on earth are we going to do? It did not feel as though they had won the match at all. Everywhere Harry looked, there was disconsolate and angry mm. faces. The team themselves were slumped around the fire, all apart from Ron, who had not been seen since the end of the match. Just so unfair, said Alicia numbly. I mean, what about Crab and that bludger? He hit after the whistle had been blown. Has she banned him? No, said Ginny miserably. She said Hermione. That she and Hermione were sitting on either side of Harry. He just got lined. I heard Montague laughing about it at dinner. And banning Fred. And he didn't even do anything, said Alicia furiously, tumbling her knee with her fist. It's not my fault I didn't, said Fred, with a very ugly look on his face. I would have pounded the little scumbag to a pulp if you three hadn't been holding me back. Harry stared miserably at the dark window. Snow was falling. The snitch he had caught earlier was now zooming around and around the common room. People were watching its progress, as though hypnotized, and Crookshanks was leaping. I have Lego Harry, Harry Potter project. on my uh, we have watched Angelina, two movies, and this is my knowledge of the series. Will turn out to have been a bad dream. Maybe I'll That's fine. And find we haven't even played yet. She was soon followed by Alicia and Katie. Fred and George sloped off the bed some time later, glowering at everyone they passed, and Ginny went not long after that. Only Harry and Hermione were left beside the fire. Have you seen Ron? Hermione asked in a low voice. Harry shook his head. I think he's avoiding us, said Hermione. Where do you think he... But at that precise moment, there was a creaking sound behind them as the fat lady swung forwards and Ron came clambering through the portrait hole. He was very pale indeed, and there was snow in his hair. When he saw Harry and Hermione, he stopped dead in his tracks. Where have you been? said Hermione anxiously, springing up. Walking. 
Ron mumbled. He was still wearing his Quidditch ring. You look frozen, said Hermione. Come and sit down. Ron walked to the fireside and sank into the chair furthest from Harry's, not looking at him. The stolen snip zoomed over their heads. I'm sorry, Ron mumbled, looking at his feet. What for, said Harry. For thinking I can play Quidditch, said Ron. I'm going to resign first thing tomorrow. If you resign, said Harry testily, there'll only be three players left on the team. And when Ron looked puzzled, he said, I've been given a lifetime ban. So Fred and George. What? Ron yelped. Hermione told him the full story. Harry could not bear to tell it again. When she had finished, Ron looked more anguished than ever. This is all my fault. You didn't make me punch Malfoy, said Harry angrily. I wasn't so terrible at Quidditch. It's got nothing to do with that. It was, it was that song that wound me up. It would have wound anyone up. Hermione got up and walked to the window, away from the argument, watching the snow swirling down against the pane. Look, drop it, will you? Harry burst out. It's bad enough without you blaming yourself for everything. Ron said nothing but sat gazing miserably at the damp hem of his robe. After a while, he said in a dull voice, This is the worst I've ever felt in my life. Join the club, said Harry bitterly. Well, said Hermione in her voice, her voice trembling slightly. I can think of one thing that might cheer you both up. Oh, yeah? said Harry sceptically. Yes, said Hermione, turning away from the pitch-black, snow-flecked window, a broad smile spreading across her face. Hagrid's back. Chapter 20. Hagrid's Tale. Harry sprinted up to the boys' dormitories to fetch the invisibility cloak and the marauder's map from his trunk. He was so quick that he and Ron were ready to leave at least five minutes before Hermione hurried back down from the girls' dormitories, wearing scarf gloves and one of her own knobbly elf hats. Well, it's cold out there, she said defensively, as Ron clicked his tongue impatiently. They crept through the portrait hole and covered themselves hastily in the cloak. Ron had grown so much. I grew now back, he let's go. His feet showing. Fuck Turned everything, drop everything, portrait, everybody. He proceeded down the Hagrid's main staircase, back. pausing at intervals to check on the map for signs of Filch or Mrs. Norris. They were lucky. They saw nobody but nearly headless Nick, who was gliding along absentmindedly, humming something that sounded horribly like Weasley is our king. They crept across the entrance hall and out into the silent, snowy ground. With a great leap of his heart, Harry saw little golden squares of light ahead and smoke coiling up from the Hagrid's chimney. He set off at a quick march, the other two jostling and bumping along behind him. They crunched excitedly through the thickening snow until at last they reached the wooden front door. When Harry raised his fist and knocked about three you times... Mean the, you mean the, the best character? Yeah, sure. Harry, Do it. It's us! Harry called through the keyhole. Should have known, said a gruff voice. They beamed at each other under the cloak. They could tell by Hagrid's voice that he was pleased. Been home three seconds. Out the way, Fang. Out the way, you dozy dog. The bolt was drawn back. The door creaked open and Hagrid's head appeared at the gap. Hermione screamed. Merlin's beard, keep it down, said Hagrid hastily, staring wildly over their heads. Under that cloak, are you? Well, get in, get in. I'm sorry, Hermione gasped as the three of them squeezed past Hagrid into the house and pulled the cloak off themselves so we could see just see them. I just... Oh, Hagrid! It's nothing, it's nothing, said Hagrid hastily, shutting the door behind them and hurrying to close all the curtains. But Hermione continued to gaze up, up at him in horror. Hagrid's hair was matted with congealed blood and his left eye had been reduced to a puffy slit amid a mass of purple and black bruising. There were many cuts on his face and hands, some of them, some of them still bleeding. And he was moving gingerly, which made Harry suspect broken ribs. It was all the Hagrid just got home. A thick black do it, Napalm. Do chair, it up. And a haversack large enough to carry several small children leaned against the wall inside the door. Hagrid himself, twice the size of a normal man, was now limping over to the fire and placing a copper kettle over it. What happened to you? Harry demanded, while Fang danced around them all trying to lick their faces. Told you nothing, said Har Hagrid firmly. Want a cupper? Come off it, said Ron. You're in a right state. I'm telling you, I'm fine, said Hagrid, straightening up and turning to beam at them all, but wincing. Blimey, good to see you three again. Had good summers, did you? Hagrid, you've been attacked, said Ron. For the last time, it's nothing, said Hagrid firmly. Would you say it was nothing if one of us turned up with a pound of mints instead of a face, Ron demanded. You ought to go and see Madame Pomfrey, Hagrid, said Herm Hermione anxiously. Some of those cuts look nasty. I'm dealing with it, all right, said Hagrid repressively. He walked across to the enormous wooden table that stood in the middle of his cabin and twitched aside a tea towel that had been lying on it. 
underneath was a raw, bloody, green-tinged streak steak, slightly larger than the average car tyre. Not going to eat that, are you, Hagrid? said Ron, leaning in for a closer look. Looks poisonous. It's supposed to look like that. It's dragon meat, Hagrid said. And I didn't get it, get it to eat it. He picked up the steak and slapped it over the left side of his face. Greenish blood trickled down into his beard as he gave a soft moan of satisfaction. That's better. Toast with a sting in, you know. So, are you going to tell us what's happened to you? Harry asked. Can't, Harry. Top secret. More than me job's worth, to tell you that. Did the giants beat you up, Hagrid? Asked Hermione quietly. Hagrid's fingers slipped on the dragon steak, and it slid, slid squelchily onto his chest. Giants? Said Hagrid, catching the steak before it reached his belt and slapping it back over his face. Who said anything about giants? Who you been talking to? Who told you what I've... Who said I've been a... We guessed, said Hermione apologetically. Oh, you did, did you? said Hagrid, fixing her sternly with the eye that was not hidden by the stake. It was kind of obvious, said Ron. Harry nodded. Har Hagrid glared at them, then snorted, threw the, threw the stake back onto the table and strode over to the kettle, which was now whistling. Never known kids like you three for knowing more than you ought to, he muttered, splashing the boiling water into three of the bucket-shaped mugs. And I'm not complimenting you, neither. Nosy, some would call it interfering. But his beard twitched. So you've been to look for giants, said Harry, grinning as he sat down at the table. Hagrid set tea in front of each of them, sat down, picked up his steak again, and slapped it back over his face. Yeah, all right, he grunted. I am. And you found them, said Hermione in a hushed voice. Well, you're not that difficult to find. <laughs> They're not that difficult to find, to be honest, said Hagrid. Pretty big, see? Where are they, said Ron? Mountains said Hagrid unhelpfully. So why don't muggles? They do, said Hagrid darkly. Only uh, their deaths are always put down to mountaineering accidents, aren't they? He adjusted the stake a little so that it covered the worst of the bruising. Come on, Hagrid. Tell us what you've been up to, said Ron. Tell us about being attacked by the giants, and Harry can tell you about being attacked by the Dementors. Hagrid choked on his mug and dropped his stake. At the same time, a large quantity of spit Tea and dragon blood was sprayed over the table as Hagrid coughed and spluttered and steak slid with a soft splash onto the floor. What do you mean, attack by your mentors? growled Hagrid. Didn't you know? Hermione asked him wide-eyed. I don't know nothing that's been happening since I left. I was on a secret mission, wasn't I? I didn't want owls following me all over the place. What are you doing, mentors? You're not serious. Yeah, I am. They turned up in little winging and attacked my cousin and me, and then the Ministry of Magic expelled me. What? And I had to go to a hearing and everything, but tell us about the giants first. You were expelled. Tell us about your summer, and I'll tell you about mine. Hagrid glared at him through his open eye. Harry looked right back, an expression of innocent determination on his face. Oh, all right, Hagrid said in a resigned voice. He bent down and tugged the dragon steak out of Fang's mouth. Oh, Hagrid. Don't. It's not hygiene, Hermione began, but Hagrid had already slapped the meat back over his swollen eye. He took another fortifying gulp of tea and then said, Well, we set off right after term ended. Madame Maxine went with you then, Hermione interjected. Yeah, that's right, said Hagrid, and a softened expression appeared on the few inches of face that were not obscured by his beard or green steak. Yeah, it was just a pair of us. And I'll tell you this, she's not afraid of nothing. Uh, rough in it. A limp, hey, you know, she's a fine, well-dressed woman, and knowing where she, where we was going, I wondered how she'd feel about clambering over boulders and, and sleeping in caves and that, but she never complained once. You knew where you were going, Harry asked. You knew where the giants were. Well, Dumbledore knew, and he told us, said Hagrid. Are they hidden, said Ron? Is it a secret where they are? Not really, said Hagrid, shaking his shaggy head. Just that most wizards aren't bothered what they are or where they are. As long as it's good long a way away, but where they are is very difficult to get to for humans anyway. So we needed Dumbledore's instructions. Took us about a month to get there. A month, said Ron, as though he had never heard of a journey lasting such a ridiculously long time. But why wouldn't you why couldn't you just grab a, a pork key or something? There was an odd expression in Hagrid's obs unobscured eye as he squinted at Ron. It was almost pitying. We're being watched, Ron, he said gruffly. What do you mean? You don't understand, said Hagrid. The Ministry's keeping an eye on Dumbledore, and anyone they reckon's in league with him. And we know about that, said Harry quickly, being keen to hear the rest of Hagrid's story. We know about the Ministry watching Dumbledore. So you couldn't 
He's magic to get there, us Ron, looking dumbstruck. You had to act like muggles all the way. Well, not exactly all the way, said Hagrid cagily. We just had to be careful, because Olympia and me, we stick out a bit. Ron made a stifled no noise somewhere between a snort and a sniff and hastily took a gulp of tea. And we're not hard to follow. We was protruding. We was, well, pretend, pretending we was going on holiday together. So we got into France. And we made like he was heading for where Olympus School is. Because we knew we was being tailed by someone from the Ministry. We had to go slow because I'm not really supposed to use magic. And, and we know the Ministry be looking for a reason to run at us. But we managed to give the Burke tailing us the slip about oh, round about Dijon. Ooh, Dijon, said Hermione excitedly. I've been there on holiday. Did you see? He fell silent at the look on Ron's face. We chanced a bit of magic after that, and it wasn't a bad journey. Ran into a couple of mad trolls on the Polish border, and I had a slight disagreement with a vampire in a pub in Minsk. But apart from that, couldn't have been smoother. And then we reached the place, and we started trekking up through the mountains, looking for signs of them. Well, we had to lay off the magic once we got near them, partly because they don't like wizards, and we don't want to put their backs up too soon. It's partly... And partly because Dumbledore had warned us, you know who, was bound to be after the giants and all. Said it was odds on he'd sent a messenger off to them already. Told us to be very careful of drawing attention to ourselves as we got nearer in case there were Death Eaters around. Hagrid paused for a long draught of tea. Go on, said Harry urgently. Found him, said Hagrid boldly. Went over a ridge one night and there they was, spread over underneath us. Little fires burning below on huge shadows. It was like watching bits of the mountain moving. How big are they? asked Ron in a hushed voice. About 20 feet, said Hagrid casually. Some of the bigger ones might have been 25. And how many were there? asked Harry. I reckon about 70 or 80, said Hagrid. Is that all? said Hermione. Yup, said Hagrid sadly. 80 left. And there was loads once. Must have been a hundred different tribes from all over the world, but they've been dying out for ages. Wizards killed a few, of course, but mostly they killed each other. And now they're dying out faster than ever. They're not made to live bunched up together like that. Dumbledore says it's our fault. It was the wizards who forced them to go and make and made them live a good long way away from them. And now they, they had no choice but to stick together for their own protection. So, said Harry, you saw them and then what? Well, we waited till morning. Didn't want to go sneaking up on them in the dark for, for our own safety, said Hagrid. About three in the morning, they fell asleep just where they were sick. We didn't dare sleep. For one thing, we wanted to make sure none of them were awake and uh, woke up and came up where we were. And, and uh, well, another, another storm was unbelievable. Caused an avalanche near morning. Anyway, once it was light, we were down to see him. Just like that, said Ron, looking awestruck. We just walked right into a giant camp. Well, Dumbledore told us how to do it, said Hagrid. Gave the Gurgs gifts and show some respect, you know. Give the what gifts, asked Harry. Oh, the Gurg means the chief. How could you tell which one was the Gurg? asked Ron. Hagrid grunted in amusement. Oh, no problem, he said. He was the biggest, the ugliest and the laziest, sitting there waiting to be bought food by the others. Dead goats and such like. Name a carcass. I put him at 22, 23 feet and the weight of a couple of bull elephants, skin like rhino hide and all. And you just walked up to him, said Hermione breathlessly. Well, down to him, where he was lying in the valley. They was in the in this dip between four pretty high mountains, see, beside a mountain lake. And Carcass was lying by the lake, roaring at the others to feed him and his wife. Olympia and I went down the mountainside. But didn't they try and kill you when they saw you? asked Ron incredulously. It was definitely on some of their minds, said Hagrid, shrugging. But we did what Dumbledore told us to do, which was to hold our gift up high and keep our eyes on Gurg and ignore the others. So that's what we did. And the rest of them went quiet and watched us pass, and, and we went right up to Carcass's feet, and we bowed our, and, and put our present down in front of him. What did, what did you give a giant? asked Ron eagerly. Food? Nah, he can get food all right for himself, said Hagrid. We took him magic. Giants like magic, just don't like us using it against them. Anyway, that first day, we gave him a branch of goobre and fire. Hermione said, wow, softly, but Harry and Ron both frowned in puzzlement. A branch of Everlasting fire, said Hermione irritably. You ought to know that by now. Professor Flitwick mentioned it at least twice in class. Well, anyway, said Hagrid quickly, intervening before Ron could answer back. Dumbledore had bewitched this branch to burn forevermore. 
which isn't something any wizard could do. So I lies it down in, in the snow by Carcass's feet and says, A gift to the Gerg of the giants from Amble Albus Dumbledore, who sends his respectful greetings. And what did Carcass say? asked Harry eagerly. Nothing, said Hagrid. Didn't speak English. You're kidding. Didn't matter, said Hagrid inter inter interpretably. Dumbledore had warned us that might happen. Carcass knew enough to yell for a couple of giants who knew our lingo as they translated for us. And did he like the present? asked Ron. Oh, yeah, it went down a storm once they understood what it was, said Hagrid, turning his dragon stake over to press the cooler side to his swollen eye. Very pleased. So when I said Albus Dumbledore asked the Gurg to speak with his messenger nice. when he returns tomorrow with another guest. Nice. Why couldn't he speak from that day? asked Hermione. Dumbledore wanted us to make it very slow, said Hagrid. Let him see we kept our promises. We'll come back tomorrow with another present. And then we do come back with another present. Gives a good impression, see? And gives them time to test out their first present and find out it's a good one. And get them eager for more. In any case, giants like Carcass overload them with information and they'll kill you just to simplify things. So we bowed, you know, you know out the way and went off and found ourselves a nice little cave to spend the night. And the following morning we went back and this time we found Carcass sitting up waiting for us looking all eager. And you talked to him. Oh yeah, first we presented him with a nice battle helmet. A goblin made an it made him indestructible, you know. And then we sat down and we talked. What did he say? Not much, said Hagrid. Listen mostly, but they were, they were good signs. He'd heard of Dumbledore. Heard he'd argued against the killing of the last giants in Britain. Carcass seemed to be quite interested in what Dumbledore had to say. And a few of the others, especially the ones who had some English, they gathered around and listened too. We were we were hopeful when we left the, that day, promised to come back next morning with another present. But that night, it all went wrong. What do you mean, said Ron quickly? Well, like I say, they're not meant to live together, giants, said Hagrid sadly. Not in big groups like that. They can help themselves. And they can kill each other every few weeks. The men fight each other and the women fight each other and the remnants of the old tribes fight each other. And that's even without squabbles over food and best fires in sleeping pot spots. You'd think, seeing as how the whole race is about finished, they lay off each other, but Hagrid sighed deeply. That night, a fight broke out. We saw it from the mouth of our cave, looking down on the valley. Went on for hours, yeah, wouldn't believe the noise. And when the sun came up, the snow was scarlet and his head, well, his head was lying at the bottom of the lake. Whose head? gasped Hermione. Carcasses, said Hagrid heavily. It was a new gurg, Golgamath. He sighed deeply. Well, we hadn't bargained on a new gurg two days after we'd made friendly contact with the first one. We had a funny feeling Golgamath wouldn't be so keen to listen to us. But we had to try. You went to speak to him, asked Ron incredulously, after you'd watched him rip off another giant's head. Of course we did, said Hagrid. We hadn't gone all that way to give up after two days. We went down with our next present we'd meant to give to Carcass. I knew it was no go before I opened my mouth. He was sitting there wearing Carcass's helmet leering at us as we got nearer. He was massive. One of the biggest ones there, black hair and matching teeth and a necklace of bones. Human-looking bones, some of them. Well, I gave it a go. Held out a great roll of dragon skin and said, a gift for the Gurg of the Giants. Next thing I knew, I was hanging upside down in the air by my feet. Two of his mates had grabbed me. Hermione clapped her hands on her mouth. How did you get out of that? asked Harry. Wouldn't have done if Olympia hadn't been there, said Hagrid. She pulled out her wand and did some of the fastest spell work I've ever seen. Pretty marvellous. Hit the two holding me right in the eyes with conjunctivitis curses, and they dropped me straight away. But we were in trouble then, because we used magic against them, and that's what giants hate about wizards. We had to leg it. We knew there was no way we were going to be able to ma march into camp again. Blimey, Hagrid, said Ron quietly. So how come it's taking you so long to come home? If, if you were only there for three days, asked Hermione. We didn't leave after three days, said Hagrid, looking outraged. Dumbledore was relying on us. But you've just said there was no way you could go back. Not by daylight we couldn't, no. We just had to rethink a bit. Spent a couple of days lying low up in the cave and watching. And what we saw wasn't good. Did he rip off more heads? asked Hermione, sounding squeamish. No, said Hagrid. Wish he had. What do you mean? When we soon found out, he didn't object to all wizards, just us. Death Eaters, said Harry quickly. Yup, said Hagrid darkly. A couple of them were visiting him every day, bringing gifts to the Gurg, and he wasn't dangling then upside down. How do you know they were Death Eaters, said Ron. Because I recognized one of them, Hagrid growled. 
McNair. Remember him? Bloke they sent to kill Buckbeak. Maniac, he is. Likes killing as much as Goldemath. No wonder they were getting on so well. So McNair's persuaded the Giants to join you-know-who, said Hermione desperately. Hold your hippogriff. I haven't finished my story yet, said Hagrid indignantly, who, considering he had not wanted to tell them anything in the first place, now seemed to be rather enjoying himself. Me and Olympus, well, we talked it over and we agreed just as the Gurg looked like favouring you-know-who. Didn't mean all of them would. We had to try and persuade some of the others, the ones who hadn't wanted Golgamath as Gurg. How could you tell which ones they were, asked Ron. Well, they were the ones being beaten to a pulp, weren't they, said Hagrid patiently. The ones with any sense were keeping out of Golma Golgamath's way, hiding out in caves, around the gully, just like we were. So we decided to go poking around the caves by night and see if we couldn't persuade a few of them. You went poking around dark caves looking for giants, said Ron, with awe, awed respect in his voice. Well, it wasn't the giants he was who worried his most, said Hagrid. We were now concerned about the Death Eaters. Dumbledore had told us before that we were not to a tangle with them if we could avoid it. Well, the trouble was they, they knew we was around. I expect Golgamath told us about us, told them about us. At night, when the giants were sleeping and we wanted to be creeping into the caves, McNair and the other, they were sneaking around the mountains looking for us. It was hard for it was hard put to stop Olympa jumping out at them, said Hagrid, the corners of his mouth lifting his wild beard. She was raring to attack him. She's something when she's roused, Olympus. Fiery, you know. I suspect it's the French in her. Hagrid gazed, misty-eyed, into the fire. Harry allowed him 30 seconds of reminiscence before clearing his throat slightly loudly. So what happened? Did you uh, ever get near any of the other giants? What? Oh, oh, yeah, we did, yeah. On the, uh, on the third night after Carcass was killed, we crept out of the cave we'd been hiding in and headed back down into the gully, keeping our eyes skinned for the Death Eaters. Got inside a few of the caves now. Now go, then. In about a sick one... We found three giants hiding. Cave must have been cramped, said Ron. There wasn't room to swing a kneesel, said Hagrid. Didn't they attack when they saw you, asked Hermione. Probably would have done if they'd been in any condition, said Hagrid. But they was badly hurt, all three of them. Golgamas lot had beaten them unconscious. They'd woken up and crawled into the nearest shelter they'd find. Anyway, one of them had a bit of English, and he translated for the others. And what we had to say didn't seem to go down too badly, so we kept going back, visiting, visiting the wounded. I reckon we had about six or seven of them convinced at one point. Six or seven, said Ron eagerly. Well, that's not bad. Are they going to come over here and start fighting you-know-who with us? But Hermione uh... said, what do you mean at one point, Hagrid? Hagrid looked at her sadly. Golgamoth's lot raided the caves. The ones that survived uh... didn't want no more to do with us after that. So... So there aren't ah! any giants coming, said Ron, looking disappointed. Nope, said Hagrid, heaving a deep sigh as he turned over his stake and applied the cooler side ah! to his face. Ah, so hello, everybody. We did what we were meant to do. Ah! We gave them message, and some of them heard it, and I expect some ah! don't remember it. Have a good one, Foggy. Foggy. Them that don't want Raid. to stay around Golden Apple, we'll move out Thank you guys so much for the follows. Thank you guys for being amazing. Thank you guys for being beautiful. Thank you guys for being awesome. I am a uh, artist that is making his own comic book. I'm only on page seven, so you know when I get the first chapter done, I'll tell you where it is. Don't you guys worry. Said Hermione quietly after a while. Did you? Was there any sign of? Did you hear anything about? And thank your, you for the follows, guys. I really do appreciate it. Hagrid's unobscured eye rested upon her, and Hermione looked rather scared. I'm sorry. I, 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 I forget it. Dead. Hagrid grunted. Died years ago. They told me. Oh, I'm really sorry," said Hermione in a very small voice. Thank you, Hagrid uh, Taya, uh, Birdal, Birdalov, dude. And one Paul's again. He? Hermione glanced nervously. Thank you guys. Harry Thank you for the follow. Plainly wanting them to speak, but you still haven't explained. I am so evil. Okay. Said, I hit an orphan in the, in the face. Get him adopted, then punching oh, him in front oh, of his oh, new parents. So late back, said Harry. Sirius says, Madam. Hey, anyway, enjoy the raid. Go. I'm gonna go try for? something other I mean, than art for now. Like Be awesome. The shadow realm, Jimbo. I Never. See you later, War Vester. A sudden outbreak of rapping on the door. Hermione gasped. Her mother Thank you guys so many. And smashed onto the floor. Bang! Yelp. All four of them started at the window, beside the doorway. The shadow of somebody small and squat 
rippled across the thin curtain. It's her, Ron whispered. Get under here, Harry said quickly, seizing the invisibility cloak. He swirled it over himself and Hermione, while Ron tore around the table and dived under the cloak as well. Huddled together, they backed away into a corner. Fang was barking madly at the door. Hagrid looked thoroughly confused. Hagrid, hide our mugs. Hagrid seized Harry and Ron's mugs and shoved them under the cushion in Fang's basket. Fang was now leaping up at the door. Hagrid pushed him out of the way. Dave, you're right. Pulled it open. Professor Umbridge Thank was standing you. in the door. Thank you. Have a good night, War Besser. Be awesome. And and ear flaps. Lips pursed. Stay awesome. So to see Hagrid's face. She barely reached his navel. So, she said slowly and loudly, as though speaking to somebody deaf, you're Hagrid, are you? Without waiting for an answer, she strolled into the room, her bulging eyes rolling in every direction. Get away, she snapped, waving her handbag at Fang, who had bounded up to her and was attempting to lick her face. Er, uh, don't want to be rude, said Hagrid, staring at her, but who the ruddy hell are you? My name is Dolores Umbridge. Her eyes were sweeping the cabin. Twice they stared directly into the corner where Harry stood, sandwiched between Ron and Hermione. Dolores Umbridge, Harry Hagrid said, sounding thoroughly confused. I thought you were one of them ministry. Don't you work with Fudge? I was senior undersecretary to the minister, yes, said Umbridge, now pacing around the cabin, taking in every tiny detail within, from the ha haversack, haversack against the wall to the abandoned travelling cloak. I am now the Defence Against the Dark Art teacher. That's previous, said Hagrid. <laughs> There's not many that take that job anymore. And Hogwarts High Inquisitor, said Umbridge, giving no sign that she had heard him. What's that? said Hagrid, frowning. Precisely what I was going to ask, said Umbridge, pointing at the broken shards of china on the floor that had been Hermione's mug. Oh, said Hagrid, with a most unhelpful glance towards the corner where Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood hidden. Oh, that was, uh, that was Fang. He broke a mug, so I had to use this one instead. Hagrid pointed to the mug from which he had been but drinking. Duh, duh. Thank you guys so much for being awesome. Thank you guys for enjoying yourselves, and thank you guys for chilling out with me. Taking in every detail of his appearance instead of the cabin. I heard voices, he said quietly. I was talking to Fang, said Hagrid stoutly. And was he talking back to you? Well, in a matter of speaking, said Hagrid, looking uncomfortable, I sometimes say Fang's near enough human. There are three seats, or three sets of footprints in the snow leading from the castle doors to your cabin, said Umbridge sleepily. Hermione gasped. Harry clapped a hand over her mouth. Luckily, Fang was sniffing loudly around the hem of Professor Umbridge's robes, and she did not appear to have heard. Well, I only just got back, said Hagrid, waving an enormous hand on the haversack. Maybe someone uh, came to call earlier and I missed them. There are no footsteps leading away from your cabin door. Well, I don't know what they'd be, said Hagrid tugging nervously at his beard, and again glancing towards the corner where Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood, as though asking for help. Um, Umbridge wheeled around and strode the length of the cabin, looking around carefully. She bent and peered under the bed. She opened Hagrid's cupboards. She passed within two inches of where Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood, pressed against the wall. Harry actually pulled in his stomach as she walked by. After looking carefully inside the enormous cauldron Hagrid used for cooking, she wheeled around again and said, what has happened to you? How did you sustain these injuries? Hagrid hastily removed the dragon stake from his face, which in Harry's opinion was a mistake, because the, she, the black and purple bruising all around his eye was now clearly visible, not to mention a large amount of fresh and congealed blood on his face. Oh, I, I had a bit of an accident, he said lamely. What sort of accident? I, I tripped. You tripped, she repeated coolly. Yeah, that's right, over, over a friend's broomstick. I don't fly myself. Well, look at the size of me. I don't reckon there's a broomstick that'll hold me. A friend of mine breeds a Braxton horses. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Big beasts, winged, you know. I've had a bit of a ride on one of them, and it was a... Uh... Where have you been? Asked Umbridge, cutting coolly through Hagrid's babbling. Where have I been? Yes, he said. Term started two months ago. Another teacher has had to cover for your classes. None of your colleagues have been able to give me any information on your whereabouts. You left no address. Where have you been? There was a pause in which Hagrid stared at her with his newly uncovered eye. Harry could almost hear his brain working furiously. I, I've, uh, I've been away from me health, he said. For your health, said Professor Umbridge, 
Her eyes traveled over Hagrid's discolored. Boy, for life, welcome to the stream while you're gone. We have very intellectual conversation, a great yeah, meeting so of minds about, I don't you. know. Yeah. Boy, for life, we had, we had a great conversation about... I don't know what, what we had a conversation about. I can't remember any conversation we had tonight. Except that he even is... Going to see her brother or uncle and won't be in a few streams. Other than that, um, um, I finished the two commissions for, uh, for, for Lava Gale. That's about it. So, yeah. Sweetly, the small patch of Hagrid's face that was not black and purple flushed. Well, change your scene, you know. Mountain scenery, said Umbridge swiftly. She knows, Harry thought desperately. Mountains, Hagrid repeated, clearly thinking fast. Nope, uh, south of France for me, better the sun and, uh, and sea. Really, said Umbridge, you don't have much of a tan. Yet, yeah, well, sensitive skin, said Hagrid, attempting an ingratiating smile. Harry noticed that two of his teeth had been knocked out. Umbridge looked at him coldly. His smile faltered. Then she hoisted her handbag a little higher into the crook of her arm and said, I shall, of course, be informing the minister of your late return. All right, said Hagrid, nodding. You ought to know, too, that as High Inquisitor, it is my unfortunate but necessary duty to inspect my fellow teachers, so I dare say we shall meet again soon enough. She turned sharply and marched back to the door. You're inspecting us? Hagrid echoed blankly, looking after her. Oh, yes, said Umbridge softly, looking back at him with her hand on the door handle. The Ministry is determined to weed out unsatisfactory... Ingratiating? Pieces. Hagrid, good night. She left, closing the door behind her with a snap. Harry made to pull off the invisibility cloak, but Hermione seized his wrist. Not yet, she breathed in his ear. She might not be gone yet. Hagrid seemed to be thinking the same way. He slumped across the room and pulled back the curtain an inch or so. He's going back to the castle, he said in a low voice. Blimey, inspecting people, is she? Yeah, said Harry, pulling off the cloak. Trelawney's on probation already. Um, what sort of thing are you planning to do with us in class, Hagrid? Asked Hermione. Oh, uh, don't you worry about that. I've got a great load of lessons planned, said Hagrid enthusiastically, scooping up his dragon steak from the table and slapping it over his eye again. I've been keeping a couple of creatures saved for your owl, yeah? <laughs> do you wait, you... You've something really special. Um, special in what way? asked Hermione tentatively. I'm not saying, said Hagrid happily. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Look, Hagrid, said Hermione urgently, dropping all pretense. Professor Umbridge won't be at all happy if you bring anything to class that's too dangerous. Dangerous? said Hagrid, looking genially bemused. Don't be silly. I wouldn't give you anything dangerous. I mean, all right, they can look after themselves. Hagrid, you've got to pass Umbridge's inspection. And to do that is, is it would really be better if she saw you teaching us how to look after forelocks, how to tell the difference between gnarls and hedgehogs, stuff like that, said Hermione earnestly. But that's not very interesting, Hermione, said Hagrid. That stuff I've, I've got much more impressive. I've been bringing on, uh, bringing them on for years. I, I reckon I've got the only domestic herd in Britain. Hagrid, please, said Hermione, a note of real desperation in her voice. Umbridge is looking for any excuse to get rid of teachers she thinks are too close to Dumbledore. Please, Hagrid, teach us something dull that's, that's bound to come up, come up in our owl. But Hagrid merely yawned wildly and cast a one-eyed look uh, of longing towards the vast bed in the corner. Listen, it's been a long day and it's late, he said, putting, patting Hermione gently on the shoulder so that her knee gave way and hit the floor with a thud. Oh, sorry, he pulled her back up by the neck of her, of her robes. Look, don't you go worrying about me. I promise I've got really good stuff planned for your lessons now I'm back. Now you lot better get back up to the castle. You lot. And don't forget to wipe your footprints out behind you. I don't know if you have got through to him, said Ron, a short while later, when having checked that the, the coast was clear, they walked back up to the castle through the thickening snow, leaving no trace behind them due to the obliteration charm Hermione was performing as they went. Then I'll go back again tomorrow, said Hermione determinedly. 
I'll plan his lessons for him if I have to. I don't care if she throws out Trelawney, but she's not getting rid of Hagrid. A Jiffy Lube, it's our job. A yeah, Jiffy Lube. A Jiffy Lube. You in the drive. A Google Gaga. I'm a bunny. Chapter 21. The eye of the snake. Hermione plowed Just know that I I know that you guys are jealous. You guys are real jealous. I get to pet a bunny. They remained grudgingly in the common room, trying to ignore the gleeful shouts drifting up from the grounds outside, where students were enjoying themselves skating on the frozen lake, tobogganing, and worst of all, bewitching snowballs to zoom up to Gryffindor Tower and rap hard on the windows. Oi! bellowed Ron, finally losing patience and sticking his head out of the window. I'm a prefect. And if one more snowball hits this window, ouch! He withdrew his head sharply, his face covered in snow. Fred and George, he said bitterly, slamming the window behind him. Git? Hermione returned from Hagrid's just to look before lunch, shivering slightly, her robe damp to the knees. So, said Ron, looking up when she entered, got all his lessons planned for him? Well, I tried, she said dully, sinking into a chair beside Harry. She pulled out her wand and gave it a complicated little wave so that hot air streamed out of the tip. She then pointed this at her robes, which began to steam as they dried out. I he had there when I arrived, two rabbits. Was for at least half an ah. Hour, and then he came stumping out of the forest. Damn it. Harry groaned. I only have he one rabbit, but he place. is adorable like the the and old. What's he keeping in there? Did he say? Yeah. No, said Hermione miserably. He says he wants them to be a surprise. I tried to explain about Umbridge, but he just didn't get it. He kept saying nobody in their right mind would rather study Nars than Chimeras. Oh. I don't think he's got a chimera, she added at the appalled look on Harry and Ron's face. But that's not for a lack of trying. From what he said about how hard it is to get eggs, I don't know how many times I told him he'd better get off, better, he'd be better off following Grubbly Plank's plan. I honestly don't, don't think he listened to half of what I said. He's in a bit of a funny mood, you know. He still won't say how he got all those injuries. Hagrid's reappearance at the staff table at breakfast next day was not greeted by enthusiasm from all students. Some, like Fred, George, and Lee, roared with delight and sprinted up the aisle between the Gryffindor and Hufflepuff tables to ring Hagrid's enormous hand. Yo, Chimera cameo in Harry Potter, hell yeah. Gloomy looks and shook we Chimeras. Harry knew that More representation. Grubbly, grubbly plank lessons. And the worst of it was that a very small, unbiased part of him knew that they had good reason. Grubbly Plank's idea of an interesting class was not one where there was a risk that somebody might have their head ripped off. It was with a certain amount of apprehension that Harry, Ron, and Hermione headed down to Hagrid's on Tuesday, heavily muffled against the cold. Harry was worried not only about what Hagrid might have decided to teach them, but also about how the rest of the class, particularly Malfoy and his cronies, would behave if Umbridge was watching them. However, the High Inquisitor was nowhere to be seen as they struggled through the snow yeah. towards Hagrid, yeah. stood, waiting for them on the edge of the forest. He did not present Wait. a reassurance. Damn it. Bruises yeah, on on yeah, were now on yeah, green and yellow, and some of his damn it seemed to be bleeding. Harry could not understand. Damn it! Him, but Hagrid perhaps on yeah, some creature whose venom prevented the wounds it inflicted from healing. As though to complete the ominous picture, Hagrid was carrying what looked like half a dead cow over his shoulder. We're working in here today. Hagrid called happily to the approaching students, jerking his head back in the dark to uh, the dark trees behind him. A bit more shelter, anyway. They prefer the dark. What prefers the dark? Harry heard Malfoy say sharply to Crabbe and Goyle, a trace of panic in his voice. What did he say prefers the dark? Did you hear? Harry remembered the only other occasion on which Malfoy had entered the forest before now. He had not been very brave then, either. He smiled to himself. After the Quidditch match, anything that caused Malfoy discomfort was all right with him. Ready, said Hagrid cheerfully, looking around at the class. Right, well, I've been saving a trip uh, into the forest to be a fifth year. Well, we go see these creatures in their natural habitat. Now, what we're studying today is pretty rare. I reckon I'm probably the only person in Britain who managed to train them. And you're sure they're trained, are you, said Malfoy, the panic in his voice even more pronounced. Only it wouldn't be the first time you'd brought wild stuff to class, would it? The Slytherins murmured agreement, and a few Gryffindors looked as though they thought Malfoy had a fair point too. Of course they're trained, said Hagrid, scowling and hoisting the dead cow a little higher onto his shoulder. So, what happened to your face then? demanded Malfoy. Mind your own business, said Hagrid angrily. No, if you've finished asking stupid questions, follow me. He turned and strode straight into the forest. Nobody seemed much disposed to follow. 
Harry glanced at Ron and Hermione, who sighed but nodded, and the three of them set off after Hagrid, le leading the rest of the class. They walked for about ten minutes until they reached a place where the trees stood so closely together that it was as dark as twilight, and there was no snow at all on the ground. There we go. Hagrid deposited his See, that was easy. To the ground, stepped back and turned to face his That was easy. Most of whom were creeping from tree to tree towards him, peering around nervously. Hey, Paul, is Elder Ring worth it? For a small creature around, such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. True that. Anyway, They'll know Dad, no can't way. believe you've done this. Hi, Nabon. What do uh, Gungans use uh, to store things? Char jars. Nobody laughed. Most of them looked too scared to make a sound. You and I die. Hagrid gave the shrieking cry again. A minute passed in which the class continued to so, peer nervously over their question. heads around trees for a first glimpse of whatever it was that was coming. If you don't mind, I gotta go use the restroom. I'll be right back. Big ramped. <laughs> Big ol' rab. Snuggle blind. He's like, what are you doing? What are you trying to... <laughs> And then, as Hagrid shook his hair back for a third time, expanded his enormous chest, Harry nudged Ron and pointed into Good the night, the toilet uh, stream set up uh, Ultimate Gaming. White, Sorry, uncalled for. Hail to, uh, to you, champion. Stop and then with the positiveness. Nope. Black winged nope. Emerge from the that, that's, uh, that's... You're in a go Chimera stream where we're always heavily positive. We're, we're all very positive about everything, about a lot of things. Uh. Let's see, where are we? Yeah. So I just need to start doing the lines for this. Uh, I've been streaming for five hours and I need to save. It's time. Let's find who we're gonna raid. What did I get? What did I get? Sorry. Who else followed me? Hold on, what? Who else followed me? And I didn't notice. Off Redster Lol. Hmm. Hopefully, not a bot. Anyway. Oh, 
hopefully not out of buck. All right, who we who we gonna raid? Let's see. Ooh. All right. I know who we're gonna raid. Mm -hmm. What's happening? What's happening? Do not know how to spell her name. Red, white, raven. Do I not know how to spell her name? I know that. Oh. Did they change it? Let's see. Did they change it? Just go to my fucking own thing, own chat. All right. And let me just fucking. Of course, I was a, a viewer. God damn it. This is so fucking annoying. Okay. Okay. Okay.
It's not channel. Why does it keep adding channel? Why do you keep adding channel? Please quit adding channel, you stupid fuck. I can't raid. What's happening? Fucking dickhole. There. I had to hit the chat button. It's so fucking stupid. From Disney and Pixar. I may I wear what I want, say what. God damn it. That's so fucking stupid. I'm getting tired. I'm getting a antsy. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for being with me. Thank you guys for being awesome. Thank you guys for being so sweet. I'm so sorry for my uh for my attitude there. I apologize. Next time we're going to work on this cuz this is done. And we're going to we're going to make it real nice. We're going to make it real nice. I make it look real nice. Thank you guys so much for being awesome. Thank you guys for being stupendous. Thank you guys for sticking around and just say, hey, Raven, hope you're doing well. That's so Raven. I will see you don't have to apologize for that. Every time I hit hitting the enter button, you have to hit the chat button now. What? What's going on? All righty, then I will. Have a great one now. Have a good one. Night-night.